Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku became Apotheosis villain part 2. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 3rd comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story Lord Wolf from Fanfiction Net. So let's start the video. Flashback so how do we go about this? Aizawa asked as they stood in a small circle of three. The meeting was to discuss the plan of action to defeat and capture Izuku Midoriya. Classes had been cancelled because two teachers of Yua were getting involved. The logic the government used was that since Midoriya was just a kid, then the school staff was best suited since they deal with unruly kids all the time. Though it seemed the government was seriously underestimating Midoriya if you asked Aizawa. I'll go in fist, alone, All Might stated. You two help the other heroes evacuate the surrounding area and then get into position your arrogance is going to be your downfall one day. Aizawa glanced at him with irritation in his tired eyes. All Might had already confessed to them his relationship with Midoriya and his reason for wanting to finish this alone. I'll remove the gauntlet from him even if I have to knock him unconscious. He held up his fist in silent bow. Should things go awry then you use your erasure quirk we still don't know if it will work on him, the homeroom teacher argued. The boy was technically quirkless, so there was no telling if his eraser quirk could erase the gauntlet's power. Then the next course of action is my quirk, Midnight said. I'll put him to sleep and then we can strip him of the gauntlet and what if that fails? Aizawa seemed to be the only one who didn't expect this to be easy. No matter which angle they go at it, then I'll handle it. They turned to the new voice to see a short old man dressed in yellow. The retired hero Gran Torino. With my speed I can swoop in and yank the device right off that boy's hand, he promised. You'll need to stay hidden and make a move as soon as you see that Midoriya's guard is down, All Might told him. He had called his old mentor and the two of them met up yesterday. Of course the first thing the old man did was smack Toshinori upside the head for crushing a fan's spirit and turning him into a villain. You forget yourself boy, it was I that taught you, not the other way around, the old hero chuckled. All Might's phone went off interrupting the meeting. When he saw his successor's name he excused himself for a minute. Hello young Mirio, he spoke. Something's wrong All Might what do you mean? I keep trying to activate one for all, but it isn't working not working. Now that was concerning. Yeah, it's been over six hours since you passed it on to me, but I don't feel any different. I even tried activating it and nothing happened. That's odd. All Might paused to think about what could be causing this problem. We'll have to figure it out later. I'm off to go bring in Midoriya, so I can't help right now should I just keep trying till you get back. Yes, don't worry Mirio, we'll figure this out together present time GAH. Izuku looked down at his mangled and bruised right arm. He laughed despite the pain he was in. So much power. Feels like jet fuel coursing through my veins this can't be. All Might stared in shock from his position against the building he was punched into. Midoriya stood down the street, examining his newly acquired stone. How can he have one for all? So this is what it's like to be as strong as you, Izuku smirked in triumph. What have done? Toshinori demanded. Crystallized replications of quirks that I harvested from Deanna remember. Izuku explained again. It wasn't that hard to make you bleed all might. You're constantly spitting it out. He grinned darkly. The blonde man's eyes widened further as he remembered the fight with that robot at Genosis. Midoriya had it purposely targeted his weak spot and make him puke up a bunch of his blood. That's impossible. My quirk is passed down, not hijacked by others. Izuku cut him off. Yes I know all about your quirk. All for one told me everything. He flinched, feeling the broken bones in his arm shift. At first I couldn't find a single trace of a quirk in your genes. But when I added a sample of blood from a previous user, well it suddenly came to life. Almost like it sensed a familiar person all the past users of one for all are long dead, All Might argued. There's no way you could have got some Nana Shimura, he said making the hero pause. I know Sensei told you about her grandson Tamura Shigaraki. It was his blood that I added to awaken one for all and seal it in stone form. Izuku laughed at the speechless look on his opponent's face. Tell me All Might, do you feel weaker? Tashinori was silent. It was true he could feel the power slowly draining from him, but he just assumed it was because he passed it on earlier this morning to Mirio. You can no longer pass this quirk on to a successor, because now it belongs to the Infinity Gauntlet. So that's why Mirio can't manifest it. The power of one for all, stolen by Izuku Midoriya. As much as the loss hurt him emotionally, Tashinori was equally terrified that the quirk was in the hands of a villain. However, he noted something that could afford him victory in stopping the boy. You can't even handle it properly. The hero referred to the damage he did to his own body. You nearly destroyed your right arm. Maybe if he could get Midoriya to see what he was doing to himself, he could convince him to stop and give the power back. Did I? Izuku lifted his infinity gauntlet and the yellow stone flashed for a moment. In the next moment a neon yellow shimmer covered the wounded limb, healing it almost instantly. 
Good as new. Seeing the confusion on the man's face he explained himself once again. The time stone possesses a rather interesting ability called restoration. Basically it allows me to restore my damaged body and undo any wounds. It however could not fix things like missing limbs and fatigue, but All Might didn't need to know that. Now I can fix myself over and over again until I master the power stone. You can't beat me you fake. I've thought of everything. No, All Might clenched his fists. I won't allow this power to be abused and misused misused. Izuku cocked his head. Like how you misuse the quirk to become a false hero celebrity who lies to the world. I never lied. Tashinori replied. Anyone can be a hero. Izuku smiled doing an imitation of All Might's deep voice and laugh. H-O-H-O-H-A. All it takes is the drive and will. He chuckled at the irony of it all. Sadly that's not the truth. According to the real you, all it takes is a powerful or useful quirk to be a hero. But if you went around preaching the truth you wouldn't be a celebrity love the world over, basking in attention and glory. I don't tell the truth to protect them. From what? From upstaging you. Izuku glared at him. Do you have any idea how furious I was when all for one told me that you used to be quirkless? The audacity you possess is astounding. He spat. You who were once just like me, looking down on other quirkless people, the boy's eyes hardened into emerald steel. You taught me the truth of this world all might. That if a quirkless loser like you could accomplish so much then why couldn't I do the same? Unlike you however I didn't have Nana Shimura around to take pity on me. He scowled furiously looking down at the gauntlet on his hand. I had to make my own power. I poured all my hopes, dreams and desires into this. He stared at his reflection in the metal. I've come too far to be stopped now. I'll change this world for the better. No more relying on lies and false heroes like you all might. Only real heroes will be allowed to continue in my world and what will you do to those that don't meet your standards? All Might asked. Izuku smiled in response. They will cease to exist, he answered. All will be made right I'm sorry Midoriya. The hero looked down in shame. I'm sorry I made you so twisted. But I promise you, he faced the boy he turned into a mad powerful villain with renewed confidence. I will bring you back. Even if I have to knock some sense into you, Izuku face frowned. Easier said than done. He grumbled then his face lit back up into a smirk. Speaking of knocking things around. In theory the power stone should also be able to amplify the strength and range of the other stones when combined. The green and red stones lit up as he said that. Let's test it out. Flattening his left hand, he made a rapid upward chopping motion. In seconds the entire street between the two of them was severed in half. Going further until it cut the building All Might was up against right down the middle. How do you like that? Izuku laughed. If you're done showing off, Dabai approached, reminding him that he was still there. I'd like to leave now alright if you don't want to stick around and enjoy the show. Izuku created a portal behind his ally. Say hello to Tamura for me. He waved Dabai off who quickly escaped before things got out of hand. As much as he wanted to watch, he'd rather not be caught in the crossfire between two gods. Izuku closed the portal and simultaneously flashed warped away just before All Might could try to grab him once again. Mist, I'm warning you Midoriya. All Might chased after him. I'll stop holding back if you don't surrender oh please do, Izuku smirked at him. I really want to test the full capabilities of my infinity gauntlet, so give me your best. Beat me, crush me, and tear me apart. He used his thumbs to push his cheeks upwards and force the ends of his lips further up. Do it with a smile. Hehe. <laughs> like the great hero you are. Meanwhile at Rax's junkyard Achako approached the outer gate of the scrapyard. The sign looked worn and faded, as if nobody had been here in a long time. The girl came in her hero costume, with her new staff weapon attached to her back, just in case. Using her quirk she floated herself over the old rusted gate, looking around the vast wasteland of broken cars, boats, airplanes, appliances, and even some old robots. She spotted a large rundown building with smokestacks that was most likely used to melt down the junk in the past. If Izuku was hiding out here then that would be the best place to start looking. All right, let's take a look, she whispered to herself. Quietly she snuck around the piles of metal and scrap, rather than use the door. Achako floated up to one of the shattered windows to peek inside. She didn't see anybody at first until a noise caught her attention. Peering further into the abandoned building she spotted some odd machine that looked out of place in the condemned facility. It also appeared to be running, going by the lights and drumming noise it was making. Descending to the ground she quietly snuck inside looking around for Izuku. Hiroraka didn't see him anywhere, so she decided to investigate the machine. Before she could even examine it, Achako suddenly felt a massive amount of bloodlust from behind. Acting on instinct she leaped out of the way of a combat knife. Spinning around she faced her attacker. As good as ever. Himeko Toga grinned widely. You. Achako recognized her immediately. The girl that attacked her during the training camp. I don't believe we've been properly introduced. The girl giggled. I'm Himeko Izukun's future girlfriend and you're Achako Yuraka. Her smile turned into a nasty frown. The girl that Izukun was so interested in where is he? Achako demanded. So you can steal him from me. 
I don't think so. Toga pulled out a matching dagger for her other hand. Izukun said to guard the machine and to deal with intruders however I see fit. Her demonic grin returned. That's unfortunate for you. The hero student whipped out her staff and stood ready to fight. We'll see about that. Achako glared at her. Back in the city All Might stood staring up at cars and pieces of buildings that hovered around in the air. Midoriya was hiding in the floating debris. Every few seconds he would send a random object flying at the hero and then flash warp away to keep his position hidden. The truth was that Izuku had yet to fully figure out the power stone and was playing it a bit cautious now. Every time he tried use it, his body would suffer damage. He easily fixed it with the time stone, but Izuku wanted to eventually be able to properly wield one for all. This is getting nowhere. All Might breathed a frustrated sigh. So be it. With amazing speed the hero leaped into the center of the floating field of debris. In an instant every last bit of it was blown away and All Might had Midoriya by his right arm. Using gravity and his super strength he yanked the boy back down to the ground. AHG. Izuku's back collided painfully with the pavement. With his right arm captured All Might attempted to pull off the infinity gauntlet on the left. Thinking fast Izuku bent his index finger and thumb then flicked it towards him. Normally such a thing could only harm an insect. But the boy was using the power stone. The resulting flick was now strong enough to generate a force that blew All Might clean off of him. That seemed almost desperate, Tashinori said as he skidded to a halt. I could say the same about you, Izuku replied back as he restored his broken finger. He smirked at the hero as he stood back on his feet. Are you perhaps reaching the end of your time limit? Of course you remember that. All Might grumbled about smart kids and how they have to remember every detail. Well I was your biggest fan at one time, Izuku reminded him. You know you still have a chance to be a hero, Tashinori told him. All you have to do is take off that gauntlet and surrender. You can put a stop to all this Midoriya. In response Izuku chuckled which slowly evolved into full-blown hysterical laughter. Take off my infinity gauntlet. The green-haired boy slowly walked towards the hero. And go back to being quirkless, useless Deku. Cocking his right fist back while green sparks danced across his arm. Mars. Smash. With a single punch the buildings around them were demolished and the street they were fighting on was beyond recognition. Wow. Izuku looked down at his arm. It seemed the damage was worse than when he first used the power stone. So that's the difference between 30% and 60%. Quickly healing himself with the time stone he turned to All Might with a pleased grin. The symbol of peace was looking a little ragged, with his costume torn in a few places and several cuts along his body. You look like you're having fun, All Might panted, having taken the brunt of that last attack head on. Fun, Izuku raised a brow at that. Fun isn't something one considers when trying to create a better world. Izuku smirked as he held up his gauntlet-covered fist. But this does put a smile on my face look around you Midoriya. The number one hero shouted at him. Look at all this destruction you're causing. Do you really believe this will lead to a better world? I know it will. He decided to look around as well and noticed that he did wreck the city a bit too much. And as for this mess, don't worry. Unlike you I can pick up my toys. Pointing the gauntlet into the air, the green power stone, the red reality stone and yellow time stone began to glow brightly together. Clenching his fist he released a burst of yellow and red energy that covered the entire area. Slowly little by little the rubble and concrete began to move, reconstruction becoming faster and faster. All Might watched in morbid fascination as the buildings and streets were rapidly put back together. In moments all the destruction caused by their battle was undone and the two of them stood in the middle of a city that was as good as new. See, how, the time stone doesn't just repair my body. A trail of blood began dripping from Izuku's nose. I can also use restoration to repair any damage done to non-organic objects as well and if I combine it with the power and reality stones an entire city block is child's play. He wiped the blood and took a moment to examine it. Note to self, don't do something on that scale again without more practice. It seemed this power put a bit of strain on his body if he took it too far. For now at least. Now where were we? Izuku flash warped to get up close and personal with All Might with his right fist raised. The hero in turn shot his own fist forward to negate the boy's attack, which it did and overpowered it, sending Midoriya flying back until his back slammed into the side of a truck. That's more like it. Izuku wiped the saliva and blood from his chin before dashing forward through the air. Reaching out he used the reality stone to rip some metal out of nearby building and fashioned it into a big sword which he attempted to stab into the number one hero. All Might grabbed the blade and shattered it in his powerful grip. With his other hand he once again tried to strike Midoriya. But a small portal opened up between them allowing his arm to pass through. Izuku grinned and closed it, attempting to dismember him like he did to Muscular. All Might saw what he was about to do and yanked his limb out at the last second while simultaneously backhanding the kid away with his other. The green-haired teen tumbled across the pavement until he stopped short of the sidewalk. You're actually starting to take me seriously. Izuku chuckled getting up off the ground. He dusted his pants off with a pleased smile. But is it too late? You lost a few centimeters of bulk there all might. 
He pointed out the man's slowly shrinking muscles. Nothing gets past you I see. All Might realized that he was right. He was fast approaching his limit. Every time he tried to force himself to just end the fight Tashinori was reminded of his guilt and the fact that he was fighting a boy the same age as his students which caused him to subconsciously pull his punches. Now that he was almost out of time he would have to go all out even if it was just for a moment. I've studied heroes for years. I know their quirks, techniques, strategies and patterns, Izuku pointed at him. There's nothing you can do to stop me. I've planned this all out to well. All Might sighed in resignation. It seems that any attempts at talking Izuku into quitting was pointless. Forgive me for this Midoriya Before he could even blink All Might was in front of him. Izuku lashed out with the reality stone, but the hero overpowered its telekinetic force and grabbed his right arm. Pulling Midoriya over his shoulder he turned and used his opposite hand to deliver a hard decisive blow to the kid's head that nearly shattered the ground beneath them. Steam covered his rapidly shrinking body as he still held the boy's now unconscious body up by his arm. With the fight over Tashinori finally released the breath he was holding. Was that it? His eyes widened as the young villain spoke. No, 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 that's not nearly good enough. Izuku uppercut the man, forcing him to let go of his arm. Well it looks like you've used up all your power all night. The hero had now completely lost all of his strength, returning to his skinny emaciated form. Unfortunately for you, I am not bound by such limitations. He was interrupted by the sound of the news helicopter getting closer. Uh, I was wondering when they would get brave enough for a closer look you knew they were here. Tashinori looked at him to the helicopter anxiously. Of course, who do you think gave them an anonymous tip that All Might would be fighting a villain in the city? Everything was going according to Izuku's design, with one for all successfully stolen. All Izuku needed to do was find out when the hero's strength would run out. Judging by the familiar sight of the shriveled man it looks like he found it. Don't you think it's time all your adoring fans get a good look at the real you? Tashinori froze. He wouldn't Izuku just smirked at him. I'll be right back. A human-sized portal opened behind him which he stepped back into. Inside the helicopter it seems the demolished buildings have miraculously repaired themselves. The reporter noted keeping the camera on the fight. Look, the pilot pointed down to the battle. The villain that All Might is fighting appears to have vanished. A flash of blue appeared in the back of Copter. They glanced back in surprise to see Izuku Midoriya sitting in the back seat. Hi, he grabbed three of the spare cameras. I'm borrowing these, Izuku said before flash warping away. Back to the fight miss me. Izuku reappeared this time carrying three video cameras. Using the gauntlet he levitated these devices around him. Don't do this, All Might looked ashamed at what he knew was coming. Hello everyone, Izuku waved to one of the cameras ignoring the man's plea. My name is Izuku Midoriya and this, he pointed to the cameras at the hero, is All Might. The real All Might, he smirked darkly at the hero. That's right people, this skinny matchstick man is actually the greatest hero in the world. This is your symbol of peace. Izuku was enjoying this greatly. The ultimate revenge on All Might wasn't to kill him. No that would be too simple, too easy. The best way to get back at him was to expose him to the world and bring all of his lies out in the open. Did you know that All Might and I have something in common? Don't. Tashinori realized what he was about to reveal. He and I are both quirkless. Izuku exclaimed. This whole time he was borrowing a quirk that never belonged to him. However his body has grown too weak to fully use it. The villain he fought in Kamino Ward should have retired him. But he still clings to his title and power like an old dying king clings to his throne. He paused floating the cameras around to get a better view of the gaunt man. I ask you, all of you that are quirkless or have an impractical quirk, is this your pillar of justice? Do you accept this fraud, this lie as your symbol of peace? All Might looked down in shame and humiliation while Izuku just smirked in glee. Everything that he spent years hiding and covering up so that the people could have someone to look up to with hope was now out in the open, revealed by a boy whose hope he had destroyed. Still though, well then, All Might, do you have anything to say for yourself? The cameras got in closer, anything to say for your lies and deceit. The hero stood there silent for a moment then mumbled something. Speak up, your people can't hear I said. Tashinori was able to muster up the last remaining bits of his strength to bulk himself back up. Everything is going to be alright. He wouldn't go down in shame like this. At the very least he would stop this threat before he retired and face the world and its judgment. Izuku frowned seeing the man's renewed smile and confidence despite being exposed. A liar to the very end huh? Midoriya crushed the cameras with a flick of his wrist. He pointed the gauntlet at the hero. I'm so disappointed in you. Just as he was about to give him a full blast of the reality and power stone, carbon fiber bandages wrapped around his device and yanked him back down to earth. That's quite enough. Shouta Aizawa glared at the boy with his erasure quirk active, keeping a tight grip on his capture weapon. What? Izuku cried out as all his power seemingly vanished. That was easier than I thought it'd be. Aizawa kept his eyes locked on Midoriya as he sent more of his scarf out to trap him. Just kidding. 
H-L-A-A-A-H. Izuku stood back up and fired telekinetic blast at the underground hero that threw him off his feet. Luckily All Might caught him before he crashed through a building. Yeah not to brag, but your quirk erasure has no effect on someone like me who doesn't possess an ounce of any kind of quirk in their genetics. He ran his hand through his messy head of dark green hair. Nice try though, he applauded them for at least attempting it. Before he could gloat anymore his right arm was ensnared by a whip. Hey cutie, Midnight tried to yank him off his feet, mind falling asleep for me. She attempted to use her quirk to knock him out with her mist. Izuku just grinned manically at her. Sorry, but I'm not into older women. Simply flicking his fingers with a minuscule amount of one for all, enough to blow her mist away, then grabbing her whip he threw Midnight down the street. Turning back to All Might and Aizawa he pointed his gauntlet at them. The building's surface behind them crumbled apart, the debris taking the shape of a giant hand that enclosed around them. Keeping a hold of a razor head, All Might dodged out of the way and landed safely next to a recovered midnight. Sadly it cost him the last bit of his strength that he had managed to squeeze out a moment ago. He sure doesn't play around, does he? Midnight remarked. Plan D then? Aizawa said as Tashinori deflated back into his skinny form again. Is he in position? The symbol of peace coughed. I'm afraid I won't be much help for the rest of this fight what are you three scheming over there? Izuku called. The boy smirked as he levitated himself back into the air. Not going to say huh. That's fine I'll come to you. Flashing warping to their location. Izuku appeared directly above them with his fist raised. Run, he said while bringing his arm down creating a giant shockwave that shook the city. R-A-X-U-S Junkyard H-I-Y-A-H. Achako managed to slam Himiko in the face with her staff, knocking her away. This isn't fair. Toga glared at her while wiping the blood from her mouth. I'm the one who's supposed to make you bleed. She jumped back to her feet and ran at the student with her knife poised to strike. Achako used every ounce of her training to avoid getting stabbed. She hadn't practiced enough with the new staff weapon that Hatsume made from Izuku's design. But it seemed to work well with her quirk and fighting style. I need to end this quick. The girl used the grapple claw feature to grab a nearby crate that she made float earlier. It was weightless now, so she could easily pull it towards her and swing it around like a flail. Toga was forced to dodge and take several steps back. Flipping over the staff she managed to get directly behind Yuraka with her blade in striking distance of her neck. Achako had no time to dodge or block and closed her eyes expecting the worst. The knife never stabbed her. Instead a wave of ice appeared out of nowhere and completely froze the psychopathic girl in a small glacier of ice. We made it in time. A calm male voice spoke. Yuraka spun around recognizing the voice of the person who saved her. There at the entrance of the facility stood her fellow classmates Shoto Todoroki, Momo Yayarazu, Ijiro Kirishima, Tenya Ita, and Tsuyuasui, all of them fully dressed in their hero gear. Hey what we miss? Kirishima asked with a toothy smirk. What are you guys doing here? Achako looked nervous at being caught like this. We could ask you the same question. Ita gave her a disapproving stare. I saw you sneaking out of the dorm in your costume, Momo revealed. So I asked them to help me follow you. Achako had the decency to look ashamed. Mind explaining yourself here? I, um, I wanted to find Izuku Midoriya. She flushed in embarrassment. I needed to speak with him. You're not still in love with him, are you? See you blurted out. No, of course not. She denied a little too quickly while her face turned even redder. I just had some questions and I wanted to see if I could talk him out of whatever he's planning. If you knew where he was hiding then you should have told the teachers, Todoroki chastised. But before they could continue speaking the machine behind them roared loudly as it exploded from the inside. When the sparks died down a spherical metal capsule was ejected out. It landed near Momo who gave it a curious look as she picked it up. Seeing that it could be opened she slowly turned it revealing what was inside. A small black stone with a purple glow surrounding it. What is this? She wondered glancing between everyone. I don't know, but I think I know somebody that might have an idea. Achako looked at the icy block that held Himiko. Katsuki Bakugu stared at the television screen in shock. The news had been reporting live on the scene for the past hour. All Might had been fighting a villain, not just any villain. That nerdy bastard Deku was throwing down with the number one hero and somehow holding his own. Something Bakugu couldn't accomplish. Back when he failed to beat All Might in the battle examine with his partner Kirishima. Even with that fancy gauntlet of his, he didn't think Deku would stand a chance against the greatest hero in the world. That bastard, he clenched his fists in anger. His anger grew until he froze when he saw All Might shrink down to a skinny frail-looking man. Bakugu watched as Deku stole some cameras and went on a rant, revealing the truth about the hero to the world. That's right people, this skinny matchstick man is actually the greatest hero in the world. This is your symbol of peace. What the hell was going on here? Why did All Might look so weak? Why wasn't he winning against Deku? But more importantly, how did Deku know about this weakened form? Did you know that All Might and I have something in common? He and I are both quirkless. This whole time he was borrowing a quirk that never belonged to him. However his body has grown too weak to fully use it. 
The villain he fought in Kamino Ward should have retired him, but he still clings to his title and power like an old dying king clings to his throne I ask you, all of you that are quirkless or have an impractical quirk, is this your pillar of justice? Do you accept this fraud, this lie as your symbol of peace? Is this my fault? Katsuki remembered the fight between All Might and that freak in the mask. Some of his classmates gave him an escape route, so he didn't get to witness the whole fight. All he knew was that something major went down and All Might was pushed harder than ever. If what Deku said was true that the strongest hero was getting weaker, then it was probably his fault for getting captured by those villains. Katsuki didn't want to feel guilty, but no matter how he looked at it, if he was stronger they wouldn't have taken him so easily. That bastard Apotheosis who he now knew was actually Deku, made him look so pathetic. None of this made any sense. Deku was strong and Katsuki was weak. How did everything end up so backwards? Before he could think more on this Bakugu's phone buzzed in his pocket. Looking at he spotted Kirishima's name with a message attached. After reading Katsuki felt a new determination. Maybe there was a way he could correct this. The city this just keeps getting worse, Aizawa lamented. Currently they were dodging a big long serpentine dragon made of concrete, bits of metal and shards of glass. Midoriya had crafted it out of pieces of the buildings around him and was controlling it like a puppet. Tell me about it. Tashinori ducked behind a turned over car. With his strength faded he couldn't even fight back and was forced on the defensive. We need to get him on the ground and fight him up close, Aizawa stated. Midoriya kept them at bay from a distance. If they were going to create an opening for Gran Torino to make a grab for the gauntlet, then they needed to get the boy into a better position. That's suicide. Tashinori already explained Midoriya's new power stone and the quirk it granted him as well as what he learned about the other stones. That super strength damages his body right. The razor head reminded them. In the time between the damaging and healing himself we might be able to beat him any ideas on how we can do that. Midnight asked as she jumped behind the same car they were hiding behind after failing to take on Izuku. Come out come out wherever you are. Midoriya called losing sight of his opponents. He hovered a bit higher in the air looking around at all the destruction to see if he could spot them. Noticing a head of blonde hair he smirked. Got you. With a shout he sent his dragon maid from building debris crashing head first into their location. Look out. Tashinori saw the attack coming and warned his fellow teachers just in the nick of time. Izuku hovered over to impact spot and blew the dust cloud away with a flick of his wrist, running scared all might. Izuku chuckled seeing that they escaped. How very heroic. He said sarcastically. A hero must be willing to put his life on the line. He taunted while throwing the man's own words back at him. You're nothing without your power. Nothing. Seeing that wasn't enough to draw him out Izuku landed gently on the ground to look for them. Using the gauntlet he started lifting up cars and tossing them aside. When will you get it through your head all might? You are what's wrong with the world. Walking over to a broken empty bus he activated the power stone and kicked it out of his way. You set an impossible standard that no one can reach, not even you. Healing his broken leg he continued. You're not even real. Yet you look down on the weak and won't even give us a chance to be strong. Lifting up more rubble with the reality stone Izuku frowned when he didn't spot his target anywhere. He considered demolishing the buildings around him again with a finger snap. But he would rather avoid another display of power on that scale. Oh might, Izuku called. Face me. Glancing around he scowled in disappointment. Inside the bottom floor of a nearby building all might, Erasure Head and Midnight were currently hidden away. It's me he wants. Tashinori stood up and was about to head out there, but was stopped by Aizawa's scarf wrapping around his wrist. Are you just going to let him kill you? The dark-haired man asked pulling him back. What good will that do? I don't think he wants to kill me. The skinny blonde man looked away. Midoriya wants to see me beaten and humiliated. Maybe when he finally gets what he wants he'll be satisfied and stop and how will that look to the world? The great all might, the symbol of peace gives up. Aizawa glared at him. Is that how you want to go out? No, no it wasn't how Yagi would leave this world of heroes and villains. Then what do you suggest? He's too powerful to stop with force we still have planned. D. Aizawa brushed his hair to the side revealing a communicator attached to his ear. Pressing it he made contact with the fourth hero involved with this operation. A-L-L-M-I-G-H-T. Outside Izuku once again yelled for the hero to come face him. He was starting to wonder if he'd done enough. Izuku already exposed the number one hero for the fraud that he was. That was pretty much victory for him. He considered leaving for the junkyard where his soul stone should be just about finished. Before he could come to a decision the man in question appeared, standing in the middle of the street. You want me, here I am, Tashinori faced the young villain. It's about time, Izuku walked towards him. So all might, ready to face your ultimate defeat. It will be a hollow victory for you, the man gestured to his true body. It doesn't matter. I've won, Izuku smirked holding his arms out. 
No matter how you look at it dot 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 it's my victory. So much planning and research. Just to get to this point right here where I reveal to the world the truth about you. He chuckled as kept a close eye on the hero for any attempts at trickery. Society will now lose all hope and faith not just in you. But all heroes was that your plan. To crush everybody's hopes just because I crushed yours. Tashinori couldn't believe the boy was that petty. Then again, he met villains with far more childish motivations. Don't worry I'll give them their hope back to them when I create a new hero-based society. I'm not a monster. He frowned seeing that Tashinori wasn't understanding the bigger picture. Just leave. You have one for all and those other stones. You got what you wanted. So just stop. The gaunt man tried to plead with the kid again. Not until I prove something. He pointed his device at the man. I have to know for sure know what. The weakened hero asked. I need to know if quirks are really as great as everyone makes them out to be. Izuku's gaze turned sad for a brief moment. I need to know if I could have been a hero without one. He wanted to know if everyone was wrong about him. If he could beat the best, then they were wrong. He wouldn't be so useless after all. I'm sorry. Tashinori apologized again for what he said to the boy all those months ago. Oh will you stop saying that? Izuku shouted while lifting the gauntlet high into the air in an attempt to bring a large amount power crashing down on the hero. However as soon as he raised it up All Might made a quick hand sign behind his back. Aizawa who was watching closely recognized the signal and spoke into the communicator. Now, as soon as the word left his mouth, Gran Torino dashed out of his hiding spot like a jet, flying as fast as he could, coming up behind Midoriya with his hand ready to grab the gauntlet and yank it right off. Out of the corner of his eye Izuku could see the old man approaching in the reflection of his metallic device. Everything slowed down for him as his brain went into overdrive. He couldn't turn and retaliate. That would still leave him open, but there was one thing he could do. In an instant Izuku activated the time stone and the entire area was encased in a yellow bubble and everything inside except the caster of it was frozen in time. You, Izuku turned around to land furious green eyes on the old retired hero an inch away from touching his infinity gauntlet. Sneaky old man. While time was still frozen for a few seconds he used a small portion of the power stone to chop the small man in the stomach. Time resumed as the bubble dispersed. G-U-H. Gran Torino gasped in pain as the force of the blow caught up with him. Izuku flash warped behind and grabbed him by his cape, holding him up in the air. You may be fast old man, but as long as I can stop time it doesn't matter how fast you are. Izuku chuckled. What just happened? Aizawa and Midnight were confused. A flash of yellow and then Gran Torino was doubled over in pain when he was about to secure victory for them. It's just like before. All Might remembered something similar happening during the event where Midoriya revealed himself along with his weapon. Since you're all a bit slow on the upkeep I'll explain it. Brandishing the gauntlet he gestured to the yellow stone below his wrist. The time stone lets me stop time in an isolated area. I was saving it for an emergency. Mainly because of the cool down prevented him from using it again for a while. So congratulations on forcing me to use it. Using a small portion of the power stone he shucked Gran Torino at all might. He may be fast, but as long as I can stop time, it doesn't matter how fast he is woe. Tashinori caught his former mentor, but the collision caused him to slide back a bit. Let's see, Izuku levitated himself off the ground again. First obviously was All Might's attempt to beat me down and forcefully take my infinity gauntlet. He rubbed his chin as he went off on a tangent. Next was to get a razor head to disable me and midnight to knock render me unconscious. His mouth continued to mumble through the failed attempts to defeat. I'll assume your last ditch effort was the old man and his speed. Now my question to you, Izuku pointed his gauntlet covered fist at them. What else do you got? R-A-X U-S Junkyard so these stones power his gauntlet. Momo began holding the black purple glowing gem in her hand. And he needs this last one to complete it, is that right? Toga growled at them. And he'll be coming here soon to get it. Todoroki only unfroze her head so they could interrogate her. At first she refused to talk, but they were able to trick her into revealing a bit of vital information by using her infatuation with Izuku Midoriya against her. The psychotic girl ended up blurting out a few secrets that she wasn't supposed to tell anyone. He calls this one the soul stone apparently, Tenure remarked. What does it do? How should I know? Toga bit her lip as she glared at him. That was true, Izukun didn't tell her what it did, just that it was extremely important. I think we're missing the important thing here guys. Kirishima started as he quietly put his phone away without them noticing. We have this stone and Midoriya doesn't know we have it he's right let's take it the authorities. Momo nodded. Even if they can't figure out what it does they might be able to keep it out of his hands or... Hear me out, Kirishima trailed off. What if we used it against him? Has he gone crazy? Suyu bluntly asked. Use how? Momo questioned him. You're not seriously considering this. Tenya exclaimed. If this stone is the strongest, maybe its power can trump the others and defeat Midoriya when he arrives. Todoroki spoke up. Is that what you're getting at? I can't believe I'm hearing this. Tenya looked over to Achako who was staring off into space and thought. What about you Uraraka? I think. She turned to face them. 
We should stay here and stop him. Truthfully she still wanted the chance to speak to Izuku. Now that she had back up with her, if things went south they could defeat him together. From what I've seen this Izuku Midoriya has been one step ahead of the heroes. But now we're ahead of him, Momo said confidently while looking at the stone in her hand. We can catch him off guard. Todoroki also seemed on board with this plan. That's the spirit. Kirishima smiled. Who else is in? I think this is a bad idea. But a worse idea would be ditching you to fight him by yourselves. Tsuyu reluctantly agreed to stay and help, as much as she didn't like it. The more numbers they had against Midoriya the better. The only one left to convince was the class rep Ada. They all turned to look at him expectantly, as if waiting for his side of the argument. This is crazy. Tenya glared at them before his eyes softened. But I've done crazier things myself, like going after the hero killer alone. Now that everyone was on board they went outside and started coming up with plans and ideas to combat Midoriya when he arrived. Hey, Himiko was left frozen from the neck down. The group ignored her and left the girl there till they decided what to do with her later. Back to the city, swirling above the center of the wrecked street. A large cloud of glass shards and dust churned and twisted about. Izuku floated in the center of it all controlling the vortex by moving his arms around like a conductor leading a symphony. How are we supposed to get to him? Aizawa shouted as he dodged a tendril of broken glass that whipped out from cloud. I have an idea. Tashinori called as he ducked. Get him on the ground in an open spot. I'll handle the rest. He still had some of one for all left inside him. All had had to do was activate it at the right time and deal a decisive blow. Unfortunately Midoriya was smart enough to fight them from a distance. His skills and powers with the gauntlet were growing every minute. Here and O was the only chance they had to stop him before it was too late. I'm going in. Gran Torino charged the vortex of glass and dust. Izuku just smirked seeing him coming and launched waves of shards at the old hero. The man swiftly dodged each attack until he made it to the center where he attempted to kick the boy in the head. Nice try. Izuku blocked his foot with his gauntlet and blasted Torino backwards, but was unprepared when a razor head scarf and midnight's whip both wrapped around his legs while he was distracted and started yanking him towards the ground. One, two, three. Pull. They both began dragging him down with all their strength. The green-haired teen was momentarily caught off guard by their tenacity and gasped as his back hit the ground, knocking the wind out of him. All right that's it. Izuku jumped back to his feet and was promptly kicked off them by Gran Torino. It seemed they were keeping the pressure on and not giving Midoriya a chance to retaliate. Enough. Using the reality stone he blew everything around him away forcing the heroes back. I'm ending this now. Pointing his gauntlet-covered fist at the three heroes. Hold the phone, there are supposed to be four. Where's All Might? Realization dawned when he felt a presence directly behind him. Izuku spun around to blast the hero with his device. As soon as he turned a large muscled hand gripped the gauntlet by the wrist. All Might held tight having only this one chance while his strength briefly returned. I'm sorry Midoriya. Cocking his other arm back he prepared to end this in one blow. Texas. Smash. Izuku's eyes widened seeing the first coming right at him. The time stone wouldn't help him here. While someone was touching him they would be immune to the time freezing quirk. The punch connected sending Midoriya crashing through the street, kicking up chunks of rubble as his spinning body skipped across the ground. An explosion of dust and debris erupted where he landed, defeated and most likely broken. Silence permeated the air as everyone held their breath, expecting the young villain to get back up. When he didn't they all sighed in relief. That seemed a bit overkill, Aizawa stated. Villain or not Izuku Midoriya was still just a kid. Tashinori was breathing heavily as he shrunk back into his gaunt form. At least it's over, Gran Torino said as he went to find where the kid crash landed. He didn't find him but he saw the gauntlet sticking out of a pile of rubble. It must have got knocked off the boy's hand from the force of that blow. Walking towards it the old man reached over to retrieve the weapon, but paused when he noticed something. The fingers were slowly moving. The metal hand clenched its grip as the red stone glowed with an ominous light. The pile of rubble was then levitated into the air revealing Izuku who laid in a crater bleeding and bruised. Ugh. Izuku grimaced as he tossed the debris that once covered him away. Blood dripped down his face as he stood on shaky legs. Impossible. Gran Torino was shocked that this kid could take a punch from Yagi and still remain conscious. Tashinori was also surprised as he watched Midoriya struggle to stand. His black sleeveless top was now torn and covered with holes. Gah. Izuku gasped in pain as he took stock of all his injuries that single punch did to him. Even with his epidermal barrier cranked up with the power stone at the last second, he still took some serious damage. A broken leg, arm, fractured pelvis, three broken ribs and a concussion. Using the time stone he began healing himself. That really hurt all might. His injuries were quickly fixed, but the patches of dirt and dried blood remained. But unfortunately for you it wasn't enough all the stones on his gauntlet began glowing as he held his fingers together. The heroes froze in their movements knowing that he was preparing for another one of those devastating finger snaps. Do you know why you failed today All Might? Because deep down you still won't take me seriously. 
Toshinori was about to argue but Izuku cut him off. Had you put your all into that punch then I wouldn't have been able to get back up. Do you have any idea how insulting that is to me? Izuku glared at him. In an instant he flash warped past Gran Torino and appeared before a startled All Might. With his right hand he reached and punched him hard, but without the strength of the power stone, right in his weak spot. Tashinori doubled over vomiting up more of his blood. I think I've seen enough. Not only that, but according to his estimate Himiko should have contacted him by now. Something must have happened with her, or she probably forgot. Either way Izuku needed to get to the junkar. I hope to see some of you in the new world. Farewell. A portal opened behind him that he stepped back into leaving the heroes. Did we just lose? Aizawa asked as Tashinori collapsed to his knees in a coughing fit behind him. In more ways than one, Gran Torino said sadly. I think it's much worse than we imagined Tashinori finally spoke after he stopped coughing. He thought back to what Midoriya said and he realized that the boy was right. Some part of him must have subconsciously held back when he punched. It was the kid's eyes. They were wide and scared for a moment. It reminded Tashinori of when he first met Izuku. When he nervously asked him if he could be a hero without a quirk, that memory appeared and he withheld some of his power in that brief instant. I really am sorry. He allowed a single tear to drop for the old Midoriya that he was starting to think was long gone. Izuku stared at the destroyed forge that created his final stone. He then turned around and looked to Himiko who stood frozen in ice up to her neck. It didn't take a genius to understand what happened here. Hi, she blushed in embarrassment. Where's the soul stone? He had a pretty good idea, but he wanted her to say it. Keep it simple please. Okay first that gravity girl showed up, then her friends showed up, then they took the stone and um dot 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 well here we are, she chuckled nervously. Please don't be mad why would I be mad? Izuku smiled pleasantly despite the unfortunate situation he found himself in. I don't blame you, I blame myself, he sighed. I didn't think anyone would discover this place, let alone a bunch of you as students, but how did Yuraka find out about? No matter, they won't get far. If you get me out of this ice I can help you get your stone back. Toga fluttered her eyes at him. Izuku no I think you've done enough. Izuku dismissed her and opened a portal behind her. Uh, wait, I'm still frozen. Himiko reminded him. Asked Dabai to thaw you out. The green-haired teen gently pushed her through and closed it. He then opened another portal that would take him outside the old abandoned smelting plant to the junkyard. Once he was out he started walking around. I wonder how far they got Izuku kept walking until he walked right past Shoto Todoroki sitting on an old car. He paused and took a few steps back then slowly turned his head to face the student who sat there nonchalantly. Izuku Midoriya. You're a bit shorter in person, Todoroki commented. Izuku just smiled. Shoto Todoroki, son of the number two hero endeavor. Quirk, ice and fire. This was just too perfect. Do you mind if I sit down? I've been on my feet all day and could really use a break go right ahead. Shoto nodded at him while carefully examining his opponent. Midoriya's black sleeveless top was torn and ragged looking. The black fingerless glove on his right arm was ripped in places. Hair was tussled or maybe it was natural like that. And his face and clothes were smeared and splattered with blood but there didn't seem to be any wounds on his body. His eyes then landed on the gauntlet on Midoriya's left arm. Yeyurazu had a plan to get that thing off of him. The first part was for Todoroki to sit here and distract him long enough for everyone to get into position. Thank you. Waving the gauntlet Izuku made himself a crude chair out of pieces of scrap from around the yard which he promptly sat on and faced the U.S. student that sat a short distance away from him. So let me guess the plan here. Todoroki flinched in surprise wondering if the villain figured out their plan but kept his composure. Your friends took my soul stone and you stayed behind since you're the strongest of them to keep me busy while they get away. Is that the gist of it? Maybe. The two-tone haired boy didn't confirm or deny his theory. You called it the soul stone. What does that mean and what does it do? It does something amazing, Izuku smirked at him, something I once thought was impossible. He didn't elaborate further so they remained silent for over a minute. Why are you doing this? Todoroki decided to stall by asking questions to keep the other talking. How about this? I'll answer your question if you promise to answer some of mine. Izuku offered while crossing his legs and placing his hands on the knee. That seems reasonable. Todoroki's eyes glanced off wondering if Momo was ready to give the signal yet. As you are probably aware I'm quirkless, Izuku began his story. In my entire short life I looked up to heroes. It's not really my fault. The world glamorizes the profession so much that every child wanted to be one. He paused with a light chuckle. Even after I was diagnosed as quirkless I didn't give up but you did when you became a villain, Todoroki brought up. When I met All Might the hero who gave me hope and found out the truth about him, that he's a fraud, that the world was broken. I decided to fix it, Izuku frowned. I just couldn't leave things as they are and how are things? The student asked. How are things so bad that you had to go down this path? This isn't a world of heroes and villains. It's a world where the strong are rewarded simply for being strong and the weak are discarded. Todoroki wanted to argue but Izuku continued. 
Would you believe your teacher All Might saw no value in me simply because I don't have a quirk? That can't be true. The ice boy did argue against that. Ah, but it is. Izuku smiled sadly. Back before I became a Potheuses, I actually got to meet All Might and had interesting conversation with him. I asked if it was possible for me to be a hero without a quirk. He said no, that it wasn't possible. But the sad irony is that All Might is quirkless himself. He's only borrowing someone else's power. He kept talking. So even the number one hero doesn't believe that hard work. Courageous spirit and determination makes a hero. It's all about power that's not true. Todoroki wanted to argue that those with quirks work hard to hone their abilities. It wasn't always easy for them. Oh really? Izuku raised a brow at that. Katsuki Bakugu is in your class. Do you honestly believe someone like him is hero material? Yes Shoto answered without hesitating. You're thinking of his quirk when you say that. Izuku sighed while pinching the bridge of his nose. Put his quirk aside and look at Bakugu as a person. Does he inspire hope? Does he make people smile? Is he a good person that does what is right? Or does he only do what he wants? Sometimes people only do things because they want to, not because it's the right thing to do. Izuku knew the difference and his time with Stain showed him there are many heroes out there like that. Todoroki thought a bit about his classmate. Bakugu was rude, loud, petulant, arrogant, self-centered and seemed to be constantly angry for no good reason. Not at all hero material if he was being honest. Maybe he just needs proper guidance. Todoroki still tried to defend him. Tell me then Shoto Todoroki, have you, any of your fellow students or teachers done anything to fix his behavior? Izuku smiled seeing the other boy fail to come up with an immediate answer. Or does Bakugu just bark and everyone lets it go because he's cool and powerful? He knew he was right and Todoroki's silence was confirming it. I know about him because we used to go to the same middle school. He scowled remembering the torment that bastard put him through. Bakugu was a bully that constantly threatened and belittled me. He even told me to kill myself once. Does that sound like a hero to you? The half and half boy silently watched Midoriya loudly vent. Yet despite his personality, his violent demeanor, and his school record attesting to the bullying he still got into the prestigious UA. You must really hate him, Shoto commented. I despise him. He's not the only one you know. There are many more people like Bakugu out there and they get everything they want because of their flashy powerful quirks. Izuku glared furiously. Are you starting to see what is wrong with society? Let's say you're right. How would you fix it? Todoroki decided to entertain the idea of a broken hero system. He ignored the nagging voice in his head that kept reminding him that his father was a perfect example of everything Midoriya believed was wrong with their society. Congratulations. Now you're a step closer to the conclusion I came to. Izuku smiled. The only way to fix it is to obtain the greatest power in the world and use it to dethrone those that rule our society. Then I'll be the one to make the rules and those who I deem unworthy won't be allowed to be heroes in my world. By defeating All Might. Even if you could beat the strongest hero in the world there are more that would rise up to stop you. Todoroki paused when Midoriya just laughed. Oh no, you really aren't seeing the bigger picture here. Izuku shook his head. Do you honestly think All Might is the king on the chessboard I'm playing against? He was seeking to overthrow the ones above even him. But enough about me and my evil plan. It's time you answered some of my questions Izuku stared at him with his big green eyes. Why do you never use your fire quirk? Shoto remained silent. Come on, think of me as a friend, talk to me. We're not friends, you're a villain, so that makes us enemies Todoroki corrected. Calling us enemies implies that you're a threat to me, Izuku scoffed at him, which you're not right now. Plus we have some time to kill before I hunt down your friends like dogs and take my stone my father. Todoroki paused before deciding to continue stalling. Is the number two hero endeavor yes I know, Izuku chuckled. He had done his research after all. For years he's been obsessed with beating All Might and cares for nothing but that goal, Shoto explained with a solemn tone. That rings a familiar bell. Endeavor sounded a lot like Kakin. When he realized he couldn't do it he decided to create a child that could surpass All Might for him. He married my mother for her quirk with the hopes of having child with both of their quirks. Todoroki's frown deepened at the memory of his mother. I'm the fourth of his offspring let me guess. You were the lucky one to be born with both. Izuku asked sarcastically. I wouldn't call it luck. Todoroki scowled. He put me through hell. Training me day and night. Just so I could surpass All Might did he do this to you? Izuku asked while touching the left side of his own face, pointing out the other's scar. Though this was done by my mother when she finally couldn't take living with that man anymore, Todoroki sighed sadly. She called my left side unsightly and after the incident my father had her locked up in a hospital. Ever since then I vowed to be the number one hero without using my left side. I'll deny him what he wants most. At that Izuku let out a loud chuckle. Deny him, by giving him what he wants. The green-haired boy smirked. That's stupid. If you really wanted to get back at your father then you wouldn't become a hero. That would be the ultimate revenge if you ask me. But no you're doing exactly as he planned for you except you're only hurting yourself I don't expect you to understand Todoroki said. Because I'm quirkless right. 
I can't possibly understand the pressure of having a pro hero as a father or to be blessed with such great quirk. Izuku spat with disdain. You have so much power and yet you're squandering it because of some daddy issues. How pathetic. I guess we can't see eye to eye. Todoroki got up from his seated position having heard Yeirazu's subtle message through the communicator in his ear. Good everyone is in place. Are we done talking now? Izuku also stood up with a mocking smile. And we were having such a wonderful conversation. Ice gathered around Shoto's right arm as he prepared. Come now. You don't actually believe your pathetic half-powered self can beat me. Alone no less. What makes you think I'm alone? Todoroki allowed himself a small smirk seeing Midoriya's confused face. HM. Izuku's eyes widened when he noticed a large shadow pass over him. Quickly looking up he was just in time to see the body of a large plane come crashing down on top of him. Its speed boosted by it as he used his quirk to push it down faster. Izuku on reflex brought his gauntlet up as soon as it collided with him. Release. Uraraka freed both the junked plane and Tenya from her the effects of her quirk halfway before the crash. Did that get him? Ada asked aloud as he landed safely next to the crash site. Keep moving. I doubt that will slow him down. Todoroki yelled. Look out. The wrecked plane exploded in a bright red ore as the metal was torn apart like paper. In the center Midoriya was kneeling on the ground holding the gauntlet up while screaming. Izuku stood back up to his feet pushing the pieces further away from him. With an angry shout he sent the torn chunks of metal straight at Ida. The young hero in training quickly evaded each and every one. Izuku turned and flash warped away before Kirishima could drop kick him. I see, so you all stuck around to lay a trap for me, Midoriya remarked. Clever, but foolish. He deflected the ice sent his way and sent shards of it at the red-haired boy. Whoa, Kirishima was knocked back. Luckily his hardening ability absorbed the damage he could have sustained. Ida was next, charging in to attack Midoriya. Izuku noticed him coming and created a portal in front of him and one on the ground behind him. Ida went flying through it to his surprise and was promptly kicked in the back. Izuku launched him away with a minuscule amount of strength from one for all. What was that? Momo wondered while watching the fight from a hidden spot. She was attempting to figure out how Midoriya's gauntlet worked and what sort of powers it gave him. It seemed he possessed superior matter manipulation and warping, but that strength just now was too powerful even with his build. He must have some sort of enhanced strength as well. She added that to the list of his abilities and factored into a plan on how to beat him. That won't be enough. Izuku shouted blowing Shoto away with a finger flick before he could blast more ice at him. Take this. Raising his foot up, he channeled a larger amount of one for all from the power stone and stomped it on the ground. In an instant a crater was blown into existence with Izuku floating in the center. Oh, he hissed in pain at his broken leg, but quickly used the time stone to heal the damage. W what? Shoto stared in shock. The Ada too was frozen in horror. Hell Kirishima finished. What's this? Izuku floated a bit higher in the air. Oh no, no, you were all doing so well. You managed to catch me off guard. Your attacks were consistent, he sighed in disappointment, and now you're all frozen in fear. He slapped his hands together. Don't be scared, keep fighting heroes. I'd hate to see you give up now. Izuku smirked. His words seemed to snap them into moving. At an Yeorazu voice through their communicators. Iraraka now, Momo said. Right Achako levitated a bunch of junk cars into the air while her fellow classmates neared her. Ida launched one of the floating cars with a rocket-powered kick, while Kirishima punched the second with all his strength and Achako smacked the others with a large metal beam that she made weightless. That's the spirit. Izuku grinned wider as the rusted vehicles came flying at him from one side while Todoroki's ice surged from behind. He didn't even move from his spot the air, instead he flicked his finger at the ice without turning around, shattering it completely. For the first car to come close to him he completely disassembled with a simple wave of his gauntlet. The next he punched away with the power stone and the last he merely held his left armored hand out and touched it. One of the space stone's abilities kicked in and covered the object in a blue aura locking its position in space. Very good. A combination attack. I was wondering when you would get smart and combine your quirks. He applauded them. Or they. It was then the green-haired teen noticed the small communicators attached to their ears and he began to quickly analyze the situation. Someone else is giving them strategies. Glancing around he couldn't spot this person. Hiding Ho. As Yoraka, Todoroki, Ida, and Kirishima closed in on him, he warped out of there leaving not a trace behind. He's gone. The redhead spun around looking for the villain. Keep an eye out he's got to be somewhere. Shoto spoke into his communicator. He vanished. Do you have eyes on him? I don't see Midoriya. Momo scanned the surroundings with her binoculars. Spread out and find him. Let everyone know if you do, she ordered. As the group split up to look around the junkyard, Yeirazu kept a vigilant eye from a distance. She froze when a hand gently took the binoculars from her grip. Well hello Momo Yeirazu. Izuku Midoriya crushed the object in his clutch. Quirk creation, and one of the few students to get into Yuan recommendation. 
The dark-haired girl backed away in panic. Relax, I'm just here to find out which of you has my stone. He chuckled as he held his hands up. No one has to get hurt as long as you. Izuku was interrupted when a long wet appendage wrapped around his right arm. Is that a tongue? Gross. Suyu so released her camouflage. She had been hidden by Yeyarazu in case Midoriya found their location. See you run. Momo created a smoke bomb with her quirk and tossed it at the boy's feet. Please. Izuku chuckled and flicked the smoke away. However he was unprepared for the flash grenade that Momo threw after the smoke. Izuku shielded his eyes with his arm as it went off. When it ended he looked around to see Momo and Tsuyu were gone. Damn it. Warping away again he decided on a different approach. U-R-A-R-A-K-A -A -A, where is he? Heading towards the site where the flashbang went off Achako suddenly paused when she felt a presence behind her. Spinning around she saw another portal open and Izuku step out. Hello Yuraka, he smirked as he approached her. It's been a while. You're looking well. I see Mei made that staff for you. He paused when he noticed she took a fearful step back. You're afraid of me aren't you? He sighed dejectedly. Why? She asked. You know why? Izuku frowned. You've seen it yourself. I never tried to hide the fact that people like me are looked down on by society. He took a step closer to her. What I do seems horrible. Yes, but I'm doing this for people like me. Not just the quirkless, but anyone who was weak and was never given the opportunity to be strong because of people like All Might keeping them down I don't understand. Achako shook her head sadly. You're a good person. Why be a villain for such a cause? I don't consider myself a villain, Izuku chuckled lightly. I think of myself more as a revolutionary. Tell me Uraka, if there was something terribly wrong with the world, what would you be willing to do to fix it? Achako remained silent, unsure of how to answer. That's what I thought. Izuku sighed and turned away from her. How can you call yourself a hero if you're not willing to sacrifice everything for the greater good of the world? Wait. She reached out to grab his shoulder only for her hand to be repelled away by his power. When you come to the same answer I did, come talk to me then. He walked back through the portal and left without even laying a hand on Yuraka. Intentionally hurting her would have left a bad taste in his mouth. K-I-R-I-S-H-I-M-A-I-Jiro glanced around wordly. This wasn't going as well as he'd hoped. If only he would arrive, then maybe they would actually have more of a fighting chance. But his friend had not responded to his text yet. Ijiro Kirishima, Izuku called appearing on top of a broken down truck. Quirk, hardening, a very strong defense isn't it? Kirishima took a cautious step back since he was alone now. Shall we put it to the test? Or do you want to tell me which one of you has the soul stone? Sorry man, that's not happening, Kirishima said defiantly. That's disappointing. The car Midoriya stood on was levitated up in the air. With a kick he sent the rusted vehicle flying at the red head. Hiroshima hardened himself and crossed his arms to absorb the impact. The truck bounced off him while shattering to pieces. He was unprepared for when the engine belt from the wreckage came to life and wrapped tightly around his neck. Hiroshima was hoisted up in the air while Midoriya pointed his gauntlet at him. You may have a hard outer shell, like a turtle, but like our dear friend the turtle you still need to breathe. The redhead choked and gasped as he kicked his feet and clawed at the belt around his throat that was growing tighter. Make a hand sign if you want to tell me where my stone is. Izuku chuckled as he continued to strangle him. He wouldn't kill him, but a good bluff required you to pretend that you would kill your opponent. However the green-haired teen paused when he heard a word shouted that he hadn't heard in over a year. D.I.K.U. Izuku spun around just in time to see Katsuki come charging in from the air. With a smirk he released Kirishima and put up a barrier to deflect the oncoming explosion. Bakugou leaped back. You bastard. It seemed Katsuki came prepared dressed in his hero costume complete with his grenade gauntlets. Hiroshima smiled in relief that Bakugou had got his message and came to help. Well dot 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 if it isn't Kaken. Izuku chuckled. And here I thought today couldn't get any better. Reaching out with the gauntlet he attempted to crush the boy who bullied him where the brat stood. Quick thinking is the only thing that saved Bakugou as he launched himself out of the area with a blast from his hands. A prime example of what is wrong with the world is delivered right to his karmic justice. Izuku smirked widely. I couldn't have asked for a better gift I'm going to kick your ass so bad they'll have to pick up pieces of you all over this junkyard. Bakugou responded with a grin of his own. He didn't like this. The old Deku was always terrified of him as he should have been, but this new version of Deku wasn't even flinching. It really pissed him off, trying to act tough even though you're still a quirkless loser. Let's see if you're a match for a quirkless loser and his infinity gauntlet. Katsuki came charging forward at him with his right arm about to attack. Izuku tilted his body to the left before it reached him and grabbed a hold of it with both hands, flipped him over his body and slammed him into the ground. Katsuki coughed as the air was knocked out of his lugs, still starting with the right hook I see. Oh Kaken, you're so predictable Izuku raised his foot about to stomp him. He was foiled when Kirishima tried to tackle him. Izuku quickly shoved the red head off, grabbed a nearby broken fridge with the reality stone and tossed it at him. 
He didn't have time to gloat as an explosion from Bakugu nearly blew him off his feet. Before he could retaliate he was kicked hard in the back by Ida. Nice try. Izuku blocked the next kick with his armored hand. While Izuku was blocking his attacks he didn't notice Katsuki getting some distance and grabbing the pin of his left grenade gauntlet. Get out of the way four eyes. Bakugu shouted as he pulled the pin. A giant explosion erupted from the end of his support item. Ida sped out of the line of fire just as it roared past him. Izuku faced the wave of destruction with a confident grin on his face and let himself be consumed by it. Bakugu smirked thinking he got him. That excitement quickly bled away when everyone watched as the blast suddenly imploded. The explosion was absorbed and compressed into a small orb in the palm of Izuku's gauntlet, who stood there completely unharmed. R-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-N-
not just at Deku for bringing his kidnapping up, but at himself for getting captured in the first place. Dude, whatever you're thinking don't do it. Tirashima called seeing that familiar murderous look in his friend's eye. Momo was just barely managing to slide the gauntlet off, a centimeter at a time. That's right Kakin, it was because of you. Izuku laughed at him. You're going to make such a wonderful villain in the future. I can see it now. Shut up, the blonde said through his teeth. Katsuki was now shaking in fury. Katsuki Bakugou, the boy who helped cripple A-L-L-M-I-G-H-T. That did it. Bakugou snapped and came charging at the nerd with his hand raised. Don't. Everyone shouted. D-I-I-I-E-E. Katsuki blasted Izuku right in the face, just as Yeyarazu had the gauntlet halfway off his arm. She was promptly blown back by the force and lost her grip. The other students also fell back, the tight hold they had on his arms giving way. Even Shoto was knocked back and had to let go of his ice to shield his face and body. When the smoke eventually cleared it revealed the frozen cocoon that held Midoriya was now empty with a shattered opening where Bakugou's attack hit. They all froze when they heard slow clapping a short distance away. Midoriya stood there. Bits of ice still clinging to his skin and clothes, light burn marks on his face and his hair an even bigger mess than it already was. It seems that explosion knocked him loose enough to quickly warp himself out of there and with Momo thrown off, there was nothing to restrict the power of the space stone. Like I said Kaken, Izuku smirked as he stopped clapping and held his gauntlet up putting two specific fingers together to do his own super move. You're so predictable. With only a mere 10% of the stone's power, he snapped his fingers and blew most of the students away with the force of the blast. Kirishima was just close enough to catch the frog girl, which he did. Sadly Izuku spotted this and grabbed a hold of him with his telekinetic powers. He then threw them hard against a small mountain of broken down robot parts and appliances. The two of them were knocked unconscious upon impact. Two down and Izuku's was interrupted when an explosion hit him in the back. Bakugou launched himself over his former childhood friend and began firing off as many explosions as possible. Each and every one of them was sucked up in a small warp gate that Izuku created in between them. Huh. Katsuki screamed as he threw himself at a still smirking Izuku. The green-haired villain blocked his hands with his gauntlet and since they were close enough, head-butted his bully forcing him back. Shaking the stars from his head Izuku looked behind him to see the old smelting factory in the distance. Getting another devious idea he reached out with his infinity gauntlet, using the power and reality stones in tandem. The structure shook violent, quickly coming apart. He let out a strained groan when he started pulling on it, blood dripping from his nose. H -l 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 -h. Izuku shouted at the top of his lungs as he yanked his arm towards the blonde sending big chunks of the large abandoned building flying across the junkyard straight on top of Bakugu while he warp gated away. Shit, Katsuki cursed as he tried to dodge the falling debris, but wasn't quick enough and was swept up in the impact. Scraps of metal and junk rained down upon the whole area. T-E-N-Y-A Ida swiftly dodged the falling debris while carrying Achako on his back. The girl was unconscious after suffering a head injury. He decided to get her to a safe area away from all the chaos before going back to retrieve the others and get out of here. It seems they severely underestimated Midoriya's power. Suddenly he tripped and fell forward. The very dirt he ran on turned soft like quicksand and sucked his foot in. Yuraka flew off his back and was quickly caught by Izuku. Tenya Ada, a pleasure to see you again, Izuku greeted while carrying the girl in his arms. Ada struggled as he was pulled into the ground up to his knees. Apotheoses, the engine boy glared at him. You can call me by real name you know, Izuku smirked down at him. He gently placed Achako on the ground then went back to slowly sinking Ida into the earth. Why? Ida exclaimed. When you saved me from the hero killer you taught me how a real hero should act. He was up to his waist now. Was all that talk about creating a true hero just a lie? Izuku frowned as he remembered that. Answer me. Ada was nearly underground at this point. That's still my one true goal. He stopped sinking the boy when he was up to his neck, leaving him room to breathe but not escape. I want to put an end to this broken hero society and create a new better one there's nothing wrong with this hero society. Tenya tried to argue. You only say that because you're still blind to the truth. Izuku turned away and placed his gauntlet on Achako's unconscious head making the boy flinch and fear what he would do to her. For once in your life Tenya, look around. Actually look with your eyes and you'll see what's wrong with this society. Izuku used the time stone to heal the head injury that Achako sustained and left her there without harm. When you come to same conclusion I did come talk to me then. With those parting words he opened a warp gate and stepped inside SHOTO. The youngest Todoroki desperately froze all the incoming wreckage while frantically gazing around for any of his fellow students. They could be buried under a pile of rubble and metal for all he knew. He paused when Midoriya appeared through a portal before him. I think it's time we continued where we left off Todoroki, Izuku smirked deviously. Shoto glared at his enemy and fired as much ice as possible at him. 
The messy-haired villain raised his gauntlet-covered fist up, channeled one for all through the green stone and punched the incoming ice, shattering it like glass. Damn it Todoroki tried again, this time shooting ice at him in an arc. Izuku raised a brow at the minor change, but it still wasn't a threat to him. He merely pointed his open hand and used the reality stone's power to instantly melt the ice into water. He also manipulated that water into bubbles just to mock the half and half boy. That all you got Todoroki? Izuku taunted him. Where's the fire? I refuse to use that bastard's power. Shoto would deny his father to the very end. How do you expect to be a hero with that attitude? Izuku glared at him. I'm sorry ma'am I couldn't save your daughter because I have severe daddy issues. That's you. That's the hero you're going to be in the future you know why I won't he was cut off before he could remind his opponent. You don't have a choice anymore Shoto Todoroki. Izuku yelled at him. This is your one and only chance to stop me, right here right now. He held his arms out. I can't. Shoto clenched his fists. Will you just forget about Endeavor? Izuku let out a frustrated sigh. You're not him. You're not even an upgraded version of him. You are unique and that's something your pathetic father can never lay claim to. He continued to try and bring out the best of his opponent. Not just because he wanted a good fight, but mainly he wanted to help Todoroki. He could tell that the bicolor haired guy was miserable. You have ice and fire. That's not the power of Endeavor. It's the amazing power of Shoto. It's all yours. It's mine. Shoto suddenly realized. In that instant fire erupted from his left side, lighting up the entire junkyard like a beacon. A raging inferno, suppressed for years finally set free. Izuku just laughed and clapped his hands. Magnificent. Absolutely wonderful. He complimented. Doesn't it feel great? To let go and just be yourself. Izuku knew all too well how liberating it felt. I'm starting to think you might be crazy. Shoto cracked a grin of his own. To help the person trying to defeat you can you defeat me now? That's the real question. Izuku flexed his wrist and fingers in the armored device. You'll find out. As long as you don't dodge this. Shoto took a firm stance and pulled his left arm back. I have no intention of dodging. Izuku matched his stance. Give me your best. Give me everything. Todoroki did just that. Unleashing the biggest flame he could muster straight at him. Izuku held his gauntlet out to stop it. He projected his barrier to halt the fire. Even amplified it with the power stone. I'm actually being pushed back. Izuku noticed the strength of the flames was causing his feet to skid backwards. Very good Shoto. I'm impressed. Drawing more power from the stones he tried to force the massive torrent of flames down. But they weren't letting up. Izuku started to sweat under the heat having underestimated Shoto a bit. That momentary lapse in concentration caused his force field to fall and the mossy-haired villain was abruptly consumed by the fire. Shoto finally stopped when his flames passed over the place Midoriya was standing. As the embers dispersed into smoke he nearly stumbled on his feet. It took a few moments to catch his breath, since that last attack took a lot out of him, but it looked like he won. Any feeling of victory was short-lived when he felt a metal hand grab his shoulder. I'm proud of you Shoto, Midoriya said from behind him. You got over your hatred for your father and hit me with everything you had you cheated, Shoto said in anger. Did I? He glanced back anxiously at Izuku to see his top was completely gone. Burned off revealing a tone upper body covered in light burns that seemed to be healing by some strange yellow energy. I took your fire head on, but it was too much for me and I had to warp away. You did well. And you're going to make a wonderful hero in the future. He spun Todoroki around and delivered a solid punch to the face with his right hand, knocking him down and out. That was interesting. Izuku stared down at the other's unconscious body. His hand suddenly lashed out and grabbed a small cannon ball right out of the air that was fired at him. A sneak attack Yeyurazu. I like that. He turned to face Momo who stood a short distance away holding a cannon. Actually it's a diversion. Yeyurazu dropped the cannon and produced a trigger mechanism. Activating it caused the metal ball in Midoriya's hand to explode into a carbon fiber net that wrapped around his body. This again. Izuku grabbed part of the net with both hands and after channeling green sparking energy from the power stone, tore the fibers like tissue. You know I think I'm starting to get the hang of my new stone. All Might's power is hard to control in large quantities, but in small doses it does wonders for me. He chuckled while purposely letting slip whose strength he was now wielding. He certainly enjoyed the pale look of shock on Momo's face. So now what? What will you do Momo Yeyurazu? He slowly started walking towards her. At first she was doubting that this would accomplish anything. No, I can do this. Shaking the doubt from her mind she tried to desperately reassure herself that the plan would work. Izuku stopped and gave her a moment to compose herself, but also to exercise a bit of caution. He honestly didn't see her as much of a threat, but after these students had managed to pin him down he decided to keep an eye open for any traps. Momo took a deep breath and removed something glowing from her pocket. Izuku's eyes narrowed finally seeing his soul stone. What are you up to? He wondered as she pointed her bare hand at him. Using her quirk she created something to surround her limb. 
He smirked when he finally realized what it was. A metal chrome gauntlet that looked very similar to his own infinity gauntlet with only a single slot on the back of the palm. Let's see how you handle your stone used against you. Momo raised her own gauntlet. With all the information she gathered during the fight, she figured that she now had a good understanding of how Midoriya's device worked, enough to make a replica of it. Take this, she exclaimed as she punched the air in his direction. Nothing, nothing happened. Momo tried again, but still no effect or reaction out of the stone. Huh? Izuku laughed at her. You didn't honestly believe that would work. He continued to mock her. You're intelligent Yayarazu. But you can't even begin to understand the vast complexity of my infinity gauntlet. He smirked arrogantly at her. Let me guess. You essentially tried to make a remote control. Using electrical pulses to forcefully activate the power inside the stone. Her eyes widened in surprise. That was exactly how she made her own gauntlet. She truly thought that's how it worked. Just how intricate was Midoriya's infinity gauntlet. I know because I made the same mistake when I built the first prototype. He chuckled remembering his past failures fondly. Even if you did make a perfect replica it wouldn't make any difference. Izuku said as he pointed his invention at the ground between them. The soul stone's power has no effect on someone like me. He frowned sadly. Making a pulling motion he caused the dirt to slide towards himself essentially turning the ground beneath Yeyarazu's feet into a treadmill. Now give me the stone. Izuku held his right hand out to catch her. Unfortunately an explosion nailed him from behind right before she was in arm's reach. K. It didn't do any damage, but surprised him more than anything. Spinning around he came face to face with a battered and slightly bleeding Bakugu. Momo took her chance to run off much to Izuku's annoyance. You damn nerd. Katsuki panted. Throw another building at me and see what happens. He was able to dodge some of the raining debris, but the rest he had to put his quirk into overdrive just to survive, and even then he still took a few hits. I thought you'd be fine, Izuku smirked. How do you expect to surpass All Might if you can't handle that much? Just shut up already, the blonde growled out. No, Izuku glared at him. The time you can talk down to me is over. He faced his former bully with confidence. You know Kakan. The same day I understood the truth about All Might is the same day I understood the truth about you. The other boy just stared daggers at him. You're just a child playing at being a hero. That's all you've ever been and that's all you'll ever be. And what are you? Just a crybaby that's throwing a fit because he couldn't be a hero without a quirk. Bakugu yelled back while Izuku just laughed at his insult. I have no interest in being a hero anymore. I've got a much greater goal in mind, he said. I'm going to create a new hero society and you Katsuki Bakugu won't be part of it, he chuckled darkly. They won't even remember you by the time I'm done. Katsuki fumed and came charging at him. Come on. Izuku braced himself and held his gauntlet out to guard against the explosion he knew was coming. The blast created a large smokescreen that obscured his vision. Katsuki managed to knock him back into a wall of scrap behind Midoriya and proceeded to hammer him with more explosions. Do you remember me now? Bakugu screamed as he continued to blast him. Having enough Izuku powered through the explosions and punched him square in the cheek. The blonde's face met the dirt from the strength of that fist. Izuku marched towards while Bakugu pushed himself off the ground and spat out the blood from his mouth. Is that it? Izuku smirked at him. Katsuki snarled and launched himself at him again. Using his quirk he propelled himself around the villain in an erratic pattern hoping to attack a vulnerable spot. He was sent flying again when a large truck tire came at him out of nowhere. Oops. Izuku chuckled. With a shout Bakugu leaped to his feet, blasted himself straight at Midoriya while dodging the pillars of earth that emerged from the ground. Spinning his body he managed to kick Midoriya in head, then plant his boot on the boy's infinity gauntlet, keeping it pinned to the ground while the blonde threw an explosion point blank in his face. Izuku felt something wet on his cheek as the smoke dissipated. Reaching up with his other hand he felt a small cut there, not even worth healing with the time stone. All that for a drop of blood. Izuku smirked as he looked at the small red stain on the tip of his finger. Chuckling to himself he threw Bakugu off of his device. Katsuki stumbled back, giving him the opportunity to rush in and deliver multiple empowered punches to the hero student's face and stomach. Duh. Bakugu tried to shield himself with his left arm, which caused the grenade gauntlet to be shattered with one punch. With a powerful uppercut he sent Katsuki sailing through the air. Look at you go. Izuku clapped his hands in mock applause. Bakugu struggled to stand back up on his feet and shake the dizziness from his mind. Wouldn't it be easier just to stay down? You can't beat me Kaken. No matter how hard you try I thought I told you to shut up you damn nerd. Katsuki spat as he finally steadied himself. I'll beat you. Heroes are always win dot 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 so that's what I'll do. He shouted with resolve. He wouldn't let Deku beat him no matter the cost. So then, Izuku's face darkened. If you can't win dot 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 by your own logic that would mean you're not a hero right? He chuckled before smirking at the spiky blonde-haired teen. What makes you think you even deserve to win? Do you know what you are Katsuki Bakugo? 
Izuku paused before listing off all the other boys' failures. You couldn't beat that slime villain. You lost to me once before at USJ. You couldn't make Todoroki use his full power at the sports festival. You failed to beat All Might in your exam. You got captured by the League of Villains, and you failed your provisional license exam. Do you know why? It's because you're a loser. Bakugu's eyes widened. You've always been a loser. That's why you bully and belittle people to hide your own pathetic feelings of inadequacy and self-hatred the blonde was shaking at how Izuku was describing him and naming everything that marred his once perfect record. Deku, he said through clenched teeth. Making a circle with left hand he fired a large explosion through the small hole his hand made, condensing it into a beam, his patented armor-piercing shot. Izuku smirked and held up his gauntlet amplifying the barrier around it to split the beam apart. Slowly he made his way towards Katsuki while simultaneously deflecting his super move. When he was close enough he pushed forward, backhanding the student across the face. Bakugo was about to pull the pin of his only remaining grenade and blast his childhood friend point blank. But Izuku grabbed his gauntlet with his own. He then sent a pulse of red energy into the other's limb that obliterated his grenade device and broke his right arm in three places. R-A-A-H-H. Fighting through the pain of his shattered right arm he used his left to deliver the largest explosion he could muster at Midoriya's chest. The blast created a giant pillar of heat and smoke where Izuku once stood. Bakugu was coughing uncontrollably, left arm feeling dislocated, but not broken like his right. From out of the black smoke a golden gauntlet reached out and grabbed Katsuki by the throat and hoisted him up in the air off his feet. He gasped, but didn't have the strength nor the functionality in his arms to struggle. Izuku appeared out of the smoke with a pleased smirk on his face, his big eyes shifting from bright green to red, blue, yellow and finally his normal emerald-colored ones. This is Checkmate Kaken. The burns and cuts on his bare-muscled torso were quickly healed by his time stone. It seems Katsuki's explosion was able to penetrate his epidermal barrier after all. How? Bakugo struggled to speak with the other's hand around his throat. How dot 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 is someone dot 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 like you dot 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 so strong? After staring him the eyes for a few moments he finally answered. Because I was born weak, Izuku said honestly. I know what it's like to be weak. And that's what makes me strong. Cocking his right fist back he channeled a small amount of one for all and punched Katsuki right in the gut, hard enough to make him spill the contents of his stomach. After throwing the defeated blonde to the ground he forced him onto his knees facing the other way, holding him in place with a hand gripping his spiky hair. Now then Kaken, for once in your miserable life you're going to help me, he whispered in the other's ear. Alright Yeyurazu, you can come out now, he called out loud, counting to ten. Nothing happened as Izuku expected. If you want Bakugu to live, you will show yourself. He tried again only to receive silence in return. Have it your way. Wait. Momo finally revealed herself from behind a pile of old rusted cars. Don't hurt him whether or not I do anything to him depends entirely on you, Izuku smiled at her. The thing is Yeyurazu, I really like you, not just you, all of you you as students that came here to try and stop me. I admire your courage to face an opponent that completely outclasses you. I would feel so terrible killing any of you guys. That was truth he actually didn't want to kill any of these heroes in training. Katsuki here on the other hand well. I hate his guts. He's everything I despise and I wouldn't lose an ounce of sleep splattering him all over this junkyard he's bluffing. Bakugu thought while he was sweating under Izuku's murderous intent. He has to be. You can save his life Momo. All you have to do is give me my soul stone. Izuku narrowed his eyes at her. The choice is yours. I'll even make it easy for you. He grabbed Bakugu's shoulder with his infinity gauntlet and started forcing the matter manipulating power through his body. Tatsuki screamed in pain as his body was covered in a red aura. Hurts doesn't it Kaken? That's the feeling of your molecules slowing being pulled apart. You know I've always wondered what it would look like when a person's entire molecular structure was disassembled in an instant. Shall we see? Stop. Momo shouted at him. Izuku stopped torturing his former bully and focused on her. The dark-haired girl nervously pulled out the black and purple glowing stone from her pocket. With a heavy sigh she tossed it at him. Midoriya caught it with his right hand and looked amused at it. Yes, my beautiful soul stone. Good job Yeyurazu. His eyes lit up with further amusement. I must compliment you on such a good forgery. Momo gasped at him having figured it out so easily. But how? He cut her off with a quick laugh. Come now. I created these stones. You don't think I can't tell a real one from a fake? He crushed the copied soul stone in his hand and noticed the small sparks from the microchips planted inside. A fake stone with a tracking chip hidden inside. Very clever. But just for that I'm taking Bakugu's legs. The red glow covered Katsuki again as he prepared to do as he said. No wait. Momo pleaded. She frantically pulled out the real stone from her other pocket. That's better, Izuku stopped. Walk over to me and place it in my hand. He ordered with a serious frown on his face and a worry eye on her person. Doing as he commanded Yeyurazu slowly made her way over to him casting a concerned look towards her captured fellow classmate who sat there on his knees panting. 
The shirtless villain smiled as he held his right hand out when she was in touching distance. Hesitantly Momo obeyed and placed the stone in his palm. Thank you. He whispered as he held the gem in his fingers victoriously. You got what you wanted. She glared at him. Now let Bakugo go of course. With a wide grin he threw Katsuki a short distance away into a pile of scrap and junk. Oh and for the record I was bluffing and was never going to kill him. He chuckled making the girl's eyes widen in shock. With a satisfied look he took the soul stone and placed it in the last open slot of his gauntlet inside the palm of the hand. Oh Izuku screamed as the new power surged into him. The feeling was much more intense than all the other stones. Neon purple nerve-like patterns covered his body as his eyes glowed the same. Momo, who was still standing right there, was nearly blown away by the shockwave that emanated from him. When it subsided he gazed down at the soul stone and his now-completed infinity gauntlet. He smiled proudly at having finally completed the greatest invention in human history. I'd love to continue playing with you all, but I've got bigger fish to fry. Farewell Momo Yeyarazu. Izuku created a portal directly behind him that he stepped back into. Give my regards to your friends. He waved at her before closing it, leaving her alone, but not for long. Where did he go? Kirishima appeared carrying a barely conscious Tsuyu. Following him Yuraka appeared looking completely unharmed while Ida was next to her covered in dirt. Todoroki having recovered also appeared walking over to Yeyarazu as she collapsed to her knees. Are you alright? He asked. Did he hurt you? I'm f fine. Her voice sounded shaky and far from fine. The Bakugu is badly injured. H. He needs medical attention. Swallowing her nerves Momo pointed to where Katsuki lay in a heap. This is my fault. Yuraka looked around at her injured and scared friends feeling responsible for all this chaos. If she hadn't come here, they wouldn't have followed her and none of this would have happened. That's what she thought and now she would have to deal with the consequences. In the middle of a crowded street a woman was surrounded by a large group of journalists and camera operators. These people had finally tracked down the mother of the infamous apotheosis that recently took on All Might and exposed his secret to world and now the public wanted to know more about him. When did you realize your son was a villain? One of the reporters asked. Or did you always know? Please leave me be. Inko pleaded as she tried to walk past the crowd of reporters and photographers blocking her path on the sidewalk. Was it the way you raised Izuku that turned him to a life of villainy? Another reported asked accusingly. That's not. Please let me pass. Inko just wanted to go home. Do you know why your son has turned out a villain? A more aggressive one asked while shoving a microphone in the poor woman's face. Unknown to any of them on the outside of the crowd stood someone a head shorter than most of the adults wearing a brown trench coat, hat and scarf to hide his face. The figure watched these media vultures harass the lady with his hands in his pockets. His fingers twitched underneath the fabric and suddenly all the cameras, microphones and devices the reporters were using shut down. What the? The reporters and journalists didn't understand what just happened. Inko took advantage of the situation and slipped past the horde while they were distracted. She silently thanked whatever god was watching over her. The figure in the trench coat nodded his head in satisfaction and strolled away. He had an important reunion to get to after all. Hospital I lost. Bakugu laid in his hospital bed staring at the ceiling vacantly. He barely heard the doctor say that he was being released today and that his parents were on the way to pick him up. I lost to Deku. He just kept thinking of that battle over and over again. I was utterly crushed by that nerd. Katsuki glared hard at the space above him. You've seen better days Kakan. With a startled flinch Bakugu turned to see Deku sitting in one of the chairs his parents used when they visited. The nerd looked exactly how he did during their battle. Shirtless and covered in dirt and blood spatters. With his gauntlet strapped to his left hand. Tell me. Does it hurt? Does it sting? To be so utterly useless. Izuku chuckled. Maybe we should start calling you Deku Katsuki stared daggers at him. Shut the fuck up. He shouted. Leave me alone. Oh Kaken. Izuku stood up and smirked down at him. You're already alone. He chuckled. You've got no one. Even me. Your mortal enemy has long since surpassed and left you in the dust where you belong. Stepping closer to the bed he leaned over, getting right in the blonde's face. If you really want to beat me dot 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 take a swan dive off the roof and hope you'll be reborn with a better quirk Bakugu suddenly snapped awake. His wide red eyes spanned around the room. He realized it was just a dream and calmed himself down. Still though, those last words Deku said in his dream continued to haunt him. Across the city damn it, an amorphous blob of green sludge cursed. His gooey body was pressed against the wall of the alley. A mysterious red aura covered his form that prevented him from moving or escaping. He didn't know what happened. The sludge was merely moving to a new hideout after recently escaping prison and this mysterious figure in a brown coat appeared out of nowhere and attacked him. Imagine my surprise to find you escaped from prison Mr. Sludge. The figure chuckled. Surprise and delight. He slowly approached the slime pin to the wall. Who the hell are you? The villain demanded. It's only fitting that I test my stone on the villain that helped start my journey. Izuku smirked removing the hat and scarf. 
Plus I need to see if this works on mutation types after all it's you. The sludge remembered this kid from the day he got splattered by All Might over a year ago. That's how he got arrested in the first place. Don't worry this won't hurt. Me, Izuku reached out with his infinity gauntlet and grabbed the only solid part of the villain's body, his eye. The slime man screamed in pain as a purple glow engulfed his vision. Meanwhile at you. A. Tashinori stared out the window of the teacher's lounge. From his spot he had a good view of the crowd of protesters outside the front gates of the school. Ever since the battle against Midoriya a week ago where his true form was revealed to the public, people had begun to talk. They were wondering why their greatest hero lied about his power. Quirkless people were wanting to know why they were never given a chance to compete in the field of heroes if the number one hero was also quirkless. The protesters outside consisted of the quirkless, as well as those with almost insignificant, weak and impractical quirks, all of them holding signs that said things like just like us, my might, no false gods, quirkless isn't weakness, and symbol of lies. There's more of them since yesterday, a voice said next to him. Tashinori didn't need to turn around to know that it was Aizawa who entered the room. After everything we do for the people, they turn on you this fast. It sometimes makes you wonder why we even do it, he commented. You have to see it from their perspective, the skinny man sighed. Many people who lack a quirk or have an impractical quirk who had dreams of being a hero just like young Midoriya did, and just like him were denied a chance to even try. He stared sadly at the protesters. I used to think it was for their own protection, but now I'm starting to think that it really is prejudice that keeps them from competing in our arena I can't argue since I'm biased myself. Aizawa knew all too well how that felt. He had an impractical quirk, but was one of the rare lucky ones to be given a chance to be a hero. This is off topic, but Katsuki Bakugu was let out of the hospital. Their students suffered a broken right arm that needed surgery, a dislocated left arm, a concussion, and a few cracked ribs. Midoriya really let him have it. The other students got off easy compared to him from what I was told Bakugu and Midoriya have a history together. Tashinori explained, based off of young Bakugu's personality. Not a good history I bet I can imagine Midoriya's delight, Aizawa said sarcastically. To wield all that power against a boy you share a lot of bad blood with. How could he resist? How are the others? Tashinori asked, still on house arrest. The homeroom teacher said without missing a beat. He was pissed when he found out a handful of students went to a junkyard to confront Midori. As soon as Bakugu was taken away by the paramedics Aizawa immediately laid into them. They were all on house arrest for two weeks for their reckless behavior. I can't say I condone what they did but I admire their bravery, Tashinori confessed. Doesn't excuse nearly throwing their lives away. Aizawa crossed his arms in disapproval. Luckily Midoriya is a merciful villain I wouldn't go so far as to call him merciful, Tashinori said. The kid did everything possible to hurt him in one of the worst ways by exposing his true appearance to the world. Oh good, you're both here, a voice said entering the room. They looked to see the small form of Principal Nezu by the door holding a bright yellow shopping bag. Where have you been all morning? Aizawa questioned. Comic book stores, the mouse bear creature explained simply. Comic book stores, they both asked. Let me explain, Nezu approached the two men. I've doing a little research on Izuku Midoriya's device, based off what you told me. At first I couldn't find any good leads. But when I looked up the words Infinity and Gauntlet I found something rather interesting. He paused dramatically. I then went around every comic book store in the city until I found this. He reached into the bag, pulled out a book and held it for them to see. The book was titled Infinity Gauntlet. This is a comic book by Marvel Comics from a long time ago. Before the age of quirks began, Nezu handed Aizawa the book. You've got to be kidding me. Aizawa looked at the cover noticing the purple skin character with a gold gauntlet on his hand, various stones attached. Almost like Midoriya's version, except the comic had six not five. I'm afraid not, Nezu frowned. Are you telling me he got the idea to build his gauntlet from a comic book? Tashinori couldn't believe this. Indeed, Nezu said while Aizawa began flipping through it. It seems Midoriya is a fan of these comics this is impossible. Shota began reading the pages for the possible connections. I hate to admit it but young Midoriya is extremely brilliant. If anybody could figure out a way to make it possible it would be him, All Might said honestly. If his gauntlet is based off the one in the comic book then how did the heroes in that beat it? They don't, Nezu said as a matter of fact. The villain is just too powerful and ends up losing due to his own ego and arrogance and Midoriya as previously established is the furthest thing from stupid, Aizawa commented. He won't make the same mistakes and we shouldn't count on him to this might give us an idea about kind of powers he now possess though, Tashinori added taking the book to flip through it himself. Not quite, the small animal sighed. Based off what you witnessed Midoriya's stones work differently than the ones in the comic. His reality stone manipulates matter. His time stone only briefly stops time in an isolated area and heals physical damage. And his space stone gives him some kind of invisible force field as well as warping abilities. Let's not forget his power stone right all might, Aizawa added. 
Unfortunately due to one for all's unique method of transfer Midoriya was able to fully acquire the quirk from a sample of your DNA Tashinori, Nezu summarized. Now that he has it, it's only a matter of time before it fades from you, is that right? There has to be a way to get it back. Tashinori clenched his fists in anger and frustration. Maybe if we can get the gauntlet and the stones from him. But he obviously won't allow that without a fight, the principal said referencing the recent battle against the young villain. I hate to say it, but you might have to fight him again this time with everything you got. Could you go all out on a villain that you created? All Might asked. Not sure, I've never created a villain before, Nezu said with honesty. On a related note, I had another reason for coming in here, he paused. Your successor Mirio, he's been in the training room all week since that battle. Can you go speak to him? All right. Tashinori wondered why Mirio was working himself so hard when it was the weekend. Once he was gone the two faculty members continued talking. There's another thing that worries me about this comic book, Aizawa said while flipping through it again. The Soul Stone, according to this, has power over life and death. It can also extract souls Midoriya's stones don't work the same remember, Nezu reminded him. So what do you think it does? For it to hold such high value for him it must be powerful. Aizawa and Nezu both frowned thinking all the possibilities. The homeroom teacher went back to the window to watch the protesters outside. He spotted a brown-haired girl carrying a few boxes, suitcases, and backpack. She was headed towards the exit. The principal also observed her. I hate that we had to expel her. But the government was putting a lot of pressure on our school to make an example out of someone after that stunt they pulled. Nezu sighed with regret. I don't like it either. But she knew where Midoriya was hiding, didn't tell anyone and went alone to confront him. Aizawa watched her go around the protesters. She's lucky her friends followed her or she could have been seriously hurt or dead. I hope she ends up alright. Nezu watched her disappear. Outside Achako carried her belongings down the street with difficulty. She could have used her quirk to make it easier. But she honestly didn't feel like it. The only place Yuraka had to go was the apartment she got before the school built the dorms. Luckily the rent was already paid for the whole school year, so she could still live there until she figured out what to do. Expelled that word still left her numb. Though Yuraka couldn't deny that she deserved it for endangering her friends. They tried to defend her, but the faculty wouldn't have it. Even May attempted to speak up, telling them that it was her idea to go find Midoriya, as she knew about the junkyard. For that she was kicked out of the development studio and given house arrest for three weeks. Principal Nezu apologized and said he had no choice. The government was cracking down on hero schools especially UA, not just for safety, but also on students recklessly endangering themselves before they even graduated. The academy had no choice but to expel one of them and since Yuraka was the one to leave school grounds to find and confront a villain, she was it. Her provisional license and hero costume were of course confiscated, along with her staff. She was then given till the weekend to find other living arrangements, pack her belongings and leave the dorms. Ada was probably the most upset. He kept going on about how he should have tried harder to convince them to leave rather than stay and fight. Suyu was a crying mess. Hiroshima said how unmanly it was that she was expelled. Momo felt guilty as it was a plan and strategy that failed to defeat Midori. Todoroki hadn't said anything, but kept glancing at her regretfully. No one had seen Bakugur yet as he was still in the hospital. After saying goodbye Yuraka packed the rest of her things and left the school grounds. Making her way down the street Achako's mind kept going over what to do next. She could apply for other hero schools in the country, but with her record of expulsion it may prove difficult. She hadn't even told her parents yet that she was kicked out of UO great. She sighed as she felt drops of water hit her head. It had started to rain worsening her already sour mood. Just when she thought that it couldn't get worse she tripped and dropped all her cases on the sidewalk. She knelt down to pick them up and attempt to fight back tears of frustration. Do you need a hand? A voice asked. Yuraka didn't look up but saw a pair of black boots standing in front of her. No thank you. Before she could say anything further her boxes were levitated in the air. And the rain was parted around them. Then perhaps you need a friend. A gold gauntlet covered hand with a purple stone inside the palm entered her vision. Achako looked up in surprise to see Izuku standing there with his hand held out. The girl was too shocked for words. There stood the villain that thrashed him all a week ago, out in public and in broad daylight. Izuku smiled down at her as Yuraka began looking around wondering if anybody else was seeing him. One of the abilities the Soul Stone grants me is called Notice Me Not. Unless I do something to directly get their attention, the people around us will ignore me, he explained as simply as possible. What do you want? Achako asked while keeping a wary eye on him. I just wanted to have a talk with you, he said. Do you have somewhere private we can go? He noticed she looked unsure. I promise I won't hurt you okay. Swallowing nervously the former student decided to believe him. I have an apartment not far from here. Izuku nodded and helped carry her belongings. Training room Mirio. 
Tashinori called interrupting the boy's practice causing him to trip mid-swing and nearly fall flat on his face. Luckily he phased through the floor and his clothes before he embarrassed himself. Popping back out of the ground the third year quickly put his pants back on. Oh might, Mario greeted him. So I've been told that you've been training here all week. You've barely taken a break, the hero said in a chastising tone. That's not good for your health young Mirio I know. The other blonde had the decency to look a bit ashamed. It's just, after what happened last week, and then those protesters showed up. I just need to get stronger I understand you feel frustrated. Tashinori sighed and looked down. Believe me I feel even more frustrated than you do. He walked over to what was supposed to be his successor. You probably feel angry at Midoriya for what he's done I'm not angry at him. Mirio suddenly interrupted. I feel sorry for him come again. I think he's lost and just very angry at the world, Mirio explained. After what you told me about him I think I get it. I would probably be similar to Izuku if I was in his shoes that's. Tashinori was at a loss for words. I want to save him. He's just a boy that's given up on heroes. Mirio looked at his teacher. That's why he wants to create a new hero society. I'll convince him that there's still hope, he said with extreme positivity. I'll be his hero if that's what it takes Mirio. Tashinori looked at his successor with pride before buffing himself up. You're absolutely right. He gave his trademark smile. Young Midori is a villain that needs to be saved not pummeled into oblivion. Forgetting his earlier conversation about taking the boy seriously as an enemy he carried on. We'll take back one for all and Midoriya from the clutch's evil if that's what it takes. It wasn't wrong to hold on to the hope that Izuku could be brought back. A bit naive perhaps, but not wrong. Why? Because we are here. They both shouted in unison. Now the only problem is, I have no idea what young Midoriya will do next. Tashinori's words suddenly dampened the mood. None, Mirio questioned. The hero shrunk back to his skinny form in a cloud smoke when an unpleasant thought popped into his head. I think there is one person who might know, but it's someone I hope to never talk to ever again elsewhere this is a nice apartment. Izuku commented as he placed the bags down. It was small, but cozy. See can I get you a D-drink? Achako stuttered nervously. A villain in her apartment. How could she not be nervous? You're afraid of me, he stated. The green-haired team looked down at his gauntlet. All this power I wield, against heroes. You should be afraid. That was an honest fact. I'm so terrifying. He said playfully with his hands raised like claws, trying to lighten the mood. It didn't work. After a minute of awkward silence Yuraka finally decided to speak. How long have you been planning this? She asked. About a year ago. Way before I met you in May, Izuku told her honestly. Just tell me why. Yuraka pleaded. Because I can't stand this world we live, he glared down at the floor. This ridiculous power controlled hero-based society. Izuku walked over to the window in her apartment. For years I was treated as an outcast, a stain on society, for the simple act of being born without a quirk. According to everyone I had no purpose, no use to the world, no reason to even be alive. I felt so alone. He paused and placed his hand on the glass. So I wanted to be a hero, because I figured there were more people like me out there. I thought that maybe if they could see a quirkless person become a hero that would give them hope that the world isn't so terrible. I just wanted to do right and instead I was met with scorn and ridicule from people like Bakugu. His tone turned angry. Then I met All Might and here I thought the hero who preaches that anyone can be a hero would believe in me. But no it turns out he's just like everyone else. All that matters to him and everyone is power. Izuku turned to face her. So I figured if that's what it takes then I'll become the most powerful person on the planet and change the rules of society all of this chaos. Just to twist society into your vision? Iraraka couldn't believe that was his reason. I didn't twist anything, Izuku smiled. All I did was shake things up and expose All Might for the fraud that he is but all that destruction you caused was necessary to show the world what I'm capable of. He cut her off. I've merely challenged the status quo and since the current hero society is held together by such flimsy threads it's all starting to unravel because of you. The gravity girl argued. Would you rather someone else with ill intentions, like the League of Villains bring down society? Izuku argued back. You're saying you don't have ill intentions? Achako pointed at him. Yes, all I want is to create a new hero society, a real one, a solid one that isn't built on lies and the broken dreams of others. He noticed she looked away sadly. I would think you Uraka would understand better after what they did to you at Yua what are you talking about? She glared at him. It's pretty obvious isn't it? Izuku walked towards and began to circle the girl. I saw you leaving the academy in street clothes carrying your things. They expelled you didn't they? He stopped in front of her. Why did you come to Rax's junkyard? The green-haired boy stood closer to her. I just wanted to talk to you, Achako said honestly. I didn't come looking for a fight. I was hoping to get you to turn yourself in as I don't believe you're evil that was brave of you. Izuku smiled at her. Very heroic of you too. And your friends followed you there I'm guessing yes HM. You tried to do the right thing and look what happened. They expelled you. Izuku tilted his hat. Do you know why? 
because I recklessly endangered myself and others. Achako repeated what Aizawa and the principal told her. But your intentions were good, he reminded her. Ask yourself, why didn't they expel Bakugu? He didn't come to help you or the others. He just wanted to fight me and he didn't even have a provisional license. Achako's eyes widened when she realized that he had a point. Why didn't they expel him? The explosive hothead must have broken more rules than she did. The answer is simple. They weighed the value of you all, choose you as the least valuable and then cut you loose that's not true. Hiroraka yelled at him. Bakugu is so powerful that they can't afford to lose the top student in your year Izuku continued despite seeing her start to tear up. They need him to be a hero. That's why they don't try to improve his behavior and why they're letting him get away with reckless endangerment. While you a girl with much less power is expendable to the hero profession but that's not fair. She cried. Why is it like that? Congratulations. You're starting to understand that power is all that matters. Izuku held his arms out. Just like I did. This is the world we live in Achako Yuraraka. Nobody cares about doing the right thing and real heroes don't exist. He turned around to look back out the window. This society is built on empty hollow pillars, precariously balanced. Now that I've tipped that balance it's all crumbling down. Those protesters outside you are just the beginning. Soon more people will start seeing the cracks and flaws in our hero system and then they'll start wanting change. He chuckled lightly. Sadly the government is reluctant to change. And why should they change when they've got the ultimate hero All Might up their sleeve except All Might isn't what he appears to be? Achako was starting to understand his plan. Now that everybody knows the truth about him, he can no longer be seen as the symbol of peace now you're getting it Izuku faced her again. One more major push and the government will have no choice but to turn to someone else you mean you. He merely smiled at her instead of answering. It finally came together for Yuraka as to why he did this. No one would listen to a quirkless boy no matter how smart he was in this power-obsessed world. But now that he was one of the strongest people in existence, Izuku would actually be taken seriously. Yuraka, how would you like a job? Izuku offered. What kind of job? She asked. How would you like to be a real hero? He questioned. You said you wanted to be a hero so your parents can live comfortably. That's a very noble cause. Izuku held out his right hand towards her. But if you work with me, we can make sure even more people live comfortably. We can fix this broken hero system, so people like us aren't tossed aside like trash anymore. His words were sounding more and more attractive to her. Even his actions were all making perfect sense. In a corrupt society any change that threatened those in power wasn't allowed. That's why the change Izuku was trying to make seemed like acts of villainy. But in reality it was all for the betterment of the world and those who lived in it. Slowly Achako reached out and gently took his offered hand. It sounded like she could still achieve her dreams. Despite you deeming her unworthy and kicking her out, she could still be a hero in Izuku's new world. Excellent. The green-haired teen smiled, clearly pleased that she made the right choice. Now as a show of faith I'm going to let you in on the next phase of my plan. Can I trust you with this? Without hesitation Yuraka nodded. T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S prison well. A nearly faceless man secured to a chair and life support machine smirked. This is indeed a surprise. The great symbol of peace, here to visit me, he chuckled darkly. Returning to the scene of your crime. You're as cheerful as ever, All Might noted. You'd think having your face smashed in would rob you of some of that humor. My humor is one of the few things I have left. All for one said with a smile. You took nearly everything else, including my freedom we could argue all day who had more taken from them. But I want to talk about something else. Tashinori glanced at the clock in the interrogation room he was in. He was only given 15 minutes to speak to the villain and that was even with his reputation. All for one was behind the impenetrable glass smiling like the cat that got the canary despite his situation. Go on then, the villain mocked. What did you do to him? All Might asked. Him? You're going to have to be more specific. He had did a lot of things to a lot of people after all. Izuku Midoriya. What did you do to that boy? At the mention of that name All for One's grin widened. What did I do to him? I should be asking you that. The villain turned it around on his enemy. What did you do to Izuku? Cut the crap. All Might snapped at him. Turning my master's grandson into a villain is one thing. I can understand that. But why involve Midoriya? He has nothing to do with us, so why make him so twisted? It was here that All for One laughed. You're right. He has nothing to do with heroes and villains. Quirkless people should stay in their place, is that right? He spoke with thick sarcasm. It's that very thinking that brought out the worst in Izuku. Oh and for the record I didn't do anything to him. That boy was already twisted before he got to the League of Villains or lie, All Might argued. All I did to Izuku was pat him on the head and say that I believe he could do great things. The faceless villain frowned. You crushed his hopes and dreams. Yet I'm in here while you're out there. Isn't it ironic All Might? You see Midoriya as someone to manipulate don't you? Tashinori stated angrily. Not a single one of you people seems to understand what a rare gem Izuku is, all for one chuckled. A genius mind unburdened by the arrogance and ego that a quirk would give him. 
You know had I never found Tamura, Izuku would have made a wonderful successor. All Might silently fumed at the taunts while the man talked. I even offered him a quirk, but he refused. His heart was set on that device of his after all you knew about his gauntlet. Tashinori thought it strange that he allowed Midoriya to build such a thing under his watch. Of course I did. I not only approved it, but I gave him ideas on whose quirks to use in making the stones. All for one remembered the boy fondly. He calls it the Infinity Gauntlet, a device capable of blurring the lines between mortals and gods. He got the very idea from an old comic book, isn't that funny? How much did you tell him about one for all? All Might asked with a glare. Everything, the scarred man chuckled. I told him everything and judging by the state you're in dot 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 he actually did. He did what I failed to do multiple times. He stole one for all, he the villain laughed at that. I don't see what's so funny, the gaunt man said. It's not in your hands so why are you laughing? Because it's all come full circle. All for one joyfully stated, my arrogance led to you being created all might. Then you defeated me and took my throne, he frowned at the memory. But now it's your turn. Your ego led you to create Izuku. And now all that's left for you to do is fade away while our young prince takes his new throne shut up. I didn't come here to argue about who's to blame for what, All Might spat at him. Let me guess, you want to know what he'll do next? All for one correctly deduced the reason for his enemy being here. How should I know? He smirked at him through the glass. All that time Midoriya spent with the League, around you and he never once told you what he plans to do with his gauntlet. Tashinori found that hard to believe. Oh no, he told me what he wanted to achieve, which is the complete reconstruction of this hero society but he never told me how he planned to accomplish this. Would you like to hear my theory? Taking the hero's silence as a yes he continued. If I had to guess, Izuku plans on creating a war between heroes and villains. A war that he will be the deciding factor in. Snickering a bit he went on. Imagine it. The quirkless boy that everyone deemed useless, both sides clamoring to win his allegiance. The only question is which side has what he wants most he would never get away with it. All might interrupt it. The government would never bow down to the whims of teen a genius teen that figured out a way to make impossible things possible. All for one corrected. You should really have more faith in your soon-to-be ruler that won't happen. Kashinori stood up from his seat. I won't allow it. Please don't approach the glass. A voice over the intercom said loudly. And what can you do to stop him? The scarred man laughed. The former symbol of peace, on the last dregs of his now fading power. You probably can't even bring yourself to tear into him like you did to me. The guilt is too much for you I imagine. Knowing you are the one who broke him down in the first place, just to rub more salt into the wound he added. What a world we live in. Heroes creating villains. No wonder Izuku wants to change it. Finally having enough Tashinori turned around and marched out before the time was up on his visit, but not before tossing one last thing at his enemy. Even if he does create a new world, you'll never get to see it. And with those parting words he left him there in his cell. All might. All for one chuckled to himself now that he was alone. My only regret is that I won't be able to see the look on your face when you find out what Izuku's soul stone does. With the sounds of his life support machines as his only company he continued to ponder the coming change to society. Later that night Asuma Kanishi was a skinny pale man in his early twenties. Currently he was waiting for his brother to meet him at the parking garage where fellow criminals and villains met to plan jobs and find recruits. Both Asuma and his brother possessed unique quirks that made them highly desirable for most premeditated robberies. As he looked around he noticed the garage was oddly abandoned which it usually wasn't unless there was a high-ranking hero in the area. Before he could wonder why that was he heard footsteps from behind. He whirled around to see a figure at the other end of the garage walking out of the shadows. Who's there? Asuma called. Stepping into the light he finally recognized who it was. The green messy hair was a dead giveaway. This kid was what everyone was talking about lately after the way he exposed All Might. Also it came to light in the media that he was apotheosis. The very strategist that he worked with on a few bank jobs in the past, back before the kid decided to go pro in his villainy. Oh hey kid, it's been a while. Izuku smiled as he slowly walked towards him. You've been doing pretty well for yourself. Taking that bastard goody two shoes all might down a peg. The boy remained silent as he stopped a few yards away from the criminal. Asuma Kanishi, Izuku finally said. You and your brother possess interesting ocular quirks. He smirked as he remembered the notes he took on them. He had X-ray vision and you have eye stamp, a unique ability that lets you place fully functioning eyeballs on any surface that you can see through. It makes you the perfect lookout. He paused before chuckling and awkwardly rubbing the back of his head. Sorry, I remember people better by what their quirks are okay. Asuma was getting weirded out by this conversation. Something was wrong, he could feel it, but didn't know what. Do you know what a soul is Kanishi-san? Izuku asked as he took a step closer. I can't say that I do. Asuma was wondering when his brother would get here. I did a lot of research and it turns out there are no quirks in the world that affect a human soul, 
Mainly because the soul is not a tangible measurable thing, he stepped even closer. So I decided to delve into some spiritual philosophies about the existence of a soul and one thing I came across was rather interesting. Even closer now. A soul is what each individual person values most. If you desire money, then your soul is wealth. If it's friendship and bonds you crave, then your soul is love. Izuku was just a few steps away from a suma now. In this society where a quirk is the main factor that decides a person's worth, what do you think everyone values most? The uh, MMPH. Izuku's gauntlet-covered hand shot out and grabbed Asuma by the face. A neon purpled vein-like pattern spread across the criminal's face along with the rest of his body. Asuma let out a muffled scream as felt the painful effects of the soul stone. When it was finally over the veins subsided, Izuku let go of the taller man and watched his unconscious body collapse on the floor without care. Not even giving the man a second thought he walked over to a nearby wall, placing his open right palm on the wall. Black sparks and purple veins covered his limb. When Izuku removed his hand, he smiled in satisfaction as he saw a green eye staring back at him in the concrete surface. Testing it out, he had it look around, making sure he could see through it perfectly. Isn't this poetic? He commented to himself as he looked down at the soul stone in the palm of his gauntlet. All for one and one for all. Together at last, he smirked triumphantly. It's like reuniting two brothers who have been fighting for years. Reaching into the pocket of his trench coat he pulled out a piece of paper containing a list of criminals he worked with in the past with quirks he thought had potential uses. Izuku took it a pen from his other pocket and crossed off Asuma's name. It was all-out war between heroes and villains. With All Might's weakness exposed, villains became bolder and bolder every day. Heroes and villains were working overtime to keep up. Not only that, but someone was providing them with information on heroes, particular the ins and outs of their quirks, fighting techniques, how to beat them, weaknesses and detailed strategies. The police had an idea as to who it was that was providing them with these plans. Izuku Midoriya, known for his intelligence, must have been the one. Though they still had no idea what he had to gain by helping villains fight heroes, the main issue was that they had no way of tracking the boy. With the warping ability that his gauntlet gave him, he could be anywhere at any time. It was the same problem with tracking the League of Villains who had Kirajiri in their employ. Speaking of the League, their movements had also become bolder with an ally like Midoriya backing them. Just recently in the past week they had conducted an attack on a pro-hero rally that was started in response to all the anti-hero and All Might protesters. The purpose of the rally was to show support and faith in the hero. It had backfired horribly when the villain Dabai showed up along with a handful of gnomas to attack the crowd. Sadly the only heroes that showed up to the rally were low-ranking heroes looking to improve their public images and were no match for the enhanced artificial monsters. By the time Endeavor leading a few other high-ranking heroes finally arrived to the scene many innocent people were badly injured and Dabai had fled as soon as he spotted the number two hero, leaving them to take out the Nomis. The result was another severe dive in public opinion towards heroes and the amount of protesters had more than doubled. The quirkless minority who were joined with the inferior quirk class had now merged with the ever-increasing group of citizens who had lost faith in heroes. That was a lot of people calling for answers from not just the heroes but the government as well. They were also demanding a change in hero organization while the quirkless demanded equal rights. The quirkless citizens have always been crying out for equal rights. However they never had a voice since no one cared about them and neither did they have a figure to inspire them. That's where Izuku Midoriya came in. His debut with his quirkless state and seemingly limitless power gave these people hope and the idea planted in their head they were not as helpless and weak that the majority of the world mocked them for. Then All Might's quirkless status was revealed by that very team further cementing the fact that quirkless people can be strong too if given the chance. With the number one hero's silence on the matter only making the situation worse, All Might did not want to keep quiet. If anything he would love to explain the situation to the public. Unfortunately that would mean publicly divulging the secret to his overwhelming power. That secret being the one for all quirk. Not only that but he would be forced to tell everyone that power is now in the wrong hands of Izuku Midoriya. The panic that would cause is not something anyone wanted to be responsible for. The Prime Minister's administration was pressured every day, including the Hero Public Safety Commission. Normally All Might the symbol of peace was also the symbol of the government's strength and kept the population in a blissful calm that everything was alright. However that all depended on the hero maintaining his unfaltering image. Now that the truth about the state of the symbol of peace was out, the image was slowly crumbling and with it the government's hold over a population that possessed superpowers. It was at this time when faith in heroes was bleeding out that Izuku Midoriya pressed down on that bloated chest with his mighty hand. C-F-E-C-H-A-U-D what are we doing here? Achako asked. You are enjoying a coffee and bagel. Izuku said as he placed said beverage and food on the table in front of her, before sitting down across from her. I am waiting for something. He glanced down at his watch. Aren't you hungry? Yuraraka wondered as she helped herself. It seemed odd that he brought her here this morning. 
Apparently the green-haired gauntlet wielder wanted to demonstrate the next part of his plan that he was implementing. I ate before I arrived. Izuku looked to his watch again. Here they were in broad daylight, sitting in the outside eating area of the cafe. He was completely unconcerned that people would see him. First of all, what could anybody do to him? They could call for heroes, but he would be long gone before they arrived. Second, that notice me not quirk the soul stone gave him rendered him inconspicuously unnoticeable to the average bystander. Out of the corners of their eyes it would seem like a young brown-haired teenage girl was sitting alone. What are you waiting for? Achako asked as she took a sip of her coffee. It's been a while since she had agreed with his plan to reform the hero society. They had spent that whole night talking about the next part of his plan and what he would do when he took control. Over the next few months they met up to discuss what would happen. Izuku refrained from keeping her out of the loop. That included telling her about his contact with the League of Villains and various other villains. You'll see, Izuku sat back and relaxed as the next part of his plan was about to begin. Achako had surprisingly kept in contact with her friends at UA and interestingly enough Izuku never pressured her for information on the school, further proof that he wasn't using her. He did ask about Shoto and Tenya once. Shoto was spending a lot of time visiting his mother at the hospital she was committed to. It seems his battle with Midoriya had lit a fire within him, in more ways than one. Unlike before where he silently opposed his father, he now did it quite vocally and sometimes physically. Midoriya convinced him that he was superior to Endeavor in every way, and that his destiny was not to surpass All Might or his father, but to be a great hero unlike either of them. Endeavor couldn't do anything to his rebellious son without causing a media scandal. He was able to sweep the incidents like his wife and missing firstborn son under the rug. But Shoto was quite a popular student at UA, having made a striking debut at the sports festival. Plus the icy hot boy lived at the dorms now, so at the moment he couldn't touch him. Tenya kept himself busy with training and his work-study program. He was working with the same agency his brother once worked in. The grief over having a friend expelled from the school was being used to try and better himself so that such a thing wouldn't happen again to anyone else. It seemed he was following Izuku's advice after all. Uraraka's other friends Tsuyu, Momo, and Kirishima would sometimes visit her apartment to see how she was holding up and to talk about what was happening. Izuku always made himself scarce when they came by, warping away as soon as they knocked on the door. No one suspected that the former U.S. student was secretly working with the infamous Apotheus. And here he comes. Izuku smirked looking across the street at a tall man wearing a yellow suit and a green mask hidden in the shadow of his fedora. The big head killer. I heard a rather interesting tip in the underground that he would be committing one of his random acts of violence. Right here at this time at this street corner, he explained. The big head killer was a psychopath in a bright green mask that made his head look abnormally large, hence the name. A madman that liked to murder in public in really elaborate ways like the villains in the old cartoon show. Dropping pianos or anvils on innocent people. Blowing up buildings with ridiculous looking bombs. And Rube Goldberg machines that ended in someone's death. The villain was never caught because of his random pattern and his quirk that allowed him to melt his body into liquid and slither down drains. However he did have friends in the underground. Friends that Izuku persuaded to tell him where the killer would hit next. Remember Uraraka, don't do anything. Just sit there and act like a normal concerned citizen and leave when you're finished eating Izuku said before flash warping away. Hold on to you hats ladies and gentlemen. The big head killer laughed from the center of the crowd making the people panic. He pulled out an enlarged spiked boxing glove on the end of what looked like a rocket launcher. I love the smell of burning coffee and people in the morning. He pointed his weapon at the cafe while the people scrambled away from the lunatic. Suddenly his gun was ripped out of his hands by some invisible force and the crumpled into a ball like it was paper. Okay, that wasn't supposed to happen. The villain was then thrown up into the air, then down, then up over and over again until finally he was slammed rather painfully on the concrete. Oh, the citizen's eyes glanced around wondering where the hero that was doing this was. But to their surprise there wasn't one. Uncle, uncle, uncle. The big head killer was rapidly spinning on the ground against his will. The friction of being grinded against concrete tearing his mask and suit. He was then thrown painfully against the wall of a building rendering him unconscious, while the bricks and metal moved around him to pin his body in place until the authorities arrived. The people were in awe over what transpired, some even recorded it on their phones. They unfortunately didn't know who to thank for stopping the maniac. To them it seemed like it must have done by an unknown citizen. So that's how it starts. Achako mumbled to herself as she watched. She of course was the only one who knew what happened. Izuku used his powers to stop the villain anonymously. This was all part of his plan. Step 1 was give the villains of society an edge. Izuku did this by selling his knowledge of the hero's quirks and abilities to various criminal groups and circles in the underground. With this information the villains were now posing more of threat. That was the part of the plan she didn't like, but also understood that it was necessary. Now the next step had begun. 
giving the people the idea that they didn't need heroes and could defend themselves. You. A one week later the government in response to the uprising of villain activity and vigilante behavior has started funding the Genosis Titan robots. Aizawa read aloud the article given to him by the principal. So they are going ahead with those anti-villain robots? Midnight said. Genosis is trying to make up for the interning a villain and accidentally giving him resources to complete his weapon? Nezu explained. So we should start expecting a bunch of walking bucket heads roaming the streets on patrol. Snipe commented. Yes, but you have to admit it's a smart move and with these robot reinforcements it should help restore faith in heroes and help the government regain control. Nezu applauded Genosis and the government for this strategic move. I thought this meeting was to discuss what's to be done about the growing protesters outside the school. Aizawa complained. The students are having trouble leaving the grounds and I'm starting to get fed up. Well we sent Cementos out there to peacefully ask them to disperse, Nezu said hopping his colleague could placate them. Outside please disperse. We understand that you have a right to protest. But you are obstructing the students from entering and exiting the academy. Cementos said standing between the protesters and the school's main entrance. While many shouted and argued, in the back of the crowd a figure dressed in a baggy hooded coat with his hands in his pockets watched with amusement. They sent Cementos out. He smirked as he removed his left hand from the pocket revealing the golden gauntlet that he was hiding. You're making this too easy you eh? The red reality stone glowed brightly, unnoticed by anyone. As they protesters continued to yell at the teacher suddenly pillars of concrete shot out of the ground between them. The people panicked and scattered at the display of force coming from the U.S. staff. Everyone was surprised by the threat of violence and the media would be sure to eat it up. Cementos was shocked. He didn't know what just happened, but he definitely did not activate his quirk. He would never use it towards innocent civilians, protesters or not. Izuku just smirked before walking away nonchalantly. His imitation of the teacher's quirk would only incite more outrage. Not just at Yue, but heroes in general, which is just what he wanted. He pushed all the right buttons and now was the time to reap the rewards. Prime Minister's Office Akira Toriyama, the current Prime Minister of Japan, was heading back to his office. He had just finished a meeting with his defense committee and a representative of Genosis Tech. The Titan robots were reviewed, approved and orders were given to begin mass production of them. Within a week the country would have its first legion of mechanical law enforcers. Hopefully that will help decrease the rising villain attacks. It wasn't just villain attacks that were on the rise. Due to several instances where random unknown civilians were starting to fight back against villains when the heroes were not around to save them and in some cases while heroes were around. Just when things couldn't get worse now the population was beginning to think that the laws on quirk usage didn't apply to them anymore and were starting to act on it. If this continued, if faith and assurance in heroes wasn't restored then the government could have a revolution on their hands. When he walked into his main office he noticed the lights were turned off which was odd. The Kira also noticed that his aides were not around. Ignoring the bad feeling in his gut he walked inside. Good evening Prime Minister Toriyama, a voice said in the darkness as the door locked behind him. The lights quickly switched on revealing someone sitting in his chair. As it spun around he finally got a good look at who it was. Izuku Midoriya, the current most wanted person in the country. Don't bother calling for help, the boy said as fear surged through the minister. Or I'll bring this entire building down before you can even finish your sentence what do you want? Toriyama sweated as he stayed rooted to the middle of his office. I'd like you to join me for a little meeting. He opened portal right next to the minister. I promise no harm will come to you. I just want you to hear me out where are you taking me? The prime minister questioned while staring at the open portal nervously. It would be better for you not to know. Izuku gestured towards the warp gate. After you, the minister swallowed his anxiety. The teen knew that he would go along. Toriyama was known for buckling under pressure. The only reason he kept office was because how compliant the citizens once were. Everyone cared more about heroes than they did politics anymore. Hesitantly the man stepped through the portal entering what looked like some sort of warehouse. Prime Minister Toriyama, a middle-aged woman greeted. So he got you to President Takahashi. There sat at a long metal table the president of the Hero Public Safety Commission, Kiko Takahashi. The little brat broke into my office and told me to come with him or he'd demolish my entire department building with everyone in it with snap of his fingers, she grimaced. Naturally I had to go along that's right. Izuku gestured to the only other chair at the table and the prime minister slowly and cautiously made his way to the seat. Now I'm sure you're both wondering why you're here, seeing that they remain silent he explained. You're both here because you too. The prime minister of Japan and the president of the Hero Public Safety Commission are the highest authorities in our wonderful nation. You two are the only ones who can give heroes direct orders that they have to follow as long as it doesn't endanger civilian lives. Isn't that right? What do you want? Miss Takahashi, being the bolder of the two politicians asked. Izuku merely grinned and waved his hand. 
From another table several files were lifted into the air and dropped in front of the Prime Minister and President. I just want you two to listen to my proposition. He moved to stand on the other side of the table from them. Then you're both free to go. I promise to put your back where I took you two from, unharmed and in one piece. After a long anxious silent Toriyama finally spoke after wiping the sweat from his brow. All right, let's hear it then elsewhere again mom. I'm fine, Achako told her mother through the phone. I got a part-time job at a hero agency. They're going to sponsor when I apply to another hero school. She frowned having to lie to her parents like this, but it was necessary. Izuku told her that it was easier to lie than have to explain what was really going on and make them understand. Love you too, bye they would understand eventually. Izuku assured her that everyone even her friends at Yule would come to understand that everything happening was necessary. This hero society was horribly flawed. If psychopaths like Bakugu were allowed to get away with everything, just because they had stronger quirks while people like Izuku and herself who only wanted to do the right thing were discarded, it wasn't right that people like that got everything they wanted. The world shouldn't be that way and with Izuku's plan coming together, it wouldn't be like that for long. Abandon warehouse you're insane. The president of the Hero Public Safety Commission said, Am I? Izuku questioned. Because I want to run the hero system better than you two possibly could, so I must be crazy. What makes you think the hero system is flawed and broken? The Prime Minister asked. Oh, so you haven't told him? Izuku smirked looking to Miss Takahashi. Told me what? Toriyama looked to her as well. That's enough, she argued in a poor attempt to change the subject. We're not here to discuss me that's where you're wrong President Takahashi. The green-haired boy chuckled. This has everything to do with you and your cover-ups. He grabbed another series of files from the table and tossed it in front of the Prime Minister. What she's attempting to hide Minister Toriyama is the multiple failures by heroes as well as the kind of people some of these heroes really are. This is the stuff that the media doesn't report on. He grabbed another file this one containing secret information on Endeavor and handed it to him. Read the part about his wife and firstborn son my god. Akira gasped as he read through what that man did to his own family. And he's the number two hero. Why was this kept from me and out of the public? You have to understand, the president of the H. P. S. C. began. Public faith in heroes is vital to our system. If we lose that, then you lose complete control, Izuku finished for her. Which is what is happening right now because of you. She argued pointing her finger at him. You're the one making everything we built fall apart. I like how you just blatantly admitted to fostering this flawed system, Izuku fired back. All I did was show the world where the cracks in your pathetic foundation are. You're the one who allowed those cracks to stay and grow. He stood up from his seat making the two of them tense for a moment. Let me ask you something. What was your plan for when All Might eventually retired? They both just stared at him blankly. He's but a mere mortal man. He can't be a hero forever. What were you going to do when your symbol of peace's time ends? Better yet what would have happened if he died fighting all for one? The Prime Minister didn't even have an answer to that. They had gotten so used to All Might always being this unbeatable deterrent against villains that they had never considered a future without him. No matter how you look at it the time of All Might reigning supreme is over. This country is going to need something new to keep the balance and peace. I'm offering an easy solution to it what makes you think we need or want your help. President Takahashi continued to reject him. I'll have you know we have a plan to bring about order and are on the verge of implementing it you mean the Titan robots. Izuku suddenly said surprising them. Did Genosis not tell you? Makes sense. They are probably trying to distance themselves from me as much as possible after what I did. Seeing the confusion he showed them another file. This one being the online article from the expo some time ago. I was the one who designed those robots. I even had a large hand in their programming. The two gasped when they realized the implications of what he could do. That's right. Your new ace in the hole. I know all the ins and outs of. I could simply tell the villains how to beat them. Or I could even tell the villains how to reprogram them. Izuku smirked at the two politicians. Imagine it. The robots come to help the heroes save the day. Only for the titans to suddenly turn on their superiors. You and Genosis would have a lot of egg on your face wouldn't you? He kept talking while they were sweating bullets now. It might even be the spark that triggers a full-scale rebellion. Now the heroes are fighting vigilantes, civilians, robots and villains in five-way war. Then boom end of society as we know it and it would be your doing, Miss Takahashi said accusingly. Is that what you want? Total collapse of our society. Please, I keep telling you I want to fix society not destroy it, Izuku explained. Yes I shook the walls a bit, but that was just to prove my point about how flawed it really is and it worked. People are starting to see heroes in a different light. They're no longer these infallible gods that enforce laws and peace. We need to do something about it soon by giving you what you want. Takahashi sped. Listen here President Takahashi. Izuku leaned towards her over the table. I'll get what I want one way or another. The only reason this offer is even on the table is because I want to try a peaceful solution first with the least amount of violence and bloodshed. He leaned back and held his arms out. 
By all means, say no, refuse my offer. It won't matter in the end. I'll just side with the villains and together we'll win this war. I'll rebuild society from scratch and you two will go down in history as minor nuisances that tried to hinder me and failed. After a scary moment of silence the Prime Minister finally spoke. What would you do? He asked. If we give you what you're asking for, what would you do next? Prime Minister, Takahashi exclaimed. You're not seriously considering giving in to this monster. That's enough. We agreed to hear him out didn't we? The Prime Minister reminded her. Indeed you did, Izuku spoke. Now then, let me share with you dot 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 my vision one week later T-O-D-O-R-O-K-I household I'm leaving now Fayumi. Endeavor's loud voice boomed. Where are you going? The only girl of the siblings asked. The Prime Minister and the Public Safety Commission asked me to attend an announcement. The hero grumbled. Some big new change in hero policy. At least they thought of him and not all might. That's one small victory over that man. Where's Shoto? He left. Fayumi glanced away from her father. Endeavor frowned disapprovingly. His masterpiece was acting even worse lately. It was one thing to silently hate him. At least the boy was improving his abilities. But now Shoto was actively defying. He even went so far as to threaten his own father. A few weeks ago he told his son to go back to training and to cut back on visiting his mother in the hospital. Shoto's response was a promise to give his father a scar that matched his own. If he ever tried to keep his mother away from him again, the boy even refused training. Why do I need training from someone so pathetic that he settled for second place and pushed his ambitions onto others? Those were Shoto's exact words on the matter. Then he strolled away from his father without a second glance. Endeavor had never wanted to strike his son more than ever after that sentence left his mouth. That unruly boy should count himself lucky that he lives at UA. Endeavor quietly fumed as he headed outside where his escort was waiting. Getting into the long black car he headed to the Senate building where the announcement from the Prime Minister is to take place in two hours. During the drive he allowed himself to think back on the big reveal concerning All Might a while back. When had first seen the hero's true form on television as well as Apotheosis' words about how he was actually quirkless, at first he didn't believe it. Then he got angry. All these years he was competing against a quirkless man and lost to him over and over again. After his rage simmered down he started thinking about it rationalized and then delighted in the revelation. It meant that All Might's power was finite. It meant that he was beatable. For once the future looked clear. All Might Kenan will be surpassed and his own son will be the one to do it. Genosis production factory alarms were blaring. The staff was in a panic. Out of nowhere the hundreds of new Titan models that were ready for transportation suddenly activated. The programmers tried to regain control, but the Nexus field, an invisible Wi-Fi network that connected them to the robots through various satellites wasn't responding to them. It was like the Titans were ignoring their orders no matter what coded commands they typed into the computers that ran their eye what do we do. One of them shouted from the control room. We can't let them leave, but the armored shutters won't hold for long. The emergency fail-safe protocol. Another Genosis programmer suddenly remembered. It was supposed to be used in situations like this. An unstoppable command protocol that would shut down all robots in case of a hack. It was suggested by some intern surprisingly enough. Back when the Titan was still in the prototype phases. That's right. They quickly began typing into the keyboard, accessing and using that very protocol. Wait. One of the engineers quickly remembered something very important. Wait. All of the sudden all their computer's screens went black. A loud slam noise was heard outside signaling the armored shutters being automatically open. I was trying to tell you dot 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 the one who designed the emergency fail-safe protocol dot 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 was Izuku Midoriya. They all paled. The villain that the company brought in as an intern without knowing. The very villain that used their resources to create a device that gave him supreme power. Right on cue an image appeared on their monitors. A skull and crossbones that had green fluffy hair and freckles. The image laughed an emotionless robotic laugh that unnerved the men in the control room. Oh dear god, the anti-villain robots were loose and under his control now. They couldn't even call to warn anyone as their phones had been cut off by the encrypted virus that they accidentally ran through the systems. No one would know about the Titans until it was too late. Japanese Senate building two hours later good afternoon everyone. Prime Minister Toriyama stood at the podium with the president of the H. P. Eh. C standing next to him looking nervous and apprehensive. I thank you all for coming here he said into the microphone. Even he looked a bit anxious. As you know our country is in the midst of a crisis. Villains are running wild. Civilians are losing faith in heroes. And vigilante activity is on the rise. He didn't have to look at the crowd to see the look of silent agreement on their faces. Myself and my administration have identified the source of these problems. The man briefly scowled at the number two hero in the crowd remembering all the information that was kept from him on the hothead. 
The problem is we've become too compliant on the behaviors and faults of our heroes. We've become so dependent on All Might that we've let our standards for heroes slowly decline over the years. Endeavor looked around the outdoor conference. That fact that they were having this outside was odd. They usually have these inside the Senate building not outside in front of it. Another thing he noticed was that he was the only hero invited to this announcement. He stood off to the side of the large crowd of officials, reporters and journalists. That ends today. With the help of the Senate we've decided to establish a new department that will review, manage and in some cases suspend hero activity in our country. The Prime Minister paused to let that sink in. Murmurs spread throughout the crowd. This department of hero regulation will have power and authority equal to and to a certain extent greater than the Hero Public Safety Commission. The president of the commission flinched a bit when he said that. It is our hope that we can bring about a new golden age, with heroes truly worthy of that title. The crowd sounded pleased to hear this. It seems they were all in support of this idea. It was then that Prime Minister Toriyama swallowed nervously. Now as for who will be the director of this new program, it is someone that may come as a bit of shock to you. But I assure everyone that he is fully qualified and ready to take this position. Endeavor allowed himself a small smirk, believing that they were referring to him. Why else would they invite him to this time-wasting announcement? May I present to you all. The Prime Minister waited for them all to become completely silent. The first director of the new hero regulation department, Endeavor stood up. Izuku Midoriya. A portal suddenly opened behind the man and out walked the green-haired teen dressed in an immaculate grey suit, tied to match his hair, and a specifically tailored left sleeve that revealed his infinity gauntlet for everyone to see. The publicly known villain walked up to the podium while the Prime Minister stepped aside. Thank you for that introduction Prime Minister Toriyama. Izuku smiled as he lowered the podium a few inches with his powers. The crowd erupted into roars and shouts. They knew who Midoriya was after. Everyone knew Midoriya. After all he was the one to expose All Might's weakness to the world. The infamous villain with the golden gauntlet as they called him. Also known as Apotheoses by the police and heroes. That's enough. The Prime Minister grabbed one of the mics from the podium. Everyone calm down and let me explain. The crowd slowly regained control of their volume and calmed themselves. Now I know this is shocking but Midoriya here has proven himself and his intentions to me. He truly wishes to dedicate himself to improving the hero system, he argued to the public. For those reasons along with his immense intellect and great power I've granted him a full pardon for his crimes along with political immunity. And I thank you for giving me amnesty, Izuku smirked again. I promise you won't regret this. He was cut off from speaking any further when a ball of fire was hurled at him. Luckily he reacted in time and opened a portal to send it somewhere else. How rude. What the kind of farce is this? Endeavor yelled as he stomped through the crowd. We had no choice, Toriyama defended. This was the best option to end the chaos by letting a villain run your new department. Endeavor argued back. Does the Senate know you did this? It doesn't matter if they know or not. The Prime Minister glared at the hero. While I needed their approval to create this department I can hire whoever I want to run it you know attacking your new manager is grounds for disciplinary actions, Izuku said with condescension. If you don't back down then I will have to exercise my full authority. You're a villain, the worst kind. Endeavor spat. You don't have any authority. The boy just smirked wider. The entire crowd quickly started backing away leaving a large open space between the hero and the stage. Even the prime minister and the other government officials backed away to stand behind their security detail. Toriyama frowned seeing where this was going. Flashback so we have an agreement then. Izuku smiled as he shook the prime minister's hand. I can't believe you're going along with this. President Takahashi glared at him, but she no longer had a say in the matter. She hated to admit it, but Midoriya had them boxed into the point where they had no other option than to give in to his demands. At the very least they would be able to closely watch his actions from here on out. We have no choice. It's either this or all-out war that will end with our side losing everything and his gaining it all, Toriyama sighed in displeasure. He didn't like this either, but maybe this boy would do some good. His ideas seemed like they could work. They'll just have to wait and see how he implemented them and hope nothing terrible came from this alliance. So when do you plan on making the announcement? Izuku asked. Give me a week to run it by the Senate first. The Prime Minister promised him. If it comes down to it I can make it an executive order if they don't comply. But I have a feeling they will excellent. He walked around the table. Oh and one more thing. Just to make sure I can trust you I want you to invite a specific hero to the announcement. And make sure it's outdoors who. This Takahashi wondered why he would want a hero to attend such a thing. I want Endeavor to be there alone. With other hero present. The gauntlet user wanted that man to be present for multiple reason. What are you going to do to him? The Prime Minister asked with trepidation. Absolutely nothing, Izuku vowed. If he does nothing that is. Though if he does try something, then I want to publicly make an example out of him. I won't kill him don't worry. Just think of this as a test for Endeavor. He smiled a bit deviously. A test to see if a great hero can accept change for the better of society. 
He knew he wouldn't, but Izuku didn't tell them that. Flashback and since All Might is too soft I'll do what he failed to do and bring you down. Endeavor declared loudly. Very well. Izuku closed his eyes and sighed with disappointment while secretly elated on the inside. You brought this on yourself. Endeavor was about to charge forward and burn the arrogant little bastard when he felt a large metallic hand grab his shoulder. He barely had time to turn his head when he was socked hard in the face by a metal fist. The flaming hero was sent flying for a moment, blood dripping from his face. What the hell? Endeavor didn't have to wonder what hit him for long as there stood a big red slim built robot. Not just one but three identical ones stood there facing him making low metallic growling noise. Ladies and gentlemen my eye present to you. Izuku began with a gleeful smile on his face. The new and improved, mass produced and ready for battle titans. He successfully broke into Genosis's computers several hours ago and completely reprogrammed their eye to follow his orders and his orders only. It was easy since he placed a bunch of back doors, hidden in the files, back when he worked as an intern for them. Izuku also knew that the robots were too good to not continue making. Hence why he designed them for the company. He waited until the factory had a finished fully working legion ready to go, ran his user patient program and now he had a robotic army at his command. I think a demonstration is in order. Izuku glared down at Endeavor from his position on the stage. Boys dot 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 take him down. The robots responded with another growl as confirmation and began to stalk towards the hero. Do you really believe a few tin cans can match up to me? The flame user taunted arrogantly. He then blasted the three titans with a torrent of fire. Luckily all those who attended this event had retreated to a safe distance. Thinking that would be enough he turned to face Midoriya again only to freeze when the machines walked out of the fire undamaged. I probably should have mentioned, Izuku chuckled. Genosis was never able to produce a titan that possessed every feature that I designed. So to make up for this they created various models for various different scenarios and enemies. He gently leaned forward over his podium. These are the fireproof models, designed specifically to defeat fire quirk users. The robots were making their way closer to their target. You could say these titans were made to beat you endeavor that's not possible. The hero was silenced when he was forced to dodge the first titan that tried to make a swipe at him. These things were pretty fast. He was so distracted by one that he forgot about the other two. The second titan flanked him from the left and attempted to punch him in the face again. This time Endeavor blocked with both arms to minimize the damage. That proved to be a mistake as the third titan delivered a devastating punch to his stomach that had him hacking up his lunch. Using his flames he launched himself, trying to get some distance and figure out his next move, but the robots just kept coming. Wonderful aren't they? Izuku gloated. They don't hesitate. They don't second guess their next move. They simply move to follow orders and won't stop until I tell them to. He was really enjoying this. It couldn't have worked out any better for him. The best part was that this was all legal. With his new position, Endeavor was the one breaking the law by publicly attacking and threatening a government superior. You might want to get a close-up on this, he said to the only cameraman left on the corner of the stage who was filming this all live. Meanwhile you, a staff lounge the secrets of my quirk are too dangerous to be revealed to the world. All Might was busy going over his speech cards. He had planned to make a public announcement soon, to help settle some of tension towards him caused by the secrets Midoriya revealed some time ago. Nezu suggested it, telling him that his silence was only making the situation between civilian and hero relations more problematic. He planned to rectify some of things that boy said and explain the situation and his need for secrecy for the good of society. Hey, Aizawa barged into the room with the principal latched onto his shoulder. Answer your damn phone. The normally stoic hero was frantic, which was highly out of character for him. I turned it off. I'm a bit busy at the moment. The skeletal man frowned at his fellow teacher's aura of urgency. Turn on the TV. Nezu shouted while hopping from the dark-haired man to grab the remote to the large screen television set up on the wall across from them. There's something big happening that you need to see. The screen flipped on as the small white creature turned to a random news channel. It didn't matter which as this announcement was going out live on all news channels. What's this about? Tashinori asked. Look, Aizawa pointed at the screen. There was Midori addressed in a nice suit on a stage in front of the Senate building. What the? Tashinori's sunken eyes widened to a nearly impossible size. The Prime Minister has established a new department of heroics, Nezu explained. Guess who he put in charge of it this doesn't make any sense. Tashinori shouted. How could this happen? Why would the Prime Minister just hand something like this to him on a silver platter? It makes perfect sense, the principal said. Based off what Midoriya has said, this is exactly what he wants. A position of power and authority in the hero system. This is bad, Aizawa commented. They watched as Endeavor stood up to Midoriya and even attempted to attack him only to be punched in the face by a big familiar robot. Seeing this All Might buffed himself up with great difficulty as he had already used up most of his time training students today. What do you think you're doing? 
Nezu asked. At top speed I can get there in 15 minutes. He was about to leap through the window when a razor head stopped him by erasing his quirk. And what good will that do? Aizawa questioned. You know what he's capable of and you see the position he's in. Going there will only play into Midoriya's hand do you expect me to just sit here while this happens? Tashinori pointed to the screen where Endeavor was fighting a group of machines. Yes, Aizawa didn't like it either. Attacking a government authority figure is a serious offense exactly. Nezu looked concerned as well. It seems Midoriya has positioned himself perfectly. No hero can make a move against him now back at the Senate building damn it. Endeavor still tried to use his flames even though it was useless against these titans. They soon surrounded the hero, launching himself in the air he thought that would give him the advantage, until one of the robots fired a tether that wrapped around his leg and yanked him back down to the ground. He tried to use momentum and gravity to his advantage, by crashing his fist into one of machine's head, but its reaction timing was too good. It grabbed his arm with both hands and twisted, snapping the hero's bones. G.A.H. Endeavor roared in pain as his arm was broken. He was then thrown to the feet of the other two titans who proceeded to rain blows down on the man. People of Japan. Izuku began as the hero was repeatedly beaten by his robots. Do you see this? This is the second greatest hero, directly under all might. He spoke into the microphone. A hero who only cares about himself. A hero who torments his own family for his own ambitions. A hero who thinks of his job as nothing more than a competition that he needs to be the best at. The green-haired teen continued as said hero was pummeled before him. Your great all might is just a frail man who lies to the world and endeavor is a man who callously tore apart his own family just to be the best. He then held his hands out. Are these your heroes? He looked towards the camera, asking everyone in the world what they thought of these two once great men. All right boys then enough. He commanded the robots to stop and they did. Endeavor was barely conscious laying in a bloody heap on the ground. Not a single security officer, journalist, or official stepped in to help him. Everyone, even the prime minister just stood there and watched. Bring him to me. Izuku watched the titans grab Endeavor and drag his beaten bruised body up to the stage. When he reprogrammed the robots and sent this particular set of models to this location he made sure to upload them with all the data he collected on the flame user. His quirk, moves, techniques and fighting style. The man didn't stand a chance against Midoriya's intellect. Kneeling please, he ordered and without hesitation the titans forced Endeavor to his knees while keeping his arms locked behind him. You, little bastard, Endeavor hissed as his vision stopped blurring. For attacking a government official, as well as your atrocious behavior and deplorable treatment of your family I'm removing you from the hero system, Izuku smirked down at him. You won't get away with this, the flame wielder growled. The boy leaned in close and whispered so no one but the two of them would hear this. I already have. Izuku stepped back and held out his gauntlet-covered hand. Consider yourself. Fired. He chuckled at his pun as the soul stone glowed in the palm of his hand. Izuku then grabbed Endeavor by the face with a satisfied smile as neon purple veins spread across the hero's head and then the rest of his body. Endeavor screamed and thrashed in pain as the stone did its job. A few moments later it was over and the veins retreated. Izuku removed his gauntlet watching the flames that masked the hero's face and shrouded his body permanently fizzled out. He waved the robots off to take the unconscious former hero away. Civilians, officers, heroes and villains. Izuku looked towards the camera again. This is the beginning of a new era he gave a smile to the camera, a warm welcoming one this time. This one was directed towards All Might, who he knew had to be watching this. His smile conveyed a message to the number one hero. A simple message. Only two simple words. I win. I'm actually kind of surprised over the population's opinion on this, Achako said while going through the information on her phone. She was dressed nice while sitting next to Izuku in the back of a limousine. A large majority seems to be accepting of you or at least open to the idea of you and your new position while the others are completely against and I'd say it's about 50-50. The quirkless minority are definitely on my side. But the rest are only warming up to me due to their loss in faith towards heroes and all might. Izuku leaned on one arm as he stared out the window of the moving car. They'll understand soon enough. Taking Endeavor's quirk was just the beginning. Now the flawed corrupt heroes will know that the consequences are real and very severe. Soon we will be able to give the people the heroes they need and deserve what happens after that. Achako asked him. Well eventually I plan on having my new department absorb the Hero Public Safety Commission. Izuku explained. Then in three or four decades I'll become Prime Minister of Japan and have complete and total control over the society. And be able to implement whatever laws I want. This just seems so surreal. Achako smiled. Now you know how I felt when I first put the gauntlet on. He smiled back at her then looked down at his device. Anything I desire I can make a reality. The funny thing is if I decided to be an evil villain this whole country would be in ruins by now you would never do that though. The brown-haired girl corrected. Of course not, Izuku said without hesitation. I have no wish to hurt innocent people. The car turned into a familiar neighborhood. 
though that didn't stop me from having to hurt the most important person to me. He sighed sadly as the limousine stopped at an apartment building. Izuku stayed put in his seat while he worked up the courage to do this. Are you going or not? She asked. It's funny I haven't felt fear since before the gauntlet. Izuku chuckled dryly. Yet here I am, scared of meeting one person. Finding his resolve he opened the door and stepped out of the car. Walking up the stairs he made his way to a door that he knew by heart. Izuku stopped in front of it then worked up the nerve to knock on the door with his gauntlet-covered hand. A moment later he heard the deadbolt unlock and the door slowly opened revealing an older woman with features close to his own. Hi mom, Izuku smiled warmly at the sight of his mother. What would she say to him? Would she be angry? Would she scream at him? Izuku, the woman immediately grabbed him in a hug. I guess I have some explaining to do. Izuku hugged her back while she sobbed into his shoulder. Don't I? You a faculty meeting how is this my fault? Kashinori shouted over the rest of the teachers. If you just gave quirkless people a shred of respect and dignity then we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. Aizawa yelled back at him. But no you let your power and position go to your head and became just like the rest of the arrogant egotistical bastards who look down on those who are weaker. The razor head was furious. Part of him could understand a bit of what Midoriya went through. His own quirk was very impractical and people used to belittle and look down on him for it. He knew exactly how it felt on the bottom. All the rage, the despair, and the pain that came with it. Izuku though was smart enough to actually take his pain and channel it into ambition. And look what it did for him. Choosing who's weak, who's strong, who can be a hero, who is worthy to pass one for all to. Like some sort of god among men. In what way does that make you different than all for one? The gaunt man's eyes widened in shock and anger that his colleague would dare compare him to his worst enemy and greatest villain of all time in any way. That's enough Aizawa, Nezu shouted, stopping them before the argument got too far. Though judging by the look on Tashinori's face it seems that line was already crossed. I'm no different though, Aizawa sighed before looking away. I've expelled and transferred students that I judged as unworthy of being heroes. However I at least gave them a chance first. And with that he stormed out of the meeting having said what he needed to say. Well that was something. Midnight slowly fanned herself with her hand. She had never seen Shouta get so emotional in all the years she's known him and it honestly got her a little hot and bothered. I think we should be focusing on what Midoriya is planning to do next. Snipe chimed in reminding everyone what they were originally arguing about. We tried that, Vlad King scoffed. Everyone tried that and he still stayed ahead of us. What makes you think we can figure out what goes on in that twisted little head of his? I hate to say it but he's right. Nezu said, Midoriya has positioned himself perfectly. As a government department director, no hero or law officer can touch him. While they were sitting here bickering Midoriya was already scheming and making move after move to cement his new power and authority. You seem nervous sir. Cementos noticed the trembling pause. Indeed I am. Nezu frowned. In all the years of heroism, not a single villain has ever infiltrated our government. The white animal looked around at his fellow educators. They certainly tried, but were always immediately rooted out before they got too far. Izuku Midoriya is the first to accomplish this there's an upside to this though isn't there? Toshinori asked. Yes with his position he'll be under close watch and scrutiny. The principal explained. If he's caught doing anything illegal it would be grounds for getting him removed and indeed arrested yeah but how do you about arresting someone who possesses an infinity gauntlet? Snipe wondered. The kid took down Endeavor three days ago and no one's seen him since, Vlad King reminded everyone. Not only was the hero missing, his agency was shut down and the media was spreading some rather concerning and damning things about him. Midoriya was obviously behind it, and every hero in the country was either too shocked or too scared to speak out against his actions. He's vastly more dangerous than we originally thought. He's right. Tashinori actually shook when he remembered what he saw on the news three days ago. The way he touched the number two hero's head, and the effect it had on him. He'd seen this act only once before from another villain the most dangerous villain to ever exist. From his point of view Izuku took Endeavor's quirk, crystallized replications of quirks harvested from DNA. Those were the words Midori used. Not only that, but all for one helped the boy and gave him all the information he needed on one for all. He must have given Midori a sample of his own DNA so he could replicate that man's despicable quirk. That's why all for one was so smug sitting in his prison cell. He knew that Izuku was in possession of both their quirks. He still needed to confirm it, but he was positive that's what happened. He shuddered at the knowledge. Izuku Midoriya now wielded all for one and one for all together. For the first time in his life Tashinori had no idea what to do. He was supposed to be the number one hero and yet he couldn't find a solution to stop Midoriya. The boy was just too powerful now and worse it was all Tashinori's fault. Aizawa was right about him. He didn't even know Izuku yet he assumed he was powerless to not only protect himself but protect others. To be fair, there had never been a quirkless hero before. But he knew now that Izuku had the brains and determination to do it. Perhaps I was arrogant and egotistical Tashinori thought ruefully. 
Am I D-O-R-I-Y-A home? I know what I'm doing and what I did do seems extreme, but it's all necessary. Izuku explained to his mother while they sat across from each other at the kitchen table. He had just finished going over when he came up with the idea for the gauntlet. The ten months spent helping criminals in the underground. His time with the League of Villains. His plan to get into the government and all the events leading up to this moment. He told her everything. Well almost everything. Izuku had left out the part where he helped the hero killer bop off a few heroes. He may not have actually dealt the killing blows. But he'd rather not make his mom cry again. I get that sweetie, but why does it have to be you? Inko asked. Because no one else will do it, Izuku said sadly. Everyone is content to live in this corrupt world. There are people who thinks it's unfair, but they're not willing to do anything about it. He was referring to the quirkless people like himself, but it wasn't their fault that they've been convinced that they are powerless. The only other person who also sees what's wrong with society and wants to change it is a serial killer. Can you imagine a psychopath wielding the Infinity Gauntlet? It would be a disaster, he at least had some morals. Unlike most villains he had no desire to kill those he hated. In truth he was the best person to change the hero-based society. But couldn't you have been a hero with this invention of yours? His mother asked the question that many wanted to know. Izuku actually chuckled lightly at that. You know mom, that was what I originally wanted to do. He smiled fondly, remembering his old naive hero-obsessed self. I was planning to use the Infinity Gauntlet to become a hero, partly out of spite against All Might and Bakugu. But then, he paused with a sigh. I started to see and learn things. I worked with various criminals in the underground and learned a lot about the world and heroes. And Ko gasped hearing her son again confess to actually working with such bad people. I found out how corrupt the heroes truly are and when I was hired by the League of Villains I learned how deep All Might's lies run. Izuku looked at his mother. How could I be a part of such a terrible system? So I figured why not change it? Bring all the corruption to light and make a better world Izuku and Ko began. But he continued. I'm not asking you to forgive or support me mom. I just want you to understand, he waited for her response. Izuku dot 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 you know I love you, very much, and Ko wiped her eyes as they started to water. I really don't like all this destruction and antagonizing the heroes, but if this is what you wish to do dot 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 then I'll support you in any way that I can. Izuku smiled and gently took her hand. You don't have to. I have everything I need for what comes next in my plan, but thank you. Just you saying that is enough for me. There was a knock at the front door and Izuku went to go get it. On that note I have a gift for you mom. He swung the door open revealing Achako standing next to a tall black titan robot. Um um, hi. The brown haired girl shyly greeted the woman. I'm Achako Uraraka. I'm a friend of Izuku's and I work with him she's the first member of my new department. Izuku clarified. And this, he gestured to the robot standing silently, is a titan that I modified just for you. I reprogrammed and added a few extra features. Izuku explained gesturing for the robot to come inside. The machine did so, bending forward to make its way through the door. Oh my. And Ko backed away from the big scary looking metal man. Like everyone else she too had seen what these things did to Endeavor three days ago. It's alright, Izuku promised. It's perfectly safe I promise. The titan stepped closer to the woman, got down on one knee and bowed towards her. He's programmed to protect you and follow any order you give him why are you giving me this? And Ko wondered why she would need such a thing in her home. I'm not going to sugarcoat this mom. Izuku went from smiling fondly to a serious expression. There's going to be a lot of people coming after me. Not just villains, but heroes and maybe even police. Very soon will they realize how fruitless that will be. He looked down at his gauntlet. When that happens they'll come after you to hurt me. It was harsh, but it was the honest truth. He wouldn't put it past villains to stoop that low, it was what they did best. However the corrupt heroes of society would also do the same when pushed to desperation. He'd rather cover that base right now as he still cared very deeply for his mother. This titan is equipped with a scanner that detects quirks up to a specific radius and will let me know of any serious threat that approaches this neighborhood. At first certain government officials and police heads tried to give him a hassle for using an expensive machine for a personal matter, but he quickly shut them up by pointing out their own hypocrisy. He told them that he was using a robot that was designed and built to protect civilians to protect a civilian. If they had a problem with that then Izuku subtly threatened to let the people know that their so-called law enforcement and government had no interest in protecting their lives from danger or at the very least let one robot protect the only remaining family member of a government director. What they and his mother won't know is that he was going to have at least five more titans constantly patrolling the surrounding area. That's sweet of him. Achako smiled seeing that he genuinely cared for his mom and went this far to ensure her safety. He even promised to do the same for her parents when they eventually make her employment in his department public. I don't know what to say. Inko looked from her son to the robot still bowing in her hallway. You don't have to say anything. Izuku smiled again. Consider this part of my apology thank you Izuku. She hugged her son again. He was surprised with how accepting she was of this situation. 
He guessed that having her son back was enough for her. Dorms, Katsuki stared at the image on the computer screen again. The pictures of Deku from three days ago during the Prime Minister's announcement. Everything seemed to be looking up for that nerd. He remembered watching the news and almost choking on his drink during the announcement. How could the government be so weak that it would give a villain shit like Deku a position of power? Akakan you're looking rather low today, Izuku whispered behind him. Almost like someone knocked you off your high horse, Katsuki whipped around to see Deku sitting there on his bed. I'm surprised you haven't killed yourself yet, since that seems to be your solution for people when they are at their lowest shut up. Bakugu snarled at him. This image of Deku wasn't even real, he had already figured that out yet it still wouldn't go away. Was he losing it? How does it feel to be a failure Kaken? Does it hurt? Does it sting? Izuku smirked at him. If only you acted like a hero instead of a villain towards me and everyone around you then maybe this wouldn't have happened. Katsuki slammed his head on his desk, willing this hallucination to go away. Always remember Kaken dot 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 you are the real monster not me, Deku whispered in his ear before fading away. Bakugu desperately wanted this voice in his head to go away. He figured the only way to make it stop would be to stop the real Deku. However that was easier said than done. The bastard's gauntlet made him nearly invincible and being a government-hired director made him untouchable. It seemed taking down Izuku was impossible. Hideout Shigaraki sat in an abused armchair, repeatedly clawing at the leather arm as he watched the television screen. Every single news channel was talking about that brat. Izuku Midoriya, the former villain apotheosis. The way the media used the words former villain irritated him, as if the kid wasn't still a villain at heart. Though what Shigaraki found truly infuriating was how Izuku became so popular in such a short amount of time. Izuku fought all might, but so did he. Where was his recognition? Why wasn't the media talking about the League of Villains anymore? Was he so easily outshined by the brat? All these questions were grating on Shigaraki's nerves. Gabai watched his boss silently fume to himself. He was starting to wonder what he was still doing here. Izuku had accomplished so much with little help since he revealed himself to the world along with his gauntlet. He took on All Might to what the media called a standstill, then went on to persuade the government into giving him a position of power and authority. The kid even went the extra mile by taking down the number two hero, the man that Dabai hated the most. Izuku did it without lifting a finger, he merely sicked his robots on him. It was quite a treat to watch the bastard get beaten down repeatedly and then dragged before Izuku who did something to him with his gauntlet that put the defeated hero to sleep. What had the League done? A failed attack on Yue. A few small acts of terrorism on cities. Kidnapped a student from the training camp, which lead to their base getting raided and their real leader defeated by All Might. Now here they were, moving from place to place with no future prospects other than a possible alliance with the Yukuza. How would you like to come work for me? Dabai was starting to seriously consider Izuku's offer. Back then he hadn't gave it much thought, because Izuku only had three stones in his gauntlet. It made him powerful, but now with five of these weird stones of his he was beyond even that. Maybe he could accomplish more with him than Shigaraki ever could. Police HQ what happened? Endeavor groggily woke up. Opening his eyes he tried to figure out where he was. Judging by the dim lighting, gray walls, and bars it was some sort of prison cell. He concluded that villain kid locked him up somewhere. Does he really think this can hold me? He sneered at the audacity and sat up in the bed. Endeavor then tried to activate his quirk so he could melt the bars, but nothing happened. He tried again to activate Hellflame and still nothing happened. The sound of a loud metal rattling was brought to his attention. Looking outside his cell he saw Izuku Midoriya running his gauntlet against the bars. Ah you're awake. Izuku smiled at him through the bars. What did you do to me? Endeavor demanded. I took the one thing you value most. Izuku glared back at him. The one thing everyone values most in this world. Your quirk that's not possible. The former hero shouted, face twisted in rage. Oh that's a scary face. Izuku mocked as he pulled a small card out of his pocket. It was Endeavor's hero license. Oh you're making the same face in your license picture. He snickered holding the license up to compare the images. That scowl reminds me so much dot 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 of my dear Kakin. He then ignited the card with Endeavor's own quirk burning the license to a crisp before tossing the smoldering plastic at the ex-hero's feet. Their career as a hero is over Enji Todoroki. He thoroughly enjoyed the look of shock and disbelief on the man's face. My agency will come after you for this. Endeavor spat. I know that's why I shut your agency down. Izuku crossed his arms. Oh that's right you've been asleep for three days and don't know what's going on now. Let's just say I can get a lot done in three days. He chuckled in amusement. Do you really think the public will let this slide? Endeavor figured at least his fans would speak out against this brat. He was the second greatest hero after all. I've got a question for you. Izuku paced the outside of the cell. Do you think anyone will give you sympathy now that they found out what you've done? 
He stopped to glare at the man through the bars. How you drove your wife to madness. How you discarded your children when you realized they wouldn't further your ambition. See the ex-hero's shocked and angry gaze he continued. Or perhaps the public should know about how you drove your firstborn son Talia to suicide. You didn't even look for his body you shut the hell up. Finally snapping he stood up on wobbly legs. No you shut up. Izuku yelled back. The public knows the truth about you. They now know that you're not a hero. That someone like you should never be a hero. But don't worry for you won't be the only hero I retire who are you to decide that? Endeavor argued. You're just some quirkless brat with a fancy glove. While this quirkless brat in his fancy glove is powerful enough to put you in your place, Izuku taunted him. And I wouldn't be insulting quirkless people if I were you. After all you are one of us now, he smiled widely. It's not so bad. You'll get used to it. Endeavor looked down at this clenched fist in rage, lamenting how useless he was now. The worst part was that the little bastard sounded proud of what he did to this once great hero. I don't care how long it takes, but I'll make you pay for this one way or another, NG Todoroki vowed. There's a few things I've been meaning to ask you Endeavor. Izuku ignored the man's petty threats. Were you always like this? He asked stepping closer to the bars. Let me rephrase that. Did it ever occur to you in your entire career as a hero to simply be a hero? Was this all just a competition to you? A way for you to be the best? Did none of the lives you saved matter to you? Was every person just a point for your scoreboard in this ridiculous imaginary feud with All Might? What else would I do this for? Todoroki stated. What would be the point if I'm not the best? Izuku just frowned in disappointment. Just like Bakugou and all the others, they missed the whole purpose of being a hero. Which was to be a hero. That's what I thought. Pinching the bridge of his nose with a frustrated sigh he then slid open the entrance to the cell. All right then, off you go. He waved at the man to leave. Enji gave him a skeptical look. You're not a prisoner Todoroki. You've had your quirk appropriated and your hero license revoked, but you're free to leave. This is your punishment Enji Todoroki to live free in the new world. Completely powerless to change anything. Two black titan robots came up behind Izuku. My advice to you is to try and piece back together your shattered family. Maybe earn back their love and respect. Have a second chance to be a father for once in your life. It's all you have left now. He smiled pleasantly and turned to his tall robots. Boys escort this man out. The titans growled in confirmation. Endeavor was taken by the arms and walked out of the cells. He didn't put up a fight. What could he do anyway? That little green-haired brat stole his quirk from him and took away his hero license. He was worthless and useless now. The robots escorted him through the police headquarters. Every employee and officer they passed gave him mixed looks. Some looked at the former hero with pity, others looked disgusted. Soon Endeavor was brought to the front entrance. The Titans then roughly pushed him out the doors where a sea of reporters and journalists were waiting. Endeavor is it true about what happened to your first son Taoya Todoroki? One of them asked shoving a mic close to his face. Do you feel responsible for his suicide? Why did you lie to the public by saying his death was accidental? Why did you lie and say that your wife moved to the hospital for health issues? Did your agency know all this? Is that why director Midoriya shut it down? More and more. The former hero was continuously bombarded by questions and accusations and for the first time in his life he didn't know how to respond. He was alone and completely powerless. From atop the police headquarters Izuku watched the man with a satisfied smile on his face. This age of heroes was finally coming to a close and his new age would spring forth from the ashes of the old. I should really invest in some nicer suits. Izuku spontaneously remarked looking down at his cheap jacket and tie. The left sleeve wasn't even properly tailored for his gauntlet. He just ripped it off at the elbow. Not very classy at all. This one looks nice. Izuku commented as he got a good look at himself in the mirror. He was currently at a fancy high-class garment shop to buy a new suit befitting his new job. This one was a cool gray, with a black button shirt and matching black tie. He really liked it. Looks good on you kid, the owner of the shop said. An old mustached man in glasses. Yes it does. This was the tenth one he tried on and so far it was the best. I'll take this one. In fact I'd like a couple dozen made. Custom tailored for my gauntlet please Excelsior. The man suddenly exclaimed at making such a great sale. You've been a big help Mr. Lee. He smiled at the owner. If you don't mind I'd like to wear this one out. I've got an important meeting to go to. Is this how boys feel when they go shopping with their girlfriends? Bachako dryly asked as she sat in a chair by the mirrors. A miserably bored look plastered on her face that eventually formed after watching him try on ten suits in row. I've never had a girlfriend so I wouldn't know. Izuku blushed lightly in embarrassment having realized that she'd been sitting there watching him shop for clothes this whole time. Sorry for dragging you here by the way it's fine. The brown-haired gravity girl stood up and stretched her stiff back out. She was dressed in a black formal jacket, skirt, fingerless gloves, stockings and shoes. So what's this important meeting we're going to? She followed behind Izuku as he paid for his new attire. We're paying you a visit, he said. Ah really, Uraraka wasn't sure that was such a good idea. 
It's important for a government director in charge of hero regulation to check in on hero institutions every once in a while, Izuku explained. Plus it's good to keep your enemies on their toes if you say so, Yuraka said nervously. In truth she was worried it would be awkward mostly for her when they showed up at the school that expelled her not too long ago. Relax, everything will be fine, Izuku promised. You a class 1A. Alright for those of you that received your provisional licenses, you will be eligible for the work-study program, Aizawa explained to his students. The staff decided to continue teaching class as if everything was normal despite the recent political situation. Similar to the internships, you'll be offered these positions from various hero agencies. The class didn't seem that excited, especially those who were part of the junkyard incident. They obviously were aware what was going on like everyone else, but some of them blamed themselves that they couldn't stop him then and there. All teachers and staff report to the front entrance immediately. The voice of the principal said over the intercom. Aizawa dropped what he was doing and told his class to stay put. Nezu wouldn't order something like that unless there was an emergency. Rushing down the halls he was joined by his colleagues who also seemed to be just as in the dark as he was over what was happening. When they arrived to the front courtyard that led to the academy's main entrance the entire staff was there. What's this all about? Howard Loader asked. We were in the middle of teaching our classes, Vlad King said. He's coming, Nezu said ominously while looking towards the entrance. Who? Aizawa followed his gaze. Izuku Midoriya is coming here to Yue, the small white animal said. Everyone's eyes widened in shock especially Tashinori's. Wait, he's coming here. Like today. Like right now. Midnight questioned. How long till he gets here? Snipe asked next. In less than five minutes, Nezu said while looking to his watch. Smart kid, Aizawa began, announcing his arrival right before he gets here. Gives us zero time to prepare. After complimenting the boy's bold move he tensed up along with everyone else when a black limousine appeared outside the entrance followed by a large armored truck. The door opened and out stepped Midoriya. Dark green messy hair, gray suit and infinity gauntlet attached to his left hand. It was the next person who stepped out after him that shocked them even further. Achako Yuraka, former U.S. student, looking just as anxious as them. What the hell was she doing with him? You all look tense. Izuku called from outside the entrance with a smile on his face, like you're ready for a fight. He along with the girl walked up to the threshold. Are you going to turn off the security gate so we can enter? He asked coyly. They all looked at him like he was nuts. We have to do as he asks, Nezu suddenly said. He works for the government that gives us our funding. As long as he doesn't cause harm to the students or the premise he can come and go as he pleases, the principal quoted the policy. You can't be serious, Midnight said. I'm afraid he is. Izuku called again while tapping his foot patiently. Nezu pulled out a small remote and pressed a few buttons deactivating the security system around the front gate of the school. Izuku smirked and took a step forward crossing the entryway into the most prestigious hero school in the country. Yuraka silently followed him. Oh and one more thing, he snapped his fingers and the armored van opened up. From of the vehicle six sleek black titan robots walked out marching in unison behind their master. Don't mind my security detail, Izuku said nonchalantly while he casually strolled up to the Yua teachers. Good day director Midoriya. Nezu greeted him choosing to be polite and cordial despite the troubling situation. Pleased to meet you Professor Nezu. Izuku bent down to shake the small creature's hand. May I introduce the first employee of my new department I'm sure you remember her Achako Yuraka. He took a bit of sick pleasure in the look on the teacher's faces especially Aizawa and Tashinori. Sorry to alarm you with my sudden arrival but as the director of the new department of hero regulation I thought it best to pay a visit to all the hero schools just to check in on how things are run here. He smiled almost pleasantly. Please go about your normal routine. Don't mind me yes, everyone go back to your classes tell them that everything is fine. Nezu ordered, while sending a secret message underneath his words that basically said don't do anything irrational and don't let the students do anything irrational. They all gave the principal a worried look but obeyed. Tashinori wanted so badly to do something about Midoriya. He knew he couldn't though, his hands were tied on this. As he was leaving he didn't notice the small grin that Izuku sent his way. Shall we talk in my office? Lead the way. Izuku walked alongside the small white creature followed by his entourage of robots and his friend Yuraka. Office please sit down, have some tea. Nezu kept up the polite facade. Izuku took a seat at a small table that had a chessboard with two fresh cups on either side. Iraraka decided to wait outside to avoid the potential awkwardness. Thank you. Taking a sip of the tea he smiled at the familiar game. Nezu sat in the opposite chair. Would you indulge me a bit? The principal asked gesturing to the board. After you, Izuku nodded. Nezu started by moving one of the white pawns forward. May I ask what this little visit is really about? The green-haired boy made his first move with his knight instead of a pawn. I already told you, Izuku watched him move another pawn. 
just checking in to see how things are conducted at these hero schools. He moved one of his own black pawns. As the director of hero regulation I need to make sure that the future heroes meet the new standards. And what standards do you believe they need to meet? Mezu asked as he moved another piece. I simply want them to be heroes for the right reasons. Izuku began as he made his move. Is that so wrong? To have real heroes who wish to honestly help others and are not in it for money or fame know there is nothing wrong with that? Nezu agreed. But have you considered the cost? What will you have to become to achieve such a goal? Maybe I should have been nicer about it. Is that your point? Using his knight Izuku took out a pawn. Use my infinity gauntlet to become a hero and symbol of justice and good. Become part of the problem instead of trying to fix it all I'm saying is that there's still a chance to do the right thing. Nezu told him while taking out one of his pieces. I am doing the right thing. You just think it's wrong because you don't understand. Izuku's moves on the chessboard went from calculated to slightly more aggressive. History will always be the judge over who is right and who is wrong so you've made up your mind then. Izuku chuckled lightly at the question. It's funny that an animal lucky to be born with such a wonderful quirk thinks he can convince me that I'm wrong in some capacity. He remarked, as if you could possibly understand what it's like to be a quirkless nobody. You don't even allow quirkless kids into your hero classes that's not true. We changed that rule five years ago, Nezu argued, and in all that time not a single quirkless child has attempted your entrance exam or even applied for the program. Izuku put him check. That certainly says a lot what does it say? Nezu asked as he maneuvered his king out of danger. Allowing quirkless people to take the exam was really nothing more than a publicity stunt. You never had any intention of letting them into the hero program and everyone knows it. It's not like you did anything to encourage or promote a possible quirkless hero, Izuku said accusingly. You and your school value people based on their quirks, just like the rest of the world, he spoke with bitterness. That's also not true, Nezu denied what he said. We value all of our students and those who apply equally oh really. The green-haired teen smirked as he moved his pieces. Then why did you expel your Uraka and not Bakugu for that incident at the junkyard? He broke more rules and laws than she did. Yet you chose to make an example out of her and not him. The principal didn't have a reply for that. He knew what it looked like from his perspective. I get why you did it. Bakugu has such a powerful quirk and volatile personality that of all the students he's the most at risk to turning into a villain. You and the teachers probably find it easier to let the baby have his bottle than to actually fix the problem. What a wonderful school this is, he said that last part with sarcasm. Why is Miss Yuraka in your employ? Nezu asked in an attempt to change the subject. Though Izuku also noticed the hidden question underneath his inquiry. Are you using her? Unlike you and your staff I saw great potential in her, Izuku explained. She has the heart of a true hero and I intend to make everyone see that. Nezu picked up on something he said there. It sounded like she was more than just an employee for his department. There was obviously more to this hero regulation program than initially implied and that worried the principal. Staff Lounge All Might sat on the couch in his true form, wiping the nervous sweat from his brow. Izuku Midori had just walked into you as if it was normal. The fact that he would do something so bold after just being given his new position showed how confident he was. Just as he was wondering what he should do about this the young third year that he wanted to be his successor barged into the room. He's here isn't he? Mirio started. How did you know? Tashinori wondered. Some students saw him arrive from the windows and words gotten around. As soon as he heard the news that the new director of hero regulation was here on the grounds he immediately went looking for his teacher All Might. Yes he's here and the entire staff is on edge. The gaunt man admitted. Good. I can talk to him in person. Mirio began to leave but Tashinori quickly halted his progress with a hand on his shoulder. Look young Mirio I admire your enthusiasm. But what do you think talking to Midoriya will accomplish? The hero told him. I myself couldn't get through to him. I really think he's beyond words at this point I don't believe that, Mirio argued. No one is beyond words, least of all a kid who clearly doesn't understand what he's doing young Mirio, Tashinori sighed. I really don't want you going near him just yet, he told the honest truth. Not only is Midoriya in possession of one for all, but I think he also has all for one. The third year paled a bit at the mention of that awful quirk. All Might told him about the villain he defeated and now stayed locked in Tartarus. If Izuku Midoriya had that quirk as part of his gauntlet, the damage he could do with it would be astronomical. Then what do we do? First I need to confirm whether or not he has it, Tashinori told him. Then I don't know, he frowned in frustration. If I could just get that gauntlet off of him, then he wouldn't be such a threat no offense all might. But it's that kind of thinking that made him what he is today. Mirio reminded him that it was everyone believing quirkless people were weak and helpless that led Midoriya to this present position. Tashinori frowned. He did it again, but old habits are hard to stop. For now we watch him, he told his protege. I don't think he'll start a fight I don't think anyone will start one with him either, Mirio sounded assured. Well there is young Bakugu. Apparently they have a bad history together, All Might suddenly grew extremely worried. He knew how quick to anger the boy was. A thought also occurred to him as well. 
What if Midoriya was counting on that? What if he came here knowing Bakugo would attack him on sight and that would give Izuku a reason to bring his new authority down on the other boy? If he truly had all for one then this could all be a trap said to take Katsuki's quirk. I'll be back. Whatever you do don't approach Midoriya yet. Tashinori went to go warn Aizawa to keep Bakugo away from their guest visitor. Halls of you. Oh what a wonderful facility, Izuku commented as he strolled through the halls of the prestigious hero school. He marveled at the state of the art training rooms they passed. As someone who could never walk this campus as a student due to his quirkless nature, he found great joy and satisfaction to be able to tour the place as much as his heart desired. Yeah it's nice, Achako sighed longingly. It was with a heavy heart that she followed him around the very school she was kicked out of where her previous dream ended. Luckily Izuku was there at her lowest point to give her a new dream and purpose. Sheer up your Uraka. I know how hard it this is for you. Izuku turned around to face her, silently gesturing for his titans to stop. Life and the goals we set are about moving forward. Not looking behind then what are we doing here? Achako asked. She still didn't fully understand why they came to her former school in the first place. We're here looking for those who also wish to move forward like us. Izuku turned to look down the hall where he finally spotted the room he was looking for. The support class. With a warm smile he walked right up to the development studio and without knocking went to open the door. Only for a big explosion of black smoke to blow the doors open and a figure to nearly crash into him. Izuku, without flinching, used the reality stone's power to catch it before it reached him. The robots growled for a moment before going back to standby mode after determining that it was not a threat to their master. Uraraka's eyes widened in surprise at what just happened. I guess the fuel output was set too high. A girl's voice giggled from the smoke. Or maybe the generator overheated too fast Mei Hatsum. Izuku held her up in the air with his power and the girl had yet to realize it yet. Still blowing things up I see. Mei looked down to see Izuku standing there in the middle of the hall. Izuku, she exclaimed loudly. She hadn't seen him since his big debut on the news four days ago. Part of her was shocked watching what happened to Endeavor, but the inventor in her was also fascinated and overjoyed at seeing the finished version of the Titans. Speaking of which, there was a group of shiny black ones behind Gravity Girl. Are those the new models? Let me see. Let me see. She thrashed and wriggled in the air. Calm down. Izuku let her down and released his hold on her. All in good time. He glanced into the design studio and noticed that power loader wasn't present. Where's her teacher? He said something about needing to be in the surveillance room for something. I don't know I wasn't really listening, she laughed. Gee I wonder what he'd be doing in the surveillance room. Izuku smirked knowingly. Well since he's not here could I have a word with you in private? I'm sure, May agreed. Do you mind if I speak to her alone? He asked Yuraka. The gravity girl nodded and decided to wander off for a bit while they talked. Izuku followed May into the workshop while ordering one of the titans to come inside while the rest waited in the hall. So this is the final model. May skipped around the unmoving robot examining every detail. No this is the basic titan soldier that will be incorporated into the police forces, Izuku told her. The ones you saw beat up Endeavor were the specialty models. Specifically the anti-fire quirk versions wait there's more specialty models. Mei asked. Of course, Izuku smiled at her enthusiasm. We got titans for all elemental quirk users, telekinetic quirks, and strength quirks. They're not invincible but they do make tough foot soldiers. After letting her geek out over the robot he decided now was the time to talk seriously. So how have you been? I've been good. Still making babies so nothing's changed much, May said honestly. I never got a chance to apologize to you Hatsum. Izuku's tone was sincere. Apologize? For what? May wondered what he would need to say sorry for. In case you thought I was using you. I wasn't. I've only ever seen you as a friend and colleague. He gave her assurance that he was never manipulating her in any way. How about we forget about it if... She suddenly placed her hands on his infinity gauntlet and lifted it up so she could get a good look at it. You tell me how this baby works. He eyes turned sparkly for a brief moment and Izuku had to wonder if that was part of her quirk. I could tell you, Izuku released her hold. But if I did I'd have to kill you. She laughed at that. I wasn't joking. He mumbled to himself, but just let her laugh and think he was kidding. It's not like he planned on telling her or anyone for that matter how his infinity gauntlet worked. No matter what no one but him must know. Now for the main reason I came to speak with you, Izuku took a step closer to Hatsu. Would you be interested in a job? Would you like to work for me in my department of hero regulation? First of all what would you need a psycho inventor for when you're already a mad genius yourself? May questioned. Second I'm still a high schooler, are you even allowed to hire someone like me? In reverse order. As a government director I can employ anybody I chose no matter the age or qualifications, Izuku explained. The reason I want you in the department is because I need your help. I may be a mad genius like you said, but I can't do everything by myself. He decided to tell her the truth about what came next in his plan. My department isn't just going to regulate hero behavior and activity. 
The main purpose is to create an example of what model heroes should be. That's why Uraraka has joined me. With more training and proper gear she'll be one of the first new heroes that my department produces and you need me to help with that. May looked at him with a curious gaze. Well I figured with your wonderful potential for making babies you'd want to make some for the future great heroes. Izuku looked around the workshop that you have provided for its students. Would you rather sit around here for three years earning a diploma than working your way up some corporate ladder for a decade? Or would like to join me right now and make a difference in this world? He reached into his pocket and handed her a card with a number on it. Think on it. After that he ordered his robot to leave and went to follow it out the doors, but not before one last bit of incentive. Also think on this. Your own personal workshop ten times the size of this one is what would await you should you join us. Izuku smirked seeing the excited look on Mei's face, like a kid was told he was going to a candy store. I'll be seeing you. He waved goodbye and went to go find Achako. Meanwhile Shinzo Hitoshi stared at the three second years in front of him with a bored expression. Ever since the sports festival where he got further than anybody expected a general studies student to get, other students would often hound him about how a kid with villainous quirk could get that far. Of course they assume he cheated which Shinzo would scoff at. A physical competition against students who could generate ice, create explosions, had engines in their legs, and he must have cheated by using his god-given brainwashing quirk. What a load of crap. He tried his best just like everyone else and failed because he wasn't lucky enough to be born with an overpowered quirk, like that Bakugu asshole. What's the matter? Not gonna say anything. The guy with goat-like features stared down. Careful that's how his villain quirk activates. He needs to talk. Another guy with a third eye on his forehead mocked. Shinso could use his quirk and make them leave him alone but he wouldn't give them the satisfaction. He was going to be a hero no matter what. Excuse me. A voice said from behind the group. Shinso recognized the girl. She was that girl from class 1 and that got expelled. What was she doing here? I couldn't help but notice you picking on this fellow here what's it to you girl? Yeah get out of here in a matter of seconds Achako was suddenly between them and Shinso and the group of bullies were floating up to the ceiling. What? Were they bothering you? Iraraka asked looking towards the purple-haired boy while adjusting her gloves. Yeah, a bit. How did you do that? He remembered how she used her quirk in the sports festival. She had to touch them to nullify their gravity and make them float up. After I was expelled I gained a new friend who helped teach me new ways I can use my quirk. She looked to the students who were no desperately trying to gain a grip on the ceiling. Now I try to use a light touch so my targets don't even feel or know I've touched them until it's too late. I've even worked on my speed as well that she has. Another voice spoke from the end of the hall. Izuku appeared there with his mechanical bodyguards in his wake. As I told Uraraka, there's other ways to be strong. He walked up to Achako and Shinso. I remember you from the sports festival. Shinso Hitoshi right. Yeah that's me. Shinso kept a cautious stare on the guy in front of him. Izuku Midoriya, the quirkless villain that fought All Might and gained a position in the government. You did very well with your brainwashing quirk in the competitions. Until Bakugou figured it out in the tournament and blew you out of the ring, Izuku said rather bluntly. I was still impressed by your performance though. He spoke freely to the boy without care for the other's quirk which surprised Shinzo. Aren't you worried I might use my quirk on you? The purple-haired boy suddenly asked. Oh I wouldn't even try if I were you. Izuku pointed his thumb back at the robots behind him. Those titans are equipped with scanners that detect the activation of quirks and will attack you without hesitation. Should you use yours on me they'd crush your windpipe before you could order me to order them to stop, he then smirked deviously. You wouldn't even get the full sentence out. I'll take your word for it. Shinzo sweated a bit under the menacing gaze of the tall imposing robots. Well it was nice meeting you. Good luck with your studies. Izuku smiled brightly and waved goodbye. Let's go find this amazing claws keep hearing about. He remarked as he walked off with his mechanical guards. Achako smiled at general class student as well and placed her fingers together to return gravity to the three bullies still stuck to the ceiling like balloons. The students crashed painfully on the floor much to Shinzo's amusement. When he turned around Izuku and Uraraka were gone. I need to see this. Shinzo Hitoshi decided to follow after the two of them. Part of him was just curious to see what would happen but the other part was hoping he'd knock someone down a peg. Class 1 is so which hero agency are you going to for your work-study program? Yeirazu asked her fellow classmate Todoroki after the lunch break bell rang. I figured you'd go with your father. His agency doesn't exist anymore Shoto said. That's right I heard that new government department shut it down. Mina said. What happened to Endeavor anyway? Hiroshima asked the hot and cold boy. He showed up at the house yesterday. But he hasn't said anything to any of us, Shoto told them. There's another thing. Something happened to his quirk. Before he could explain Bakugu stormed out the door rather loudly and Kirishima worriedly chased after him. Apparently he's still upset because he's the only student in their class that won't be doing the work-study program. He is the only one of them that failed to get their provisional license. He'll be taking the remedial training according to Aizawa. 
He's in a bad mood, Kaminari supplied. When is he not in a bad mood? Siyu said with a quiet croak. He's never been this bad though, Siro commented. Everyone made their way into the hallway as they went to go get lunch. They were stopped when a familiar person appeared at the other end of the hall. So this is the famous Class 1A. Izuku smiled as he walked towards the shocked group of students. The ones who fought real villains and survived. The champions of Yua and the future generation of heroes. The students all paled at the sight of him. They were told a special guest was here at Yua by their homeroom teacher and they were also told not to worry about. Now they understood why Aizawa didn't want them to worry. The entire class didn't know how to react. Ada being the brave one stepped forward in a protective manner between his classmates and the wielder of the Infinity Gauntlet. I don't know what you're doing here, but please this is school, Izuku just waved it off. Oh relax I'm only here to ruffle some feathers and do my job, the green-haired teen smiled. Which is, to keep the heroes in line and make sure they're doing their jobs for the right reasons, Izuku supplied. Let's see if I remember. He stepped a little closer making it a flinch. There was Shoto Todoroki, Tenya Ida, Momonge Yurazu, Tsuyu Asui, and Ijiro Kirishima. You were the ones who bravely fought me at Raxus Junkyard. I never got a chance to commend you for your wonderfully heroic behavior. Izuku applauded them. I know your teachers scolded you for it, but they're too obsessed with bureaucracy and the value of quirks to know what real heroics are anymore. What about Achako? Tsuyu blurted out while standing up to him as well. She went looking for you there first and yet she was expelled because of you. If anyone is heroic it's her you're absolutely right. Izuku agreed with her. That's why I decided to lend her a helping hand. Isn't that right Yuraka? A stunned silence quieted the whole group when another familiar person stepped around the row of titan robots. H hi, she greeted them awkwardly. Yuraka. Ada was the first to get over his shock. Just what on earth are you doing with him? He kept a wary eye Izuku who decided to stand back and watch the whole interaction. You know what he is and you must know what he's done and... The gravity girl wondered what his point was. So why are you with him? Ada demanded to know why she would ally herself with someone like Midoriya. Because he's right. Because his beliefs are just, Yuraka said honestly. Izuku's goal to correct our hero-based society is something I wish to support. I find that hard to believe that's all he wants. Yeyarazu spoke up. I don't expect you to understand Momo Yeyarazu, Izuku said directing his gaze to her. You who is born into wealth, born with a wonderfully versatile quirk. I have nothing personal against you, but you like many others are blind to the problems of this world that seem to silence Momo. Passing over her his eyes landed on Todoroki. How's your father doing Shoto? He made it back home safely I presume. Izuku said with mirth. What did you do to him? The bicolor haired boy asked, with more curiosity rather than anger. He wasn't fit for the position of a hero, so I revoked his status in more ways than one. Izuku shrugged. Simple as that. I don't see what the big deal about Endeavor was. All it took was a few well-built Titan robots to take him down indeed. Shoto found himself agreeing with the other team. He used to always be intimidated by his father's overwhelming power. But ever since Izuku convinced him that his destiny was to surpass his father and be a hero unlike either him or Almighty started to see Endeavor for what he was. A failure that could only pass his selfish goals onto others rather than complete them himself. After watching him get trashed by those machines on the news in Shoto's eyes that once powerful intimidating man looked extremely small now. For all the man's ambitions and plans it was all over for him now. Undone by one quirkless genius who not only took everything that mattered most from Endeavor, but he also exposed all of the man's dirty secrets to the light. For that Shoto was grateful. He already hated the man for what he put his mother and his childhood through. But after learning of the older brother Taoya that he never knew and never would, he hated his father even more now. So how are you doing then? He was asking about his quirk. Shoto of course read between the lines. Not that it's any of your business, but I've been learning how to use the fire side of my quirk since our battle, the youngest Todoroki told him truthfully. Ah but it is my business. You're all future heroes and as the director of hero regulation it's my job to make sure you're prepared and are doing your job as heroes for the right reasons. When he said that last part he glared down at a rather short kid with purple balls for hair. Minor Reminta, Izuku had completed his analysis of him after the USJ incident and he wasn't impressed with the boy's quirk or his personality. Judging by how the student was shaking in terror at the sight of him and cowering behind one of the girl's legs he hadn't improved at all. Hell no one else besides Ida, Asui, Todoroki, and Yeyurazu had bothered to speak up to him. The others were clearly too frightened of him. What the hell? Bakugu turned the corner and spotted Deku standing there in front of his classmates. At first he thought it was another hallucination, but everyone else could clearly see him too. Finally some normalcy, Izuku smiled at the breath of fresh air and predictability that Katsuki Bakugu brought. The blonde stomped over to him, palms sparkling. Hey man, don't do anything rash. Hiroshima placed a hand on his friend's shoulder to stop him. Oh yes, please do something rash. Izuku waved his hand silently ordering his titans to stand by and do nothing. 
Don't listen to him he's just trying to get under your skin. The redhead kept a tighter hold on Bakugo. I get it he beat you up pretty bad at the junkyard. But that's no reason to get this angry really. Izuku raised a brow at that. You really think that's why he hates me so much? He then looked to Katsuki. So you didn't tell him or the rest of your classmates? Interesting tell us what? Tenya asked. It appears your friend Bakugu decided to remain tight-lipped about his past. Specifically who and what he really is. Izuku smiled at them. Allow me to shed some light on the matter. You see when Bakugu here got his quirk in preschool everyone around him. The adults and the kids praised him for it, he explained. Sadly that created a massive superiority complex and gave birth to an arrogance and ego that could rival the gods. He enjoyed the furious look on the explosive blonde's face. And so Bakugu here became the worst school bully, doing whatever he wanted to anybody. Especially me isn't that right Kaken? Kirishima released his hold on Bakugu. He called me Deku, the useless, worthless, quirkless nerd. He's blasted me with his quirk more times than he's probably hit you all with it in training. He did that. The redhead at first didn't want to believe that, but he wasn't blind to Bakugu's violent personality. He just never thought the other would stoop so low as to bully a defenseless person. So you didn't know then? Izuku frowned. Forgive me for thinking the worst of you Ijiro Kirishima. I thought you were one of those parasitic leeches who ride the coattails of those in power without a care for what the person's done. Just like his former middle school lackeys. It seems you simply didn't know the truth. My sincerest apologies everyone went from looking at Izuku to staring at Katsuki. Some looked at him in contempt like Achako, Ida and Todoroki. Others like Kirishima and Mina were staring at him in disappointment. Bakugo finally had enough of the accusing eyes and turned his fury on the cause of this. Launching forward his hand reached out to blast Deku off his feet. Time slowed down as Izuku's mouth widened into a pleased grin. He raised his gauntlet and opened the palm as the soul stone glowed in eerie purple. Though explosion came and a grey capture weapon wrapped securely around Bakugo's body, pinning his arms to his side and hauling him away from the green-haired director. What a joy that could have been. Izuku thought as he sighed in disappointment and deactivated the soul stone. I'd appreciate it if you didn't harass my students, Aizawa said as he kept a tight hold on Bakugu with his scarf while making sure the boy's quirk was erased. He arrived just in time to see the blonde attacking the boy once known as the villain Apotheosis. I was merely educating them on things they didn't know. That's what a teacher is supposed to do right. Izuku explained himself while simultaneously calling Erasure Head's methods into question. Helping the students to be the future heroes is what this institution is all about. But judging how Katsuki Bakugu is still snarling at me like a rabid dog, it seems the school's behavioral practices are not as good as I imagined. Izuku took a step closer to the still-captured Bakugu. He's been here for over a semester and yet he's still the same violent boy that tormented me through my childhood. You've got your work cut out for you Aizawa-sensei. He leaned in closer to the blonde's angry face. I honestly can't wait for you to become a legal registered hero Kaken, because then you'll be under my jurisdiction. His smile promised future misery for the explosive teen. Bakugo wanted to scream curse words at him but Erasure's capture scarf wrapped around his mouth while the teacher dragged him off somewhere. HM, Izuku hummed and thought as he watched his former bully get taken away. Did Aizawa figure out what the soul stone does? Or did somebody else figure it out and warned him? Questions he would save for later. Was that true? What you just said about Bakugu? Kirishima asked stepping forward courageously. Yes, that's the sad truth about this world Kirishima. Those with power get to do whatever they want to those who lack it, Izuku explained to him. Isn't that right Todoroki? He's right. The class gasped in shock when Shoto once again agreed with Midoriya. For a while I didn't fully understand why I disliked Bakugu, but now I think it's because he's very similar to my father fear not though, because I'm not letting bad people like them be heroes anymore. Izuku nodded to them. Have a nice day everyone. I look forward to seeing more from this wonderful class. He turned to walk away followed by his titans. Achako bowed apologetically to her former classmates and trailed after him. What about you? Momo finally spoke up, finding courage to contradict him. When you have everything the way you want it, you'll be the last bad person left. So what happens to you? Bad person. Izuku turned and walked back over to her getting a bit into her personal space for intimidation. It didn't help that he also stood at the same height as her either. So you think the person who is trying to fix the problems of this world, problems that other people created is evil? He stared into her eyes letting his glow green with the power stone for a moment. You have some growing up to do yay Arazu. Goodbye for now. He broke eye contact and turned to leave, letting Momo release the breath she was holding. Empty classroom let me go damn it. Katsuki thrashed and yelled. Enough. Aizawa released him quickly letting him fall against a desk. He was going to shout some more but Erasure cut him off before he could. I know what your problem with Midoriya is what? Bakugu froze. So you heard what he said too no. 
After the junkyard incident we noticed by your injuries that Midoriya gave you special attention so Nezu investigated your history and past relationship with him. He paused for a moment. If there's things I can't stand it's bullying and racism. He glared down at his student. Midoriya thinks that we don't care about your personality and are only interested in your powerful quirk like everyone else in your life before you a well I'm here to tell you that he's wrong. I'm about to do something that should have been done a long time. Katsuki Bakugu, you are not the best, you have a dangerous and destructive quirk that in my opinion is only good for causing physical harm to others. I don't think you're cut out to be a hero, but the principal thinks you'll change with time and effort. After Raxus we let you off easy because we felt sorry for how badly you were beaten by Midoriya, which was a mistake. You should have been expelled instead of your Araka. Aizawa continued to scold the blonde who remained silent having never been talked down to like this before. You helped make Midoriya what he is today. To that boy you were a villain not a hero. You need to learn that terrible actions have terrible consequences. So starting tomorrow you will report for counseling and best genus gave us an interesting idea with how to teach you humility. I won't spoil the surprise, but all I'm saying is that if nothing comes from it you might just consider yourself expelled in the future. Aizawa exhaled having said what he needed to say. Is that all? Katsuki said quietly in a very uncharacteristic way, swallowing the lump in his throat as his eyes stung a bit. Yes and count yourself lucky that I showed up in time to stop you. Aizawa scolded him again on his reckless behavior. All Might has a theory about that stone in the palm of his gauntlet, the one you and the others tried to keep from him. If he's right then you just came very close to losing your quirk what are you talking about? Bakugu looked at him like he was crazy. How would a shiny stone take away his quirk? Outside this was a fun day wasn't it? Izuku smiled as Achako walked beside him. Well you've certainly antagonized them all. Yuraka despite what she just said had finally figured out one of the real reasons they came here. Izuku obviously wanted to test the waters and see where he stood with future recruits. Hatsune was his main objective. But she could tell that Izuku was also interested in Todoroki and how he intended to sway them to his side was still a mystery to her though. Midoriya wait. A voice called out to him, making him pause and turn around. A skinny frail looking blonde man in an oversized yellow suit jogged up to him. All Might, shouldn't you be taking it easy considering your condition? Izuku said with fake concern as the man took a moment to catch his breath. I just wanted to speak to you, not as a hero. Person to person, Tashinori walked closer to him, noticing how the robots emitted a light growling noise when he got too close. I understand you don't want to hear another apology from me, nor do you want to hear me say that you can become a hero again. Izuku narrowed his eyes at that. I just want you to think about what you're doing. Really think about it and ask yourself is what you're doing right? Is it just? I did think about, Izuku told him. I thought about what I would do with the Infinity Gauntlet once I obtained it for a long time. What I plan to do is more than just, it's fair. Fair and balanced just as all things should be fair and balanced. Is that what you call stealing Endeavor's quirk? The Gaunt Man called him out on that. Izuku just smiled and raised his gauntlet, creating a ball of fire in his palm. So All Might figured out the Soul Stone then. Was it fair that Endeavor got to be the number two hero while tormenting and abusing his own family? Izuku asked him. Was it fair that you lied to the world for years about your quirk? Was it fair that you gave people like me false hope? You have to understand that as the symbol of peace everyone's hopes are riding on me being an invincible hero. All Might sighed sadly. I didn't like it. But as long everyone was safe and smiling it seemed like it was worth it meanwhile the quirkless rejects like myself were being pushed around and stepped on by society. Izuku argued back with a glare. Your lies gave us and me something to hope for. I thought that anyone could be a hero I really did until you told me the truth. You said someone without a quirk can't be a hero. That it wasn't possible. He extinguished the fire in his hand. You're wrong all might. Anyone can be a hero. And they deserve a chance to at least try. Tashinori swallowed the apology that was forming in his mouth. Saying sorry wouldn't help him anymore. Um, Izuku, your Raka approached him holding her phone. The Prime Minister called and said the Senate approved the building of your new base. That was fast, Izuku laughed lightly. Funny how quickly the government's wheels turn when someone's wielding an all-powerful gauntlet. Well it was nice talking to you all might. He waved goodbye and made his way to where his limousine was waiting for them. And what about you young Yuraka? Tashinori looked to the brown-haired girl that stood with Midoriya. Do you think this is all fair and just? I've chosen my side, was all she said before turning around and following after him. The Titan robots loaded themselves into the armored truck and the two vehicles left the Hero Academy. All Might could only watch them leave, completely powerless to stop him. Later off the coast of Japan this seems like the perfect spot. Izuku told the pilot of the helicopter to slow down. He then ordered him to open up the back. Are you sure dot 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 sir? The pilot hesitated, not used to calling a kid such a formal title. Do it please. The back of the military grade chopper opened up revealing the downpour of wind and rain outside. Izuku looked out into the ocean and took a step off. He didn't fall like most would expect and instead hovered in midair. 
Once the helicopter was a safe distance away he looked to the sky. The storm is annoying. He pointed his gauntlet upwards and waved his hands a few times. The clouds started to part, halting the storm, letting the sunlight in and creating a giant pillar of light around Izuku and the area he wanted to work with. That's better. The reality stone and power stone glowed brightly as he reached down towards the ocean beneath him. Hava, he yelled as he started to make a pulling motion with his gauntlet. The waters began to churn and ripple as something large was pulled from the ocean floor. A large rocky surface was the first to emerge, raising up out of the water further until a big island was formed surrounded by a sheer cliff. Izuku had used his power to create a new land mass off the coast of Japan. Slowly levitating down the green-haired gauntlet user gently landed on his newly made island. Upon this rock I will build my church, he mockingly quoted as he took a look around the foundation for what would become his future base of operation. His phone suddenly went off, interrupting his musings. Seeing the unknown number he smiled having an idea who it was. I've been trying to get in contact with you for the past three days, he said as he answered the phone. You're a hard man to reach, Stained. You've outdone yourself kid, the hero killer finally said. You know I had a hunch that you were going to accomplish great things and I always trust my instincts. Did you see the news about Endeavor? I'm pretty sure I won our little bet, Izuku declared in victory. That you did. So dot 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 what do you want me to do dot 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 boss? He could hear the smirk in Stain's voice and that too brought a smile to his face. Shigaraki was not happy. Not the least bit with the situation that presented itself today. First the Yakuza was being stubborn and refused to meet with them. They were obviously playing the long game. Something that Sensei taught him. These groups will sometimes put off meetings in order by time or to make you lose your patience which in turn would cause you to make a mistake. And on top of all that he had that brat Apotheosis here talking to him as if he was a child again. Something that irritated him to no end. Could you repeat that? Tamura said dangerously. It's simple these two wish to join my department, so I'm taking them with me. Izuku shrugged nonchalantly from where he was sitting. You've gotten pretty cocky haven't you kid? Shigaraki sneered at him. That tends to happen when one obtains a vast amount of power. Izuku smirked at the villain. I don't see why you're so upset Dabai and Himiko just want to try out other prospects. You've run out Nomis and you league is kind of at standstill right now, he told him the blunt truth. You're not doing so well Tamura. Ever since Sensei was imprisoned the League of Villains hasn't really made much progress other than a few seemingly random attacks here and there, he gestured to the dark-haired fire user and the psychotic blonde. It's not like you're never going to see or use them again. If it helps you can think of them as a liaison between our two organizations you've got some nerve Midoriya. Tamura Shigaraki glared at him through the fingers of his father's hand. I remember when you were just a scrawny little quirkless nobody, helping petty scumbags and bank robbers perform small-time jobs before Sensei and I led into our group. You were nothing before you joined us. Nobody was interested in you. Even the police didn't start investigating you until the U attack. Izuku frowned as he went on this rant. Now you sit there with your little toy and think you can do whatever you want Shigaraki stood up from his chair. Get out. If I ever see your face again I'll turn you to dust. He spat as he turned to walk away. We're not done here Tamura. Sit down, Izuku said calmly. Shigaraki ignored him and kept walking away only to freeze when a powerful force held him in place. I said, the villain was lifted up in the air in front of all his subordinates and tossed back into the chair he occupied a moment ago. Sit down. Izuku's aura turned dark and menacing before it vanished as quickly as it came, returning to his warm, pleasant demeanor, which honestly frightened the members of the League. I don't think we're understanding each other, Izuku remarked. Allow me to explain things. He paused as he looked to the villain across from him with a serious expression. I don't think I made it clear before, but the only reason you and your League still exist is because of all for one. Sensei was kind enough to help me, to give me advice and a place to work in privacy. And because he showed me such kindness towards a quirkless nobody, as you put it, I decided to extend a similar kindness to you his successor Tamura Shigaraki. He then smiled again in that creepy way. Without that I would have crushed the League of Villains by now and you and your members would be rotting in a cell I should grateful. Is that what you're saying? Shigaraki spat. No you should feel lucky that I still consider you a friend and look up to all for one as a mentor, Izuku explained. So just be very careful with what you say and do towards me, because this, he gestured to the abandoned warehouse the villains currently occupied, could all end if I so desired. He stood up from his chair. Now do we understand each other Tamura Shigaraki? Yeah, I think I get it, Shigaraki growled out. He didn't like it, but his mind started plotting anyway for him to use this to his advantage. At the very least it seemed Midoriya was keen on letting them do as they pleased for now, but how long would that last? Now more than ever Shigaraki needed to get his hands on that quirk erasing weapon that the Yakuza was rumored to have in their possession. Great. Izuku opened a portal. We'll be seeing you then. He smiled as he stepped through. Toga of course didn't hesitate to follow him into it. Damai however looked to Shigaraki and the rest of the league for a moment. 
Nothing personal guys, the patched up man said before stepping into the portal towards his new role. When they were gone Kirajiri who remained silent through the whole altercation finally spoke. I know you don't want me to say it Shigaraki, but we still need his friendship, the misty villain said. He's probably the only thing keeping the heroes off our trail at this point what does she see in him? Twice murmured to himself, a little upset that Toga just left with Midoriya. Probably the cute freckles, he was of course ignored. Kirajiri, Tamura removed the hand from his face. Tell me about this weapon sensei left for me again meanwhile welcome to the temporary headquarters. Izuku gestured to the large portable trailer they were currently occupying. Where the hell are we? Dabai asked as he looked at one of the windows and noticed a lot of construction going on outside. An island out in the ocean I created. Izuku told them as he sat down at the desk of his makeshift office. I'm sure you noticed the tremors felt throughout the city recently that was you. Dabai raised a brow. Oh, he's only getting stronger, Toga gushed. This is where the main base of operations will be built, Izuku told them while ignoring the blonde girl's thirsty gay. It will serve as a home base, a training facility, and as a factory for the Titan robots you still haven't said what you need us for, Dabai noted. Don't get me wrong things seem to be stagnating in the Handman's League and I'm glad that you offered a better alternative, but why did you recruit us specifically? Izuku merely smiled in response. I want you two because of all the members of the League of Villains. You two were the most reliable and willing to listen to me, the green-haired teen explained. I want you two to work with another agent of mine that I recently recruited. The three of you will be my eyes and ears in the underground world of villainy. I now have my hand on the heroes, but you three will be my black hand on the villains. Izuku needed them to keep the villains in line while he kept the heroes in line. Now it made sense to Dabai. Apotheoses never liked to leave too much to chance. If he was to succeed in his eventual absolute control over the society of heroes then he would need control over the dark society of villains too. There were other groups out there besides the League of Villains. Izuku wanted them to basically do the dirty work for him. Not that they had a problem with that. Who is this agent of yours? Dabai asked. Where is he? Himiko asked as she glanced around the office. He's busy, Izuku grinned. I've been idle for a short period, but now while my base is being constructed I shall bring judgment swiftly down upon the false heroes. These next heroes on my list will serve as an example, just like Endeavor. Now dab I like the sound of that. Later city streets thank you. You're too kind. Mount Lady smiled at the adoring public. She had just successfully pinned down a villain who tried to rob a pharmacy. And after the police took him away she stuck around for the reporters to take pictures and to sign autographs. It was great being a hero. Ahem. Someone loudly fake coughed behind her. Mount Lady turned around in her normal sized form to see a tall man dressed in black armor, overcoat, and a strange black featureless mask that covered most of his head, leaving only one opening for his mouth. Mount Lady, on behalf of the HRD, you are required to come with me to face evaluation, the mystery man said in a rehearsed fashion. Evaluation. The female hero questioned. Yes evaluation, or sentencing if you prefer, the man repeated. In other words the boss, director Midoriya, wants to see you. And what does that little boy want with me? Mount Lady asked in a mocking tone. You're one of the heroes at the top of his list. She could see his grin through the mouth hole of his mask. You're on the chopping block Mount Lady. So come with me and face the boss's judgment just what sort of authority do you have? Who are you anyway? She demanded. I work for the HRD that's all you need to know. He shot back. Now are you going to come quietly? Please don't. Because I have permission from the boss to use force if necessary just who does that little brat think he hit? Mount Lady didn't like being talked down to especially in public in front of fans and reporters, so she tried to rudely shove the masked man away. That proved to be a big mistake. In one instance the man had dashed behind her with shocking speed. The hero felt a shallow cut on her cheek and when she spun around the man was holding a combat knife stained with a few drops of her blood. You tried to harm an agent of the HRD. That's really not going to help your case when you're in front of the boss. The man chuckled darkly as a tongue came out of the mouth hole of his mask to lick the blood. In the next moment Mount Lady suddenly lost control of her body. In front of everybody she collapsed like a puppet that just got its strings cut. Take her away boys. He ordered to someone she couldn't see from her position on the ground. A large metal foot entered her vision as something growled and bent down to grab her by the leg. The titan robot dragged the hero over to an armored truck where it roughly tossed her into the back where the two other heroes were sitting not paralyzed as opposed to her, because it seemed they surrendered themselves peacefully unlike her. And that makes three, the man said as he checked off the third hero on the list he was given. Midoriya wanted these three specifically to make a big show out of, in the same way that he made a show out of Endeavor's humiliating defeat and honestly he couldn't wait to watch it. Stepping into the passenger seat of the truck the vehicle quickly sped off leaving a confused and somewhat concerned crowd of fans who quickly started uploading what just happened to social media. The truck drove for about an hour until it stopped suddenly. By then the paralysis wore off allowing Mount Lady to move and look to see who else was brought in like her. 
To the left sat the snake hero Yuobami and across from her sat Jin Anachai also known as the hero, meteorologist weather dominator. Before she could ask them about how they the two of them were captured the doors to the armored trunk opened revealing three of those tall scary black robots standing there along with that masked agent. Get out, he ordered, and don't try to run. You won't get far, they could hear the amused grin in his voice. The three pros cautiously stepped out of the vehicle keeping wary eyes and the Titan sentries. Looking around they noticed that they were outside the front entrance of the Hero Public Safety Commission's central office. Waiting for them at the steps was Izuku Midoriya himself with a line of his robots behind him. The boy smiled as the heroes approached. Cameras were set up around the area, televising this live. Iwabami, Mount Lady, and Weather Dominator do you three know why you are here? Izuku asked the three who chose to remain silent. You're here because the three of you have failed to live up to the idea of what a hero should be. Two of you, he pointed to the women care more about fame and attention than stopping villains or saving lives. You on the other hand, Izuku turned to look at Weather Dominator. You disgust me more than these two combined, using your quirk to create localized weather events so you can report them. Not only that, but extorting agriculturists for money I don't know what you're talking about. Jin denied such allegations rather quickly. Really, Izuku placed a finger on his cheek, because you're very wealthy for a low-ranking hero and meteorologist. My mother left me a lot of money when she passed away. Jin quickly restated the excuse he always used. That's interesting considering your mother lives in a retirement home and is very much alive. Izuku smirked at him as he stepped closer to this corrupt man. You think I didn't do my research on you weather dominator? You changed your last name when you became a hero so no one looked too deep into your lies. One of the robots handed him a large envelope. Now this is especially interesting. He took out some photos he obtained a while back. Look at that it's you taking bribes from various agricultural businesses. Apparently you use your quirk so the crops get enough rain to grow, and the ones that refuse to give you money. You use your quirk to ruin their crops and destroy their business. He showed the cameras the incriminating photos so the whole world could see. Jin you didn't. Yuobami said shock evident on her face. Oh like you're one to talk you pompous media whore. Jin snapped at her. You know you'd be surprised what people who have been oppressed will tell you when you extend a helping hand and a promise to end their troubles. Izuku confessed to where he originally got this information. A simple visit to these business owners and a few hidden cameras was all it took to expose this man's crimes. Jin Anachai, you have been judged guilty of being a false hero and gross misuse of your quirk. Izuku flash warped forward before the man had a chance to react and grabbed his face with the gauntlet. Purple veins spread across his face and body as the hero screamed in pain as his quirk was extracted. The green-haired teen released him when it was over letting his unconscious body collapse like a rag doll. The two female pros watched in horror at what just happened. Iwabami quickly realized that they were next and quickly tried to talk her way out of this. Now I know what you must think of me, but I, the snake hero was cut off when a metal gauntlet covered her mouth. Nope, no excuses, Izuku said as he silenced her. You're just a celebrity not a hero, so what I'm about to do is completely justifiable. He activated the soul stone as the woman's screams were muffled by the device covering her mouth. At least you have your modeling career to fall back on. He scoffed as the snakes in her hair disappeared as her quirk was forcibly taken. After she fell to the ground green eyes turned to the last one left. In a panic Mount Lady tried to run only to blocked by a line of robots and the masked man. That hesitation cost her everything as Izuku warped behind her. Don't think because you're a new hero that you'll be given mercy. The director spoke. You just started and you already think you're some kind of star. It's a shame that hero school you went to didn't do anything to curb that ego. But then again none of them seemed to do that. Without hesitation he reached out and grabbed the back of her head. It was over in seconds and she too was tossed to the ground like the other two. Izuku then turned and looked to one of the cameras. He raised his hand and pointed directly at it. You're next. That was his warning to all the other corrupt and false heroes that he was coming for them before the cameras cut out. Wow, the masked man applauded. You know I think I like your method better than mine, he chuckled. I told you it will be a far better punishment to have to live as quirkless nobodies for the rest of their lives than to simply die. Izuku smiled at him. Live with the shame, rather than die as victims to your crusade is so much better isn't it stain. The man took off his masked helmet to reveal the hero killer himself. I think I'll miss the groveling they usually do before they die, Stain said as he looked at the three unconscious bodies with disgust. Oh we're just getting started, the wielder of the gauntlet told him while creating a portal for them. Come now, would you like to meet the two people you'll be working with? They're both big fans of your work, he gestured to the portal. T-O-D-O-R-O-K-I household Shoto. Dinner's ready, Fayumi said from the doorway of her brother's room. Shoto took one last look at the black card that came in the mail this Saturday morning addressed to him, before pocketing it to think about later. Father decided to join us and Natsuo is here too, she sounded nervous. Shoto nodded and followed his older sister to the dining room. Lately Anji Todoroki had kept quietly to himself. 
he probably had a lot to think about. What with losing his hero license, agency, the population's respect and his quirk in one fell swoop, Shoto walked in and his father's eyes immediately zeroed in on him for a brief moment. The hot and cold boy sat down at the opposite end of the table while his sister Fayumi sat to the left while Natsuo sat on the right as they usually did during these weekend dinners. The Todoroki family ate in silence. So how is your work-study program going? Fayumi asked to break the awkward quietness. It's going fine, Shoto responded quietly. Seeing that there wasn't much conversation to be had there she turned to her father. How have you been father? Fayumi realized that was probably the wrong thing to ask as she asked it. I lost my quirk how the hell do you think I feel? Enji practically snarled at her. It seemed he was still quick to anger. That hadn't changed yet. Do not talk to her that way. Shoto glared at his father letting a few embers emerge from between his fingers. Father and son stared each other down until the quiet snickering of Natsuo interrupted. What's so funny? The former hero snapped at his other son. It's just dot 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 you called the three of us failures. But in the end you're the biggest failure of all, Natsuo mocked. And now you're whining about being quirkless. As if it's the end of the world I will not be talked down to by a brat who couldn't even cut it as a hero. Enji growled at him. Says the guy that got his ass handed to him by a group of robots. Natsuo fired back. But the true irony is that it was a quirkless kid that took everything you cared about. I only wish Taoya was alive to see it. He hated you more than anyone. Enji slammed his fist into the table wishing he still had his quirk to put this brat in his place. His meal was suddenly frozen over stopping whatever rant was about to leave his mouth. Following the trail of ice it lead to the other end of the table where Shoto was silently eating his soba while keeping his bi-colored eyes locked onto his father's. Calm down, Shoto finally said after he finished eating. If you can't handle some harsh criticisms then Midoriya was right to rob you of your quirk and hero status you agree with that punk. The former hero snapped at his son. Yeah, I wasn't sure about his methods but they are getting good results, Shoto said boldly. You never deserve to be a hero. You only care about yourself and your ranking. His father was fuming at him now. Midoriya was right. You should have stopped caring about this feud with All Might. You should have just been a hero and been content with that. Because it doesn't matter in the end if you're the best. Having finished his meal and said his piece he stood up from the table and left the dining room. Natsuo looked at his younger brother with pride having stood up to the bastard while Fayumi looked at him with concern. The woman stood up from her seat bowing apologetically to her family and followed after him. Shoto, Fayumi walked into his room to see him staring at a black business card in his hand. I'm going away for a while Fayumi, Shoto suddenly spoke. I've been offered a position in a new hero program and I've decided to take it just please make sure you do what you think is right. Shoto turned to face his older sister. Whatever it is you plan to do I will, he said quietly while turning to look at the letter that came with the card. A logo at the top resembling a closed armored fist with an eye in the center and the letters H, R, and D at the bottom. Shoto Todoroki you've been invited join the new hero regulation department. I believe you'll make an excellent addition to the elite team bent on correcting this flawed hero society. As you probably imagine there are more people like Endeavor out there. People who like him don't take the role seriously and see it as a path to fame, glory, or wealth. I would like you and others to serve as an example of what a true hero should be. In the department you will be given exclusive training and benefits to help you become that hero. The offer is all yours. You can accept it or continue the slow trudge to heroism that you offers. I think you have great potential Shoto and I want to help you reach it. Call the number on the card if you wish to join. Izuku Midoriya, Director of the HR. DP. S. There is no time frame attached to the offer. My door is always open for you. The youngest Todoroki took a deep breath. He wanted to do this. He needed to do this. Midoriya understood what was wrong with the world and now had the power to fix it. Midoriya wanted real heroes and a real hero is what Shoto wanted to be. But could he trust Midoriya? That was the question. He had been thinking lately over everything that the dark green-haired teen had done. He built a device that gave him nearly limitless power so people will listen to him and take him seriously. He exposed the truth about All Might, beginning the process of people letting go of this ridiculous fake standard that the number hero represented. He then strong-armed the Prime Minister into legalizing the purging of false heroes in the form of his hero regulation department. Shoto had already heard the news concerning the three pro heroes and what happened, so it seemed that Midoriya was honestly trying to fix the problems using extreme methods but so far it looked like it was working. With his mind made up Shoto Todoroki pulled out his phone and called the number on the card. Yuraka, Izuku called from his temporary office. Can you bring me the file 11 degrees Celsius? He asked politely. Sure, Achako sifted through the folders on her own desk until he found the right one and walked into his office to hand it to him. Thank you, Izuku sat there with his jacket off and sleeves rolled up. His gauntlet of course was always on. Do you ever take that gauntlet off? The girl suddenly asked. It's just I always see you wearing it of course I don't take it off, Izuku frowned. 
Do you realize what they would do to me if I ever removed this? He waved his armored device at her. So how do you keep your arm clean? Izuku sighed at her question. There's a hydration and disinfectant mechanism built inside. He told her with complete seriousness. I thought of everything. All right. Achako grossed herself out imagining if he didn't have an internal cleaning method built into his invention. Damn these people are stubborn. Izuku cursed as he read the forms he submitted. Rejected again what are you trying to do this time? The gravity girl asked. Well I'm trying to have a ban put on hero merchandise, Izuku replied. All it does is further glamorize the hero profession and put money in the pockets of their agencies and the corporations that back them. That seems appropriate and fair. Your Raka thought about and that would be a good idea. They really shouldn't be encouraging children into these jobs without them fully understanding what they're getting into. It was all part of Izuku's plan to get people to be heroes for the right reason and not become celebrities. Yes, because at the end of the day pro heroes are really nothing more than public servants. Izuku scowled. Where are the firefighter figures? Or the police chief t-shirt? Or hell where's the action figure of me? This is a job not a marketing platform. He sighed in exasperation. Getting himself worked up again wouldn't help any. Some people in the Senate are obviously in bed financially with some of these companies. I just have to weed them out well when we get our own office building and more staff this department can get more done. Achako smiled pleasantly. Thank you again Izuku for hiring my parents' construction business it's nothing. I needed someone to build our branch office in the city while the fortress was handled by a different more private construction company, Izuku told her. Be that as may this job will help my family out immensely. And I am dot 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 just wanted to. Hiroraka blushed brightly and stepped around his desk. She quickly leaned down and gave him a quick peck on the cheek. Izuku's green eyes widened as his own face turned red. He placed a hand on the spot she just kissed. Thank you why your W welcome. He cleared his throat quickly and repeated. You're welcome. That was a little bit of the old him still in there somewhere. Anyway come look at this. He gestured to another folder on his desk. Achako opened it up and read it. Yeah that's not good. What she was reading was a rather slanderous article that someone wrote condemning Izuku's actions lately. Actually I think it's funny. He smirked. Just a bunch of sad rambling idiots that are afraid of change well you did take down two popular heroes recently and were better off without them. Look at this. He pointed to his computers where documents were open. Look how many heroes are getting their act together just to avoid being publicly humiliated and stripped of their quirk and status. The numbers showed the average of pro heroes that were working harder than ever. My method is working. Yet these fools are acting like I'm committing murder maybe you should do an interview. The brown-haired girl offered. I think my actions should speak for themselves. But maybe you're right, Izuku thought about. Maybe if people had it explained they could perhaps understand we need to find a media outlet that's fair to guests and won't try to persecute on live television, she thought about it while he groaned in annoyance. Going on some talk show was something he'd rather avoid. But maybe he could have it work in his favor. You. Eh. Dorms according to the former heroes Yuobami and Mount Lady. The two heroes have apparently lost their quirk after their encounter with director Midori. Yayurazu read from one of the articles that had been circulating lately. The young director has yet to comment on exactly how he's able to remove the quirks from people you don't think he'd do something like that to a student do you? Mina asked with concern. If the guy could take away the quirks of heroes he didn't like, then what about them? I bet he was going to do that to Bakugu that day he came here, Jiru commented. Luckily Aizawa sensei pulled him away just what the hell is his problem anyway. The pink girl scowled. I get it he was picked on and bullied for being quirkless. But that's no excuse to being a monster to those that had nothing to do with it in other worlds this is all Bakugu's fault. See you supply. That's not what I'm saying, Mina argued. Kirishima back me up here, you've talked to Bakugo about this right. Kirishima snapped to attention before dropping his normally positive demeanor. Actually I haven't talked to him since Midoriya came to visit, he sighed dejectedly. How do you talk to guy that you used to think only acted like an asshole when you find out that he actually is an asshole? Well we at least need to get his side of the story before we make accusations, Mina said. What side? He picked on a defenseless person, so he's clearly in the wrong. I'm not sure I want anything to do with him anymore. The spiky redhead argued back. Well we need to know the full story. Mina raised her voice. How about you go talk to him? You get his side of the story. Kirishima was getting rather angry now at her persistence. Stop yelling. Aizawa walked into the living area on his way out the door. I've been called away. I'll be back. So don't start a fight while I'm gone, he said before he exited the building. The students remained silent a bit before the pink girl spoke again. I can't, Mina finally said. If he really beat up a quirkless person for no reason what do you think he'll do to one of us if we stand up to him? You're afraid, Kirishima noticed. Of Bakugu. Yes, yes I am, the acid girl admitted. You, a principal's office we think we've found something. Nezu began his explanation. We noticed a usual amount of robots at this shipping yard, so I did a little digging what did you find? 
Tashinori asked. The principal grinned with hope. Izuku Midoriya is a genius. He created a device meant to be used against his gauntlet, Nezu said excitedly. No way. Even Tashinori was ecstatic to hear that. There was a way to physically beat him after all. There is hope. Yeah apparently he built this thing in secret in case the Infinity Gauntlet was ever removed and used against him. A friend in the Senate who has access to classified files slipped me a secret document that Midoriya wanted destroyed. The principal pulled out a copy to hand to him. He calls it the Anti-Gauntlet. According to the file its purpose is to absorb the energy from the stones and render the Infinity Gauntlet powerless. How would we get our hands on it? Aizawa asked. That's the part you're not going to like Shouta Aizawa, Nezu sighed. Let me guess, one of my students is going to be put in danger again. The homeroom teacher glared banefully. Not likely, we just need him to get in. Get the device and get out while we provide the distraction, Nezu told him. Who are you considering? Tashinori asked. Training room die. Katsuki blasted another boulder to bits. He had tried booking this training time with shitty hair, since he could physical absorb the damage of his explosion. But Kirishima wasn't talking to him anymore. In fact, no one in his class wanted anything to do with him anymore. Even Kaminari, Siro, and Ashido were avoiding him lately. On top of all that he had been forced to regularly attend counseling to help control his anger. You still seem pretty angry to me Kaken. That mocking voice spoke. He had yet to tell Hound Dog of this hallucination of Deku that wouldn't go away. Still practicing for your provisional license remedial class. The last thing society needs is you out there on the streets fighting crime. You are and always will be a danger to innocent lives, Deku said appearing before him still in the appearance of how he looked at the junkyard. I know better than anyone how dangerous you really are and now your classmates know it too I don't give a shit what they think. Katsuki snapped at the image his mind conjured. Ah but you do, Izuku smirked. How can you be the best if everyone ignores you? How will you get that attention and praise you crave so badly? Katsuki glared at this imaginary manifestation. You care about what they think of you. You care very badly what everyone thinks of you. Before he could continue to argue with this hallucination his teacher walked into the training. We leave in 30 minutes get changed and meet me in front of the school, Aizawa said blandly as he turned back around and left as quickly as he came. Katsuki slumped his shoulders and headed towards the locker room ready to face whatever his punishment would be. After he was clean and dressed he made his way to the front entrance where a racer head was waiting patiently for him. The man gestured to the car and Katsuki got in without a word. They drove through the city in silence. Both of them obviously preferred it that way to be honest. After half an hour they arrived at what looked like some kind of hospital or health center. Are you going to tell me what I'll be doing here? Bakugu asked gruffly. You'll see when we get inside. Aizawa said equally gruff. Gesturing for him to follow they made their way inside. Inside the lobby a woman, clearly a doctor going by the white coat, was there to greet them. Ah Aizawa glad you could make it. The woman greeted. Bakugu this is Dr. Higurashi. The woman smiled pleasantly at the blonde. She was an average heighted woman with dark brown hair tied in a bun and round black rimmed glasses on her face. You'll be working with her today your principal has informed me of why you are here. The woman frowned lightly. You may see this as a punishment, but I hope you'll come to see this more as an opportunity. She regained her smile as she led the two of them into the facility. I still don't know what it is you want me to do. Bakugu stared forward while they walked through the clean halls. You see young man this facility takes in special children, the doctor explained. We care for them, teach them, and help them in any way that we can. She paused before she explained the next part. Most of these children are young, but have had hard lives. Some were abandoned, born into abusive homes, or suffered at the hands of others. They walked into an observation room which contained a large one-way mirror that looked in on a classroom filled with small kids around ages 5, 6, or 7. Tell him the most important part, Aizawa said as he looked through the window. The kids you will be assisting me with, Dr. Higurashi began, are quirkless. Bakugu's eyes widened to ridiculous proportions as he turned his gaze from the woman to the class full of quirkless children. There are some rules you must abide by Bakugu, Aizawa began while ignoring the teen's look of shock. When you're not allowed to yell at the children, or physically harm them, the teacher paused for a moment. Also you're not allowed to use your quirk around them. That was actually one of the doctor's rules. The children are already struggling with depression, so best not remind them of what they don't have. How long do I have to do this? Katsuki swallowed nervously. As long as it takes, Aizawa said dryly. You. A development studio that's mine. Mei Hatsum placed another of her personal tools in the box. That's mine. She grabbed some of her blueprints. That's mine. Another set of tools. I brought this from home. She unplugged the coffee machine and placed it in another box. Hatsum, power loader tried to get her attention. Hatsum, he yelled this time making her stop and turn to him. Are you sure about this? I handed in my forms to the administration so yeah I am absolutely sure, May said excitedly. This is why I wanted to attend you in the first place to invent things for heroes by joining up with Izuku Midori. 
Howard Loader couldn't wrap his head around how she thought allying herself with that guy would allow her to accomplish her goals. Just the other day his student suddenly handed in her resignation or dropout papers to the principal, much to the shock of her teachers and the school staff. When asked why she simply said that she was offered a position in Midoriya's hero regulation department, May, that boy is crazy, how could she not see that? Crazy, May seemed offended by that. So just because he has big ideas and big goals he must be crazy. She slammed the box closed and turned around with a huff. Midoriya wasn't crazy, he was simply very ambitious. Thank you for everything sensei, but I need to follow my own path, May said before walking quickly out of the workshop. I just hope you realize what you're getting into before it's too late. Power Loader spoke quietly to the empty room. Part of him was glad that the studio wouldn't be blown up every other day. But another part of him would miss the girl and her antics. May Hatsum was definitely the most interesting student that he's had in a long time. Three days later is everyone in position. Aizawa spoke into his mouthpiece. Yes, multiple voices repeated. Good, I'm going over the plan one last time. The underground hero began. Nezu has hacked the camera feed of the shipping yard. So Midoriya will have no idea who is here today. So don't worry too much about being spotted. He heard the principal confirm his part of the plan through the headset. I'm going to go in with a disguise to distract the robots. Better they come after me than our unfortunate volunteer. He stressed that last part with great concern. This was the part of the plan that he hated. He turned to look at the student that stood beside him waiting for the plan to begin. Ida, as soon as the robots leave the area you dash in. You're looking for a large metal shipping container labeled 56. Tenya was chosen for this job as the agency that he was involved in for his work study was right down the street from the shipping yard. It was the perfect alibi, and Midoriya would never suspect a U.S. student would take his device. It was almost too perfect of a plan, something Aizawa felt uneasy about. There should be something in there that looks similar to Midoriya's gauntlet. Simply get it and get out. Do you understand Ida? I've got it Aizawa-sensei, the class rep confirmed. Remember if something happens or if something doesn't seem right I don't care about the device I want you to get out of there immediately. The underground hero warned. It's not worth your safety or life, do you understand? He said sternly. I understand. Ida nodded as he put his helmet on and walked out of the alley to get into position. I swear if something bad happens to him Nezu, Aizawa threatened his boss. Everything will be fine, Nezu's voice assured him. We planned this out perfectly then why do I still feel sick to my stomach? The underground hero still couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong about this whole situation. This was what they were looking for though, a mistake on Midoriya's part. All villains even the smart ones make mistakes at some point, but Midoriya was more than just a smart villain. Don't start the diversion until the interview begins, the principal reminded him while ignoring the man's worries. Currently an interview was about to go live featuring the wielder of the Infinity Gauntlet himself. They decided to use the time that Izuku was on the air to swipe this anti-gauntlet right out from under his nose while he was busy answering questions. Even with his warping abilities he wouldn't just suddenly leave the interview, at least according to the psychological profile that Nezu did on him. I have the channel on. It will start in few minutes. Aizawa placed the helmet over his head that would keep his face and identity hidden. He was wearing a dark jumpsuit that was very different than his normal costume and lacked his patented capture scarf. There couldn't be anything that would leave him recognizable. It's starting go. 80 Hello my name is Shino Ryunasuk of J News Nightly. And today we have a very exciting interview. A man with green skin and dragon-like horns sticking out of his head spoke with joy. Director Midori, the young head of the government's new hero regulation department has agreed to come on and speak to us about his recent actions. He paused before looking to the left of the stage. Please welcome Izuku Midori. The camera panned over to reveal said teenager standing there in all his glory, wearing his pressed gray suit and gauntlet still secured to his left hand. Good afternoon Ryunasuke. Izuku greeted him with a smile, reaching out with his right hand to shake the man's offered one. He took a seat across from the interviewer after introductions were out of the way. So let's begin. You were hired by the Prime Minister over a month ago to be the director of the Hero Regulation Department or HRD as it's taken to being called. The man tried to avoid the awkwardness of talking to a teenager as if he was an adult, but it was obvious. Yes that is correct, Izuku nodded. So what is the purpose of this department? What does it do? Ryunasuke asked. Our job is simple. To regulate and reform the hero profession. Izuku explained. Removing heroes that don't fit the new standards and elevating those that do I think I speak for most of the population when I say we understand Endeavor and Weather Dominator. After what they've done, but why you Yuabami and Mount? Lady, I don't think they deserved what they got that's interesting that you can't see how those two women grossly misrepresented what it means to be a hero. Izuku remarked with amusement. Those two cared more about their popularity than they did doing their job. Last I checked being a hero isn't the same as being a celebrity you may have a point. But, the interviewer was cut off. No I do make a point. That's what I'm doing is making a point, Izuku said a bit harshly. 
but removing a person's quirk. Don't you think that's a harsh punishment? Ryunasu questioned. You know I'm actually quirkless, the teen supplied. You make it sound like being quirkless is some kind of torture. Is that what you think being quirkless is like? W who is that man in the mask that works for you? Ryunasu quickly changed the subject to avoid answering the question, which Izuku picked up on. That is a special agent of mine. His identity is classified. The gauntlet user explained. He secretly keeps an eye on the heroes for me and brings me information that they would normally keep quiet about. Izuku smiled. For example, the amount of property damage caused by Mount Lady whenever she uses her quirk in public or the fact that Yuobami makes millions of dollars off her products and modeling that's common knowledge. You're just exacerbating things people already know for your own benefit. The interviewer accused. Really? Common knowledge you say? Is that why the agencies use money and influence to keep these facts out of the media? Izuku accused right back. In fact anything that would make these people seem less heroic seems purposely kept out of the news. I think you're just assuming things without any proof, Ryuanasuk said thinking he had him on the ropes. Is it not true that you are attempting to ban hero merchandise? He suddenly asked changing the subject and shifting the focus once again to try and make the boy look bad. Yes I am. Izuku smirked seeing the game the man was playing. But unlike Ryuanasuk he had a secret weapon. I think it's ridiculous that public servants have action figures and t-shirts. All the merchandise only further glamorizes the profession of heroism and misrepresents what it means to be a hero but if this law gets put into effect you'll hurt a lot of corporations and hero agency. The man added, I'm sorry I thought heroes were meant to protect civilians not their corporate backers. Izuku fired back. Speaking of backers and dirty money, the boy smirked wider as he reached around his chair and pulled out an envelope. Remember when you said removing a hero's quirk was a harsh punishment? Well in the case of Mount Lady and the Snake Hero I gave them the option of earning their quirks back by telling them to donate their time and energy to charity or perhaps community service. I even attempted to put them in contact with a wellness center that takes in depressed quirkless children that I've been financially supporting for quite some time. He had taken the leftover money he had after he finished his gauntlet from his time as a villain and donated it to the program. Dr. Higurashi was very grateful for said donation and when asked for his name he just told her to call him Deku. It was the first name that came to mind. Those two women have yet to do anything of the sort and have instead used their time, money and influence to start a smear campaign against me. Well what would you expect when you're the one who, Izuku cut the man off? They have paid to have articles written condemning me for my actions and they even paid off a certain reporter to steer this interview in a way that paints me in a bad light. Isn't that right Shino Ryunasuk? That's not true, the man denied. We have a thing called integrity here at J News. Izuku simply opened the envelope and pulled out largely printed photographs of Yuobami and Mount Lady discussing things in a green room with Ryunasuk and then a picture of them handing the man untraceable cash. I'm sorry dot 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 what were you lying about? Izuku cocked his head in a coy fashion. My agent is very good at what he does isn't he? He had purposely had stained spy on them, having a good idea of what they were up to. That was the whole reason he agreed to this interview in the first place. L let's a dot 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 let's cut to a commercial. The interviewer was sweating now. Nope. Keep rolling. Izuku belayed those orders with his own. The camera operators were more afraid of Midoriya than they were of losing their jobs so they kept going like he said. Don't you think the people should know that not only are their heroes corrupt but their media heads are also just as corrupt and self-serving? The dragon-faced man remained silent. Now then I'm going to say what I came here to say. Izuku turned to the camera. All I'm trying to do is to give the people heroes that they deserve. Not some pompous celebrities or monsters that abuse their quirks and status for personal gain. Ryunasuk was completely ignored now as Izuku pointed his index finger at the camera. This is your fault all of you who let the hero profession rot and become what it is today. If anyone has a problem with my methods and wants someone to blame, simply look in a mirror. Meanwhile as soon as the interview started Aizawa put on his disguise and started to move towards the shipping yard. He spotted the tall black imposing titans guarding the front entrance. Honestly for a genius Midoriya was incredibly stupid sometimes. The fact that he had robots guarding this yard was like putting a big sign out that there was something important hidden here. It still seemed too good to be true to a razor head though. With a long overhand toss he threw a cluster of smoke grenades at the machines. The robots turned their heads tracking where the grenades came from until they spotted him. With a growl the titans began stomping towards him. Aizawa turned and tanned towards a nearby building tossing more smoke bombs behind him to keep their full attention. Using a grappling gun to reach the roof quickly. The robots promptly followed by climbing the side. Ida now. He ordered into his communicator. The boy quickly ran towards the unprotected gates and with his engines propelling him forward took a big leap over it. Dashing through the shipping yard Ida's eyes scanned left to right searching for the container labeled 56. He noticed a surprising lack of robots inside the yard, but he didn't have time to ponder that for long as he was on a time limit. 
There it is. Ada finally found the one he was looking for. A dark green metal shipping container with the correct number on the side. Glancing around for any possible guards or titans he quickly made his way to it. Pulling the levers, he opened the container and finally saw what they sought. A glass container containing a platinum gauntlet similar to Midoriya's, but the stones were blank and colorless. Ada walked into the container, never noticing the portal that formed in the air above it. Opening the surprisingly unlocked case he reached in and grabbed the device. Ada have you found it yet? Aizawa asked though the communicator. Yeah I have it, the class rep responded. Good, get out there now, the teacher ordered. Suddenly the communication was cut and Ida nearly fell over when something lifted the container he was in up into the air. Ida, Ida, Shota Aizawa shouted into his mic. He had safely escaped the robots by hiding atop a different building that overlooked the shipping yard. With a pair of binoculars he was able to see what was happening. The shipping container that his student was inside of was being lifted into the air by a telekinetic force and pulled into a portal. What the hell is going on? Nazu said Midoriya wouldn't notice until it was too late. I don't understand the interview is still going on live. Unless, the principal suddenly realized that they were deceived from the very beginning of this plan. Elsewhere Ada panicked as he felt the container suddenly land on solid ground. He clutched the gauntlet to his chest protectively, as it was their only hope at defeating Midoriya. Tenya Ada, would you mind stepping out of there? A familiar voice called. The young man held the gauntlet tightly as he reopened the doors of the shipping container and walked out. He was no longer in the yard. The container was moved to a whole new location. A large high-ceilinged conference room with a long table in the center. At the head of it sat Izuku Midoriya with his fingers interlocked together and to his right occupying two of the chairs sat Ochako Yuraka and Shoto Todoroki. While Ada wasn't surprised to see Yuraka here, Todoroki was a huge shock. You're just in time for the end of the show. Izuku smiled and grabbed a remote control. It was then that Ada noticed the large monitor screen above and behind Midoriya, playing the interview that was supposed to be live. He spun around in his chair to watch the rest. The Prime Minister gave me full authority to deal with corrupt heroes any way I see fit. Soon you all will see that this is all for the better. The Izuku on the television paused before finishing his speech. But until then I don't think you've all been properly made aware of how bad the heroes of today really are. So starting tomorrow I'll be bringing to light all the dirty secrets the Hero Public Safety Commission tried to keep out of the media. The real Izuku flipped the screen off before turning back around in his chair to face Ida. I bet you're confused, Midoriya copped his head. The interview was never live was it? The class rep was finally starting to put the pieces together. This was a trap. We filmed it yesterday, and I ordered the J News to not air it till the next day and claimed that it was live. Izuku noticed the death grip that Ida had on the anti-gauntlet. Will you let that thing go already? Using the reality stone's power he ripped the gauntlet out of the other boy's hands and slowly crumpled it into a ball. Aluminum and plastic rocks. Any kid with a decent allowance could buy these materials at your local craft store. He tossed what he now revealed as nothing more than a crumpled prop behind him. I mean come on. Did you really think I would build a device that could be used against my infinity gauntlet? Ada's eyes widened further as he took a cautious step backwards. I purposely planted false information for Nezu and set up the hook and bait at that specific location close to your internship because I knew they would use you while someone else provided the distraction. Izuku revealed the workings of his elaborate trap. Why? Why would you bring me here? Ada's eyes went from Izuku to Yuraka who looked back at him with concern, and then to Shoto who looked apathetic. To talk, he gestured towards the seat next to Todoroki. Seeing that this was all a trap from the start and he probably wouldn't get far if he ran Tenya decided to cooperate by sitting down and removing his helmet. At least until he found a way out of this. Relax no one is going to get hurt here. After this meeting is over you'll be returned to the city safely Ed is here now, so can we begin? Todoroki asked with a small amount of impatience. Soon, we're just waiting on three more people, Izuku supplied. The group heard a noise coming from a set of double doors on the left side of the room. Ah, uh, that should be them now. The doors swung open first revealing a grinning blonde girl named Toga Himiko. Then another known member of the League of Villains called Dabai walked in behind her. The patched up man's eyes widened for a brief moment when he spotted the Todoroki boy before riding himself. An action that didn't go unnoticed by the dual quirk wielder. It was the third individual that had Ida standing up out of his chair. The hero killer stained in the flesh and looking as murderous as ever. What is this? Tenya demanded. Shoto remained calmed, but he too wanted to know. The only one not curious was Yuraka for she was already told of the plan and knew ahead of time who would be joining them. Sit down Ada, Izuku ordered calmly. There will be no fighting here and if it starts I won't hesitate to end it. Trust me when I say you don't want that, he threatened. Ada glared at him, but slowly complied by returning to his seat without another word. Izuku smiled at him then turned to the three newcomers. Now if you three would be kind enough to also take a seat so we can begin. Toga of course immediately took a seat to Midoriya's immediate left, directly across from Achako. 
Dabai sat down next across from Todoroki and Stain sat parallel to Ida not the least bit intimidated by the boy glaring daggers at him. Now then let's begin. Izuku clapped his hands gaining their attention. I'll keep this simple. The reason I've called you six here is because I've chosen you to be the first of the enforcers for my new department. I'm calling it the Knights of Balance. The main purpose of course being to restore balance to the world of heroes. The secondary purpose is of course to serve as examples of what heroes should be. And that is where you three come in, he pointed to the three on his right. I think you three have the potential to be true heroes and I want to help get you there with exclusive training, promotion and better gear than what you could provide and what exactly do you need them for? Shoto asked while eyeing the three villains. I need them to keep the villains of society in line during this transition. Izuku sighed. Look I'm not stupid. There are more villain groups out there and I don't expect them to remain idle while I slowly take apart and put back together our messed up hero system. In fact I bet some of them even prefer the corruption and will probably attempt to throw a wrench or two in my plans. So Stain, Dabai and Toga will work from the shadows of society and bring these villains down from the inside. Don't worry I've ordered them not to kill anyone and that goes double to our former hero killer here. He leveled Stain with a look and the man scowled in displeasure but didn't protest. While they are busy I want you three to become the faces of the HRD. He smiled warmly at his would-be knights. The first of a new generation of heroes you already have our answer. Yuraka told him while Shoto nodded in agreement. They were both ready and willing to help give rise to the new standard of heroes. The only one who wasn't convinced was Tenya. How can someone like you create a better hero system? Ida argued. What gives you the right? It's not about whether or not I have the right. I'm the only one who can fix it, because I'm the only one with the will to act. The gauntlet wielder scowled at him. If it wasn't for me everyone would have remained blind to the problem and the corruption until it grew so bad that there would be no fixing it. Sometimes when a forest grows sick it must be burned down to give rise to new life. Tell me Tenya Ida would you prefer the corrupt hero system to the better one I want to create? You'll have to forgive me Midoriya. Ada glared at him through his glasses. But the only corruption I see is here in this room. He leveled each person in the meeting room with an equal sharp gaze before sliding back in his chair. If that's all I think I'll take my leave. Without another word he quietly and respectfully left through another set of doors. Yuraka was about to chase after him but Izuku stopped her. Let him go, the green-haired teen told her. He doesn't know he's on an island and can't leave on his own, he chuckled lightly. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves I'll be back in a few minutes. Izuku stood up and opened a portal behind him that he vanished through leaving the five of them in a very awkward silence. Outside Ada wandered the building and construction zones passing by more robots than actual workmen who were all too busy to tell him where the exit was. He had trouble navigating his way around the labyrinth of corridors and briefly wondered if he should just use his quirk to sprint around until he found the exit. His train of thought ended when a portal opened in front of him and out stepped Midoriya holding a digital tablet. You look a little lost. Izuku smiled waving him over. Come, let's take a walk and I'll send you home after. Ida didn't want to rely on him or have to spend any more time near this person. But without knowing where he was exactly he had no other option. Following the other boy Ida remained silent while he talked about the base that was still being constructed around them. We just finished the main building yesterday. By morning the labs will be done I'm sure Hatsum will be pleased to hear that when she arrives. Izuku continued to chat away as if he was conversing with a friend. I'm hoping by later this week the training facility and robot factory can be completed and I can finally cut the red ribbon on our new base you mean your base? Ida corrected. I like to think of it more as a home. It's always good to have a home, a place to belong. Don't you think? Izuku asked. Living a life without purpose or a place to belong, can you image what that must feel like? Why are you doing this? Ida snapped at him. I'm trying to put you in my shoes, make you see things from my perspective, Izuku explained. You've come a long way since I saved you from Stain. But you're not quite there yet what do you mean I'm not there yet? Tenya raised a brow at the other boy's words. You're so close to seeing the world as I see it. Izuku calmly walked around him. You've already seen the way I exposed all might and endeavor. I've brought all the lies of this hero society to light and now I'm trying to reform it into what it should have been all along. All you need to do is just see it and acknowledge it for yourself. What if I can't see it? Or more accurately what if he didn't want to see it? You already did see it. You just chose to ignore it like most people do. Izuku smiled and held out his digital tablet screen. So how is your brother doing? He suddenly asked as if to seemingly change the subject. Leave him out of this. Ida fumed. It must be terrible to watch your once wonderfully heroic brother reduced to a wheelchair. Izuku sighed sadly. Poor Ingenium. The once incredible fast turbo hero now had just slug on wheels. He saw it coming and could have done any number of things to stop the punch headed towards his face but let it happen instead. Ada's fist met Midoriya's cheek and nearly sent him tumbling back. Luckily Izuku had enough grace and poise to keep his feet firmly on the ground. How dare you talk about him like that? 
Ada shouted as his body shook with rage. If you just listened for a moment you would hear the point I'm trying to make. The gauntlet user wiped the blood from his lip with his thumb, not even bothering to heal such minor wound. Did you know your brother didn't have to be confined to a wheelchair? Seeing the look on Tenya's face he concluded that his brother must not have told him. Yes he was offered an experimental treatment that would at least give him back the ability to walk. Izuku showed him the tablet screen revealing files, documents, and schematics of a set of exo legs designed to be fitted to his brother's lower body. Unfortunately the technology is expensive, even for your family. And when he filled out an application to the Hero Public Safety Commission to help pay, they rejected it. Izuku paused to let that sink in. Why would they do that? Ida asked. He wanted to refuse this boy's claims. But the proof was right there in his hand. He saw the application and immediately recognized his brother Tensei's signature. Well normally the H. P. S. C. would help severely injured heroes with medical expenses. That is as long as the medical procedures will eventually lead to said person's return to their hero profession. Izuku explained the lesser known policies of the government. Your brother Tensei's exo legs would only have given him the ability to walk again as the technology has yet to get to the stage where he could go back to being a hero. So they deemed him useless just like everyone in the world deemed quirkless people like me useless and discarded us like trash to be forgotten and unnoticed. Izuku handed the shaking taller boy the tablet so he could read through it all himself. Do you want to know what they used the money that they could have used on Tensei for? Not long after his request was denied the hero endeavor, in a fight against a group of villains, burned down a lot of businesses in the crossfire. They spent more money on paying off the business owners, buying their silence and compliance, than what they could have used giving your brother some of his mobility and dignity back. How did you find all this out? Edo was furious with the way the HP. SC discarded his heroic older brother, but he needed to know how Midoriya came by such information. You're talking to the director of the hero regulation department. Izuku chuckled with pride. Once I gained my position I was granted legal access to all the classified files. All the dirty little secrets the HPS. C tried to keep out of the public to make the heroes look clean are now at my fingertips H how could they be so callous? It a collapsed to his knees as his hands tightened around the screen. There it is. Izuku kneeled down with him. He placed his gauntlet-covered hand on the other boy's shoulder. Now you finally see what's wrong. Corruption. Heroes are not heroes and those who are weak or useless don't matter in this world. Taking the tablet from Ida's hands he continued. I reopened your brother's application just last week. With me backing it he'll get those exo legs and soon be able to walk again. And who knows, maybe if a certain director with a few connections and influence could hire a couple scientists to advance the technology in a few years dot 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 we could perhaps see the return of the turbo hero ingenium. Ada's teary eyes snapped up to look at the green-haired teen. Why are you doing this? To make me join you. Tenya wanted so badly to believe that Midoriya was a villain at heart that would stoop so low. He really wished he could write him off as that. It would be so less complicated. Of course not. Tensei will be helped whether you agree to join me or not. Izuku shrugged as he stood back up. It's your choice. He gestured to the open space behind him. You walk out of here and be done with all of this. I wouldn't hold it against you. I just wanted to see a great hero like Ingenium be given what he is rightfully owed. What about your crimes? All the horrible things you've done all in the name of this new better society you envision? Ida inquired as he too went back up on his feet. Tenya, I'll confess. I do get great satisfaction in punishing corrupt heroes. Izuku admitted. I'm only human, therefore I'm flawed. I did enjoy it greatly to see the look on All Might's face when I revealed his lies to the world. Izuku sighed as he looked away. I had to do a lot of terrible things to get where I am today. Some of it I loved, but other things like hurting my mother and causing Yuraka to get expelled I regret with all my heart. Izuku gave him a pleading look. I'm not going to lie. Reforming this hero-controlled society is going to be a messy affair and I can't do it all by myself. That's why I need your help. I need Achako and Shoto. As much as you detest Stain I need him too. That includes Dabai and Toga as well. He held his right hand out in front of Tenya. This is going to be a group effort. So Tenya Ada dot 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 will you be a part of it or not? On one hand Izuku Midoriya had a point about what was wrong with society and heroes, but there had to be other methods to fix it. All this violence and robbing people of their quirks was just wrong no matter what angle you looked at. Midoriya wanted revenge against the society that rejected him that much was clear to Ida and this is how the boy planned to get that revenge. To the young hero in training it didn't matter how the other teen tried to justify himself for he knew in his heart that Midoriya was wrong about how he wanted to go about this change. It was then that Tenya got an idea in his head. While Izuku couldn't be stopped physically and politically, what if instead he was taken down from within his own organization? At the very least he could supply people like Aizawa and All Might information on the inner workings of Midoriya's department. Perhaps he could even find out how the gauntlet worked and its potential weaknesses, but that they might be able to stop him once and for all. 
Perhaps Tenya could even convince Shoto and Achako to see reason as well with enough time. I can't let an opportunity like this go. Ada thought as he reached out to shake Midoriya's offered hand. All right I'll see where this goes. But if something happens that I don't agree with then I'm out. He was fully committing to the role of teen convinced to another side of ideology. I can agree to those terms. It's not like you're under a contract or anything. Izuku laughed believing that he had finally won Ida over. The president of class 1 retained his serious face. But on the inside his head he was already swarming with concerns. He had no idea what the future held now or what would become of him should this plan backfire. But for now it was the best shot he had. Tashinori in his gaunt form watched the heroes take care of the villain fairly easily from a safe distance. The sole reason those pros were having such an easy time was the fact that they had a troop of titan robots backing them up. All Might had even watched one of the machines dive protectively in front of a group of civilians to shield them from a hail of bullets and shrapnel before he could even transform and intervene. The hero just quietly walked away keeping his trench coat and hat on so no one would recognize him. As he made his way through the crowds he pulled out his phone to continue reading the online articles. Teenage genius ushers in a new technological age titans. The mechanical peacekeeping force Izuku Midoriya sets new standard for professional heroes. These were some of the headlines of the articles that have been circulating lately. After it was revealed that the disgraced pro heroes that Midoriya exposed were the ones paying to have slanderous articles written about him. New more progressive journalists who kept an open mind and non-biased agenda were writing articles about honest opinions of the boy. There were still some negative things written, but all the positive things he accomplished were outweighing them in the eyes of the public. But the way things have been going lately it almost seemed like the city didn't even need the symbol of peace anymore. Crime was decreasing. Villains were being rounded up in droves, and robots were daily patrolling the streets keeping civilians safe and assisting heroes at every turn. It looks like some good came from young Midoriya's scheming and plotting after all. No matter how much his old teacher tried to convince him he still didn't see young Midoriya as evil. A villain yes, but he didn't think that made the boy inherently evil in his book. He had discussed it with his successor Mirio, and they both came to the same conclusion that Izuku was just looking for the one thing that he had been denied his whole life, purpose and meaning. As someone who was once in the boy's shoes Tashinori could understand what it was like. It was true that he had forgotten, but lately the more he looked at Midoriya the more of his past quirkless self he saw in him. It always hurt to wake up every morning in a world where the majority were born with something that made them unique, to have nothing that made him stand out or special, to wonder if he was born a mistake or a cruel joke from the universe, to feel like he didn't fit in. Part of Tashinori almost didn't want to stop Midoriya, because in some ways the boy was right. However he knew it was only a matter of time before Izuku crossed the line and he did when he took those hero's quirks. He couldn't allow that vile quirk all for one to exist yet again in any shape or form or in anyone's possessions no matter who it was. Not after everything he did to finally put that man behind bars. He owed it to his master and all the previous vessels of one for all to put a stop to it. If that meant going all out to defeat Izuku Midoriya then so be it. He would just have to make it up to him some way when this was all over. The island and here they come. Izuku waved his gauntlet and created three portals in front of him. From each came one of the three members of his Knights of Balance, Todoroki, Yuraka, and Ida. The three former U.S. students came each carrying a couple bags and suitcases. Not only did they have to leave their school, but part of the agreement was that they had to live here at Midoriya's new fortress while they trained until they were ready. Shoto's dad Inji was furious that his son dropped out of Yue. He told Shoto that as his masterpiece it was his duty to become the number one hero since he had his quirk stolen. Of course the dual quirk wielder told his father to blow it out his ass and that he'd be the hero he wanted to be and not what his father thinks he made him for before handing him his legalized emancipation papers. As for Yuraka, her decision was even harder. She finally had to step forward and tell her parents that she is working for Midoriya. At first they were afraid for their daughter's safety, but she reminded them that it was just as dangerous being a hero in training. Plus Izuku had much better security than Yue, an army of robotic enforcers and the added protection from the government. Ida had to let his family know what was going on as well, and explain why he was leaving Yue they took it pretty well. Though his brother Tensei was very worried about his decision to act as a spy within the HR, D. Ida assured him that he had everything under control and that Midoriya would be none the wiser. Welcome everyone to HQ, he gestured to the large island fortress around them. Finally finished it this morning. Come on I'll give you the tour, Izuku said with the excitement and enthusiasm of a kid on Christmas morning. Leave your things, something will get them. The group of teenagers did just that and followed after their new leader. Izuku conducted them around the complex, showing them the automated Titan factory, the lab, the workshop, and the living quarters. The tour ended at what he called the training area. Shall we get started? Midoriya smiled at them. What are you talking about? Todoroki questioned. I thought we'd break in our new training facility with a little group combat practice. 
Izuku smiled as he as he led his new elite force through the finally complete island base. No time like the present. He thought the first thing they should do as a group would be a bit of sparring to see if they learned anything since the last time they fought. You think this training facility you built will accommodate all of us? Todoroki asked with a skeptical gaze. Izuku just chuckled lightly at his question while Yuraka did the same. She had seen the plans after all. Why don't you take a look for yourself and then judge? Izuku led them to a large metal door. Upon their approach the doors slowly opened revealing a huge open training room. The walls, floor and high ceiling seemed to be made of identical square metal panels and the room was lit with solar-powered lights scattered above them. The gauntlet user pulled out a small remote and pressed a few buttons. The group watched as the panels mechanically rearranged themselves forming platforms, levels, walls, and barricades. Tada, impressive Todoroki complimented. That's right and fully reinforced to withstand even the most powerful quirks. Izuku boasted the capabilities of his state-of-the-art training room. Now then go changed and we can begin. A set of panels in the wall opened revealing an entrance way to what they assumed were changing rooms. When the three came out they were dressed in training jumpsuits similar to their former school's gym uniform. But these were grey with the symbol for Izuku's department printed in white on the back. There was also some elbow and knee pads attached. As they walked back into the large open room they were surprised to see that Midoriya had also changed from his suit and was waiting for them. He was dressed in a black tank top. Black workout shorts with black leggings underneath that were cut with holes for the heels and toes, and a single fingerless glove on his right hand opposite his gauntlet. Wait are we training with you? Ada was surprised when he expected their first training exercise would be against some of those robots of his. Even Todoroki was caught off guard, but it didn't seem that odd to him. Yuraka of course wasn't that surprised really. Before gaining his position he had helped train her in some new fighting moves and other ways to use her quirk. Well of course, Izuku said nonchalantly. I believe in a more hands-on approach. Plus this is the best way for me to see how much you've improved since the junkyard and what areas you need to work on. He gestured for the three of them to step forward. Once they did the metal panels they stood on were raised about a foot high along with a large even expanse. The whole thing clearly resembled the same square fighting platform from the US Sports Festival. Now first each of you is going to have someone on one spars and hopefully with time permitting we'll have a group exercise. Izuku smiled warmly at his knights. So who wants to volunteer to go first? Without hesitation Shoto Todoroki stepped forward. The other two stepped off the ring to watch from the sidelines. Now then the rules are simple. Free use of your quirk. First to be knocked out of the ring or pinned down loses, the green-haired gauntlet wielder explained. Also if you can't go on feel free to tag out with someone else can we start this already? Shoto asked impatiently. Shoto versus Izuku ready whenever you are. Izuku barely got the words out when a glacier of ice suddenly erupted towards him. Lo, he shattered the ice was a simple one for all powered backhand. Not very sportsmanlike I wasn't aware you wanted a fair fight. Todoroki remarked sarcastically. I don't. In fact come at me with every trick you have, Midoriya taunted. A moment later a torrent of flames shot towards him like a spear. Izuku leaned back to dodge, but was unprepared for the floor to suddenly turn icy, nearly making him slip and fall. Correcting his balance the gauntlet user quickly melted the ice using the reality stone. Todoroki, not willing to give his opponent a moment of breath, followed up with a ball of fire hurled at Izuku's chest. The green-haired teenager used his right hand to catch it instead of his gauntlet protected left, much to the shock of his opponent and the two spectators. Energy Conversion Black and purple energy bolts emerged from his hand and arm, attaching to the ball of fire-like tentacles. The bicolor-haired boy watched with curiosity and unease as the heat from his attack was sucked away until it fizzled out into mere embers. Seeing the look on his opponent's face Midoriya decided to satisfy his curiosity. Oh I'm sorry I don't think I ever explained. The soul stone allows for me to use any quirk that I've taken. Izuku smirked at him. That was one of them called energy conversion. It converts any energy, heat, electricity, or even kinetic and converts into another form of energy. For example, he held his hand out and created a ball of raw power glowing a light purple with black sparks dancing around it. Catch, he called, hurling it at Todoroki without hesitation. Damn it, Shoto scowled as he erected a wall of ice. A ball of energy impacted it, nearly shattering it if the dual quirk user didn't reinforce his wall with more ice. The fight continued on with Todoroki attempting to gain the upper hand. Yet to his frustration it seemed Midoriya had a counter to everything he did. Any ice that came near him was either shattered with his near all-might level of strength or melted into water by the power of the reality stone. Fire was also useless, for the heat was always leached away by that energy-converting quirk Midoriya claimed to have appropriated and thrown back at him. Don't tell me you haven't learned anything since the last time we fought. Izuku taunted harshly with a disappointed gaze. Actually I did, Shoto said as he pointed both his hands at Midoriya. First he cooled the air between himself and his opponent. Then he followed up by rapidly heating the air. 
The end result was a large superheated blast sent directly at the gauntlet user. Izuku took the blast head out of sheer respect for the other boy's inventive attack. Using the space stone he projected his protective barrier outwards in front of him like an umbrella, amplifying it with the power stone to tank the other boy's attack. The collision nearly blew away the two onlookers from the sidelines. Very good. Izuku complimented him as he stepped out of a cloud of smoke. You've been learning how to use your fire IC. He put emphasis on the word your, reassuring Shoto again that it was still his power and not endeavors. But so have I. Black sparks formed around his right hand before it was engulfed in flames, hell flame to be exact. With what was once the number two hero's quirk Izuku launched an arc of fire at Shoto. Todoroki panicked for a moment seeing those familiar flames bearing down on him. The very sight of it was giving him the worst kind of deja vu. However instead of cowering in fear he faced it head on like Midoriya always did. Using as much ice he could produce Shoto completely overwhelmed the fire, nearly giving himself frostbite in the process. Unfortunately he was too drained to dodge or block the oncoming foot that kicked him in the chest and pinned him to the metallic floor. So then, Izuku smiled as he kept him down with his foot. What did you learn? You're too powerful. Shoto glared at him in frustration at not being able to put a scratch on his opponent. It made him feel so weak after everything he's been through. There's no such thing as too powerful, Izuku corrected him. This is what it's like to fight me when I'm prepared. Last time we fought I was caught off guard and had to improvise. This time I was mentally prepared for everything you could throw at me. He bent down and poked Todoroki in the forehead. That is your greatest tool. Any idiot can throw their quirk around. But if you know not just the ins and outs of your own quirk but your opponents as well you'll always have the advantage. He removed his foot and extended his hand out to help the other boy up. You've improved in leaps I would say. Todoroki willingly took his hand as well as his advice. Now who's next? Midoriya glanced towards Yuraka and Ida. Yuraka, a fight between us wouldn't be a good representation of your new skill set. How about you fight Ida here? Achako versus Tenya the two stepped up to the platform as Izuku and Shoto walked off of it. Yuraka was smiling and bubbly as she always was even when facing her friend Ida. Aren't you forgetting something? Midoriya asked. Oh, my staff. Yuraka wanted to smack herself for being so forgetful. It's alright. Izuku made a small portal directly above her. The new staff that he made for her, since her previous one was confiscated by her former school, came falling out of it. Without even looking Achako caught it with one hand, giving it a quick spin as she turned to face her opponent. Ada almost took a step back at the expression change on her face. She looked so serious and focused, the complete opposite of how she looked a moment ago. And, begin. Izuku gave them the go-ahead to start the fight. Ada wasted no time and rushed at her with the speed his quirk granted him. When he was inches away from Yuraka, at the last possible second the brown-haired girl dipped forward out of the way of his charge. With a single swipe of her staff she nearly bashed his face in. Stay on your toes Ida, Midori advised from the sidelines. She's quick on her feet, Ida thought as he evaded her swings as best as he could. Quicker than she ever was before. The gravity girl suddenly pole vaulted over him using her metal staff. Immediately Tenya whipped around expecting her to be mounting an attack from behind, but was caught off guard when she was not there. A grapple claw attached to a tether wrapping around his torso was his only clue to her whereabouts. Following the line he found her floating up in the air above him. She must have used her quirk on herself the moment she jumped over his body. Newton drop. Iroraka shouted the name of her new move as she yanked herself down at Tenya while deactivating her quirk. Ada was so taken by surprise that he couldn't stop the feet that plowed into his chest, knocking the air out of his lungs and slamming him on the floor. Achako pinned his body down with her own, placing her right elbow on his throat. All right that's enough. Izuku called the match. You did well, both of you. But clearly Yuraka is the victor. The gravity girl stood, removing her arm and grapple staff from the taller boy's body. Achako reached her hand out to help him up. Tenya being a good sport took her offered hand. I didn't expect the fight to be that short, Todoroki remarked. I did, Izuku smirked. She doesn't like to drag battles out. He knew that much about her. Now then I think I've seen enough. Todoroki you need more close combat training. Ida you rely too much on speed and lack a proper defense. Hiroraka I've already been working on what you'll need. So just keep up what you've been working on why aren't those villains here training with us? Tenya suddenly asked. It didn't seem fair that they were getting special treatment while the villains that Midoriya recruited are out doing who knows what. Oh they'll be here Izuku turned his gaze towards the engine quirk user. Stain is just giving them a quick crash course. His phone suddenly went off and he promptly answered it. All good she's here. Who's here? The dual quirk user wanted to know. You'll meet her soon. Let's take a short lunch break everyone while I go get her settled in. Izuku started walking away. The robots will escort you to the mess hall. After that we'll get back to more training. He dismissed them as he opened a portal and stepped through it. One of the titan robots entered the training room. 
This one was white unlike the typical black ones. I don't know about you two boys but I could use a bite. Yuraka smiled before making her way to their mechanical escort, leaving her staff behind on the floor. The other two begrudgingly followed after her. The lab it's like a toy store. They happily moved around her new lab, examining all the state-of-the-art tools and equipment that was now at her disposal. With all this she could make the ultimate babies. I figured you'd like it Izuku smiled watching his friend and colleague enjoy her new workspace. Sorry about the Hero Public Safety Commission grilling you. Part of the agreement I have with the government is that they get to screen all the employees I hire. It honestly frustrated him how the commission was doing everything it could to try and slow him down, rather than work with him. Luckily for Izuku his six nights don't count as employees and thus don't have to go through that process. It's alright. Not like I have anything to hide. Mei shrugged as she examined one of the power drills. Now then I think it's time I explain why I need your expertise in my little project. Walking over to what looked like a table. It was actually a large digital screen. Activating it with a simple touch the screen lit up showing schematics and blueprints. Oh, what's this? Mei was intrigued by what she was seeing. This is what you'll be working on in addition to the support gear I need. With All Might on the verge of retiring the people will need a new symbol that they can get behind. Izuku explained smoothly. This will be a temporary solution until a new human hero can rise to fill the void. What he was showing her was the plans for a new Titan robot. A more powerful unique Titan, designed to be better than any other. I call it Nemesis the mess hall this place is too big for just a few people. The three young heroes in training sat together alone in a big empty room filled with unoccupied eating tables. Izuku eventually wants more people to join the organization. Yuraka explained while she ate. He built this whole facility to accommodate the future members. He really thinks ahead doesn't he? Todoroki commented. Yeah. The brown-haired girl glanced over to Ida who was eating quietly while staring off at the walls. Are you alright Ida? I didn't hurt you too badly did I? And no it's alright. Tenya suddenly snapped to attention. I underestimated you so it's my fault not yours. He promptly apologized for what he viewed as his own blunder. I was just thinking about how powerful Midoriya really is compared to what he's shown us I couldn't even land a good hit on him. Shoto could admit that he was somewhat frustrated by that. Plus I get the feeling that he wasn't going all out. You haven't seen what he's really capable of. A voice from behind their table interrupted them. They turned around to see the villain known as Dabai standing there with a tray of food. I was there when he fought against All Might. Trust me when I say he's a lot more powerful than you imagine without invitation he sat down next to Todoroki. He's also super smart. Someone else spoke up as another person sat at their table right next to Yuraka. The gravity quirk user turned to see Toga beaming at her with her enlarged canines. Toga, Yuraka greeted rather coldly. She'd met the other girl before and didn't exactly hit it off with her. Achako, the blonde girl said in a sickly sweet tone. He didn't waste any time I see. Stain appeared as well, plopping down in the seat across from Tenya. Put you right into training. Ida glared at him through his glasses. I get the impression that you still don't like me and Genium Jr. What was your first clue? Dabai smirked as he watched the interaction. Still mad about your brother. The former hero killer finally glanced up at him. Even though he's going to be able to walk again from what I hear. You're the one who put him in that situation in the first place. Tenya practically spat. Yeah I did. Stain sighed. I won't apologize though and I certainly don't feel bad for what I did. But I will concede that I was wrong. Everyone stopped and turned to look at Serial Killer with shock. Midoriya proved to me that his method is better. Why kill fake heroes when you can expose them and make them live the rest of their lives in shame? He grinned remembering the video of what happened to Endeavor. He got a copy of it from Izuku so he could watch it over and over again. Speaking of fake heroes, how is your old man doing these days? Dabai suddenly asked turning to face Shoto while he ate. Still whining about losing his quirk and job. The dual quirk user supplied in an even tone not really caring about his father anymore. That's good. Dabai almost seemed gleeful at hearing that. Why do you care so much? Shoto asked the patched up man. Let's just say your father and I have a very personal history. Dabai said while taking a bite of his lunch. Are you a villain he fought in the past or something? Shoto inquired with a narrow gaze. The last thing he needed was someone coming after him for what Endeavor did to them. Not really. But from my perspective he was more the villain in our relationship. Dabai smirked at him. While the two of them were having a stare down Achako and Toga were having their own little chat. So what have you and Izuku been doing all these months? The blonde psychotic girl asked. I hardly ever see him. And I hear you two have been hanging around together if you must know we've just been training and I've also been acting as his assistant until he hires someone to replace me. Achako said in a matter-of-fact voice, not leaving any room for it to be misconstrued. Training huh? So that means you got to put your hands on his body a lot. Himiko grinned widely making the other girl blush. WW wait. It's not like that. Yuraka stammered out. You're blushing so much. But that must mean that. Toga gasped loudly. You like him too. She accused with a laugh. 
Before the gravity quirk user could deny her words a portal opened up in the middle of the mess hall and Izuku poked his head through. Are you guys ready to go again? He asked. Midoriya looked to the table where his knights were seated. Ida was glaring at a nonchalant stain. Todoroki had his cold gaze pointed at a smirking dabai and Yuraka was blushing bright red while Himiko was giggling next to her. What I miss? Nothing. Achako answered while she tried to hide her red face. Okay. Izuku seemed skeptical but let it go. Back to the training room then. His head went back into the warp gate as it closed. After you. Dabai gestured with his arm while still smirking at the youngest Todoroki. Training room later alright this time I want you. Todoroki and Dabai to come at me all at once while the rest of you wait on the sidelines. Izuku picked his next sparring victims as he liked to call them. After several hours of making them fight one-on-one -on -one and switching partners he decided now was a good time for a group match to see how well they did working together against a single overpowered opponent. Three against one. That doesn't seem fair. The black-haired fire user raised a brow at the challenge. You're right it isn't fair Izuku shrugged. You three won't even be able to touch me. He taunted with a small amount of arrogance. I'm not going to underestimate him this time. Tenya thought as he stared at his leader. I'll fight Midoriya with everything I have and finally see how big the gap between us really is. Is everybody ready? Izuku stood at the opposite end of the ring. Dabai got into a prepared stance summoning blue flames in the palms of both hands. Shoto covered his right arm in an icy mist while his left was engulfed in fire. Tenya's leg engines roared to life as he stood ready to charge in. Good and let's go. The three boys launched everything at him while the green-haired boy just smirked at their attacks. Infinity Gauntlet dot 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 100% output. Each of his opponents was blown back by the rush of energy and power that exploded out their leader. Izuku would show them all just how strong he really was with the full power of his invention. There were times when Dabai looked in the mirror he sometimes tried to remember what he originally looked like. It was at those times when he thought hard. He could see past the black hair, stitches and burn patches of skin and see that red-haired boy from long ago. On bad days he would sneer at that weak pathetic boy. On really bad days he would breathe a sigh of sadness for just a moment. Taoya Todoroki. That was his name once upon a time. Born with an exceptionally powerful fire quirk, potentially stronger than his father's, so he was told. Before his youngest brother developed his dual quirk Taoya was dad's favorite. Favorite? How Dabai hated that title. In a normal family maybe the favorite son would get special treatment, food and gifts. In the Todoroki household being the favorite meant strict training from dear old dad, violence, pressure, verbal and sometimes physical abuse. Mom couldn't do anything or she too would feel his wrath. He was just a kid. Yet whenever he failed to live up to dad's expectations he was called weak and useless. As if Endeavor had the right to mock weakness when he couldn't even surpass All Might. Taoya finally couldn't take it anymore. He wanted out one way or another. One night he finally decided to just end it all leaving a note for his siblings to find he snuck out of the house. A young child of twelve wandered the city streets in the dead of night, looking for the best place to die and be free from this burden. He found it in the form of a bridge. Staring down into the dark water of the canal Taoya found that he couldn't bring himself to do it. It wasn't that he didn't want to die, but he wanted to live to see his father's reputation ruin. That's when an idea popped into his head. He knew his suicide would warrant some form of investigation. They would look into the number two hero's home life. They would find out what he did and still does to his wife and children. They would plaster it everywhere. Everyone would know the truth. His rank would plummet and Taoya would have his well-deserved justice, making up his mind. The young red-headed boy took off his shirt and shoes and tossed them over the bridge into the river. The police would need to find something to confirm that he did indeed jump. Taoya then vanished into the seedier parts of the city, stealing a cap and hoodie to hide himself and simply waited for the fireworks to begin. Perhaps when Endeavor's career was in ashes he would come out of hiding just to laugh and reveal that he was the architect of his ultimate humiliation. A few days passed, yet none of the things he imagined happened. Instead his death was labeled as a tragic accident. His twelve-year-old mind had gravely miscalculated just how corrupt Endeavor really was and what he would do to keep his reputation safe. Sinking so low as to not even report his own son was missing but dead. What happened to the note he left for his siblings? Why didn't they go public with it or tell mom? Did their father force them all to silence? He certainly had the power and pull to do something like that. Taoya just couldn't believe that there wasn't a shred of honor or humanity in that man to do this to his own family, treating his own son like a disposable toothbrush to throw in the trash and replace. Time passed and a funeral was held. The boy read all about it from a stolen newspaper. People actually consoled that bastard for the loss of his firstborn son. Even All Might showed up and offered his sympathy. Not a single person save for his family knew the truth and no one ever would. It was then that Talia learned that there was no justice in the world. If someone who everyone praised as such a great hero could get away with this then what was a hero anyway? True heroes didn't abuse their family and worse, not feel a shred of remorse or guilt. That man was a fraud and there was nothing the redhead could about it. He couldn't go back now. 
There was no telling what Endeavor would do to him if it turned out he was alive. He might kill his son himself for real, just to cover his own lies. Hiding out he spent most of his time doing odd jobs for local drug dealers and scumbags in the darker parts of the city. He lived in an abandoned train yard, using an old rusted caboose as a makeshift home. After about a year of this he could finally afford to change his identity. He heard that there was a guy who possessed a quirk that could alter a person's appearance and he did so for untraceable cash. He worked out of back alley surgery room in a moldy building. Talia saved up enough from his jobs to afford the hair color change at least. When he went back months later with more money the place was gone. He had heard that some underground hero named Erasure had arrested the man with appearance-altering quirk and shut his whole business down. With no other option the now 16-year-old Talia had to do the rest himself. The pain was excruciating. Using his own quirk he burned parts of skin, going a little too far at times, but the damage was done. The older he got the more he resembled that man and he hated it, so of course he wanted all likeness and similar traits obliterated. It would be a few years later that he would get metal piercings that resembled staples. The first time he burned someone to death had been sort of an accident. He'd been having a bad day. First he got screwed over on a job. Turns out it was a setup and the heroes were waiting to capture a bunch of small-time thugs. Talia just barely escaped, and when he returned to the garage the guy who hired him was long gone. He was most likely an undercover cop or hero the whole time. On top of that Endeavor was just commended for his long successful career and heroic deeds. They even gave him a medal for his services. If the public knew the truth about him they'd spit in his face whenever they walked by him. All the rage he felt lashed out when he was suddenly attacked by a group of thugs looking for some easy cash. Since this was the bad part of the city the likelihood of heroes showing up to stop a mugging was pretty much non-existent, so these muggings happened quite often. Having had enough Taoya immediately exploded at the one with blades for fingers as he lunged towards him. His flames were so hot and intense that they turned blue and fried the cretin to a blackened crisp. The other scumbags ran off after what he did to their friend letting the young man take a good long look at his handiwork. Talia practically cremated him. He was revolted at first, but then he felt oddly relieved. The guy would have killed him if given the chance and he merely defend himself. Who knows how many people he killed with his quirk, he probably deserved this. Word eventually spread. Just a bunch of overblown rumors in Talia's opinion. They called him the fire demon, the burner, the blue flame. The only nickname he sort of liked was the cremator. It was that word that gave him the idea for his new name. Dabai. That's what he started introducing himself as. He spent the next few years wandering around burning any creep that crossed his path looking to start something with him. The news. He despised them for taking bribes from heroes to keep certain stories quiet. Every once in a while though they did something right. This time they spread the message of the hero killer. They were quickly stopped by the government of course but it was too late. Websites were created. Posters were made and even merchandise was being sold in stores based off the serial killer. At first Dabai assumed this guy was just another fad that would come and go without causing any real change to society. Heroes would still remain corrupt, real justice didn't exist anyway. Stain was different though. He actually left a mark on society with his crusade to eradicate every false hero. Dabai actually applauded his efforts. Maybe sooner or later people would start to question their precious heroes and maybe they would start to look a little closer at those they worship. He didn't have any hope though, but he'd carry on that man's creed regardless. Perhaps now was the time to stand for something. When Dabai first joined the League of Villains he had very low expectations. It wasn't the first organized group of villains that claimed to be different than the others, and he had a feeling it would probably end up just like the rest. Their leader Shigaraki was an irritating man-child and not to mention unpleasant to look at. Then there was Toga, a psychotic blood-obsessed little bitch. The smoky bartender Kirajiri, the ridiculous clowns known as Compress and Twice, that androgynous creep Magni, and the hero-killer cosplayer Spinner. There was also the mysterious voice over the monitor screen that Shigaraki hung on his every word named Sensei. All in all they were a real motley group of second-rate villains. The first time he met Izuku Midoriya Aka Apotheoses was interesting to say the least. He remembered that alias from some time ago. The supposed genius strategist, his name quickly spread throughout the villain underworld in such a short time. Last he had heard was that some Yakuza big shot in a bird mask was looking for him. Imagine his surprise when it turned out Apotheoses was just some kid that now worked for the League of Villains. As soon as Dabai laid eyes on him he immediately dismissed him as weak. The way he cowered before Shigaraki when the hand man had him pinned to the wall by his throat didn't help his opinion of him either. However the boy was smart, smart enough to placate Shigaraki. That still didn't impress Dabai though and he chose to ignore the kid, until Izuku approached him. He watched as the boy easily disabled Toga with just a few simple moves. But it was when he mentioned hanging out with Stain that Dabai became interested. During meetings at the league's bar Izuku would talk to him about the hero killer, his ideals and beliefs. Apparently the kid had similar ideals, but believed in different methods. 
For example, he was against killing the fake heroes. Izuku preferred them to live in shame and humiliation. To him it was a greater punishment than to die for misrepresenting the title. He eventually grew curious enough to ask what the boy's quirk was, but to Dabai's surprise he was quirkless. Personally Dabai wasn't a bigot and didn't hold Izuku's quirkless status against him. But being realistic what could he really do with only a smart brain and no power to fall back on? It wasn't until the attack on the Yua training camp that he got to see how Izuku's intelligence worked out in the field. He was easily able to make that Bakugu kid they were targeting lose his temper and that strange device of his redirected the boy's attack back at his own allies. Dabai didn't see much of Izuku after their first successful mission. All Might and other heroes raided their base, forced that sensei guy to reveal himself and then the league went into hiding. Shigaraki called him after the fight, but the green-haired genius wouldn't be returning. It was hard to understand the hand man's uncoherent furious rambling. But what Dabai could glean was that Izuku was going off on his own for now. Then that day came. Himeko received a call from Izuku and the girl left saying her love needed her. As if Izuku would ever let someone as crazy as her in his pants. Dabai chuckled at the thought. He remembered later that Kurajiri and Compress were watching the portable television in their new hideout keeping an eye on the news to see if the heroes were on their trail. Not that they would allow the media to post something like that if they were. Kirajiri called Shigaraki over when they saw something interesting. Glancing over their shoulder with mild intrigue he noticed a picture of Izuku Midoriya being displayed on screen. Based off what the news was reporting it seems little Izuku outed himself as a villain. That didn't seem right. The boy always kept his identity and involvement with the League secret, so why would he reveal himself to All Might of all people? It was then the media played the footage of happened at Genosis. Quirkless Izuku floating in the air, combating All Might and blowing away heroes and cars with a simple snap of his fingers. He even thwarted that bastard Endeavor's flames and he made it look so easy. After that he tore down the company's building and escaped. The report also said that Kamui Woods and Ed Shot were badly injured by that very same quirkless boy. It seemed almost impossible. How did he get so powerful? When did he become so powerful? These were some of the questions that Dabai and the rest of the league wanted to know, especially Shigaraki with how much the guy kept ranting and raving. Later during the night they were sent a location, some trash-covered beach. It was there they got to see some of the kids power up close. It all came from a device that he wore on his left hand. Pretty obvious and hard not to notice the shiny new gauntlet the kid was sporting. After that Izuku went into hiding for a little bit, calling on Toga and Dabai for assistance in protecting those stones that powered his gauntlet while they were being made. Toga screwed up. But Dabai was able to accomplish his job, handing what the green-haired teen called the Power Stone over. After seeing how he was able to blow All Might away he understood why it was called that. He didn't stick around to watch the rest of the fight, but he saw the footage. The whole world saw Izuku expose All Might's true form. It was amazing. In one fell swoop he shook society's faith in their number one hero. Pandemonium was the next stage of Izuku's plan. First he supplied villains with his intellect and assistance. Then he helped the heroes out by slowing down and thwarting the villains. This just further threw the nation into chaos, creating the perfect opportunity for him to petition the Prime Minister with a solution. Izuku was given exactly what he wanted, control over the heroes, the ability and political power to decide who was worthy of the title. The first he passed judgment on was Endeavor. Izuku humiliated and defeated him without lifting a finger, proving that quirks are nothing to his science and intelligence. Dabai got a sick joy watching the footage of that man getting the shit kicked out of him by the kids' robots over and over again. The green-haired gauntlet user didn't waste any time. He built himself a base of operations, passed judgment on three more fake heroes and brought order to society on the brink of chaos with his titans. Izuku accomplished more than the League of Villains ever did in such a short amount of time as well. Of course Dabai took the offer to join him. He had already proved to be a more competent leader than Shigaraki, so the decision was no-brainer. It was then Izuku dropped another surprise on him. The infamous hero killer Stain was now working for him as some sort of secret inquisitor that brought fake heroes to him to be punished by having their quirks removed. There was more though. Izuku wanted Dabai, Toga and Stain to keep an eye on the villains. He wanted to always know what they were up to so that he could better keep the hero society in his control. What Dabai didn't expect was for Shoto Todoroki, the son of that monster to be a part of the kid's organization. He also didn't expect his youngest sibling to be nothing like their father. Unlike Endeavor Shoto was willing to change and better himself and therefore become a better hero. He also did what Dabai dreamed of doing when he was a kid and that was tell the old man to shove it. Part of him wanted to tell Shoto the truth and come clean, but he reminded himself that Taoya Todoroki was dead and he was Dabai now. Still, he was always curious about what became of his siblings and their mother. He didn't even know what hospital she was in. 
Things were changing so fast and Dabai was struggling to keep up. Stain was putting him and the psycho girl through the ringer with his training while Izuku did the same with his three prospective heroes. Stain was incredibly strict and harsh as a teacher. He didn't pull any punches in sparring exercises and didn't waste any time laying Dabai out on the floor then berating him by calling him just a punk with a flashy quirk. Toga didn't struggle as much as he did since she was more accustomed to close-range hand-to-hand combat. He was starting to feel useless, while watching everyone getting stronger while his progress was nowhere near as extensive as theirs. He voiced this concern just once to Izuku and the boy just chuckled saying that Dabai was already really strong, so of course that his progress would look little in comparison, even going as far to liken it to leveling up in a video game like Shigaraki used to do. Izuku told him not to worry too much about it, but Dabai wanted to be better, he needed to be stronger. He owed it to Izuku for creating real justice in this society and putting a stop to the fake heroes like Endeavor. He had to help him protect this justice. Present time. Are you sure you want to do this? Izuku asked as he followed Dabai into the training room. These are the same robots that took down Endeavor. You could say they are tailor-made to fight people with quirks like yours Dabai you're the one who said the best way to get stronger is to go beyond my limits. The dark-haired young man smirked. No Yua says that. That plus ultra thing they keep spouting. The gauntlet user shrugged. It doesn't apply to people without quirks though. Sadly none of the lessons that school teach apply to the average quirkless person, but the whole going beyond thing is something I can agree with. He looked down at his device as he walked. After all I went about as plus ultra as I could possibly go thanks to this. Entering the large training room Dabai spotted three red titan robots standing there in the center waiting for him. Have fun, Izuku turned in with a last wave and left him alone in the chamber. Observation room so what do you think? Stain asked, standing in front of large monitor screen that displayed what was currently about to happen in the training room. He seems more confident. Izuku stood next to him. He was always a bit cocky before, but he seems more focused along with that. I suppose that's your doing the punk is strong, but if he really pushes himself he'll be even stronger. The hero killer commented. That's why I suggested he do this oh so this was your idea. Midoriya looked to his inquisitor with curiosity. Well this should be interesting then. He reached over and pushed button to activate the robots. Training room Dabai stared down the titans as they suddenly came to life. The three turned their bodies in unison to face him and began stomping towards their target without a moment of hesitation. When they were close they reached out to grab him. That was when Dabai struck the ground between them, creating a wall of blue fire to obstruct the machine's visions. One of the titans tore through the flames to find the target was gone. Hey metal head. Dabai called from behind before blasting it with a torrent of flames. He noticed the other two approaching and used his quirk to launch himself away with his other hand. With all three of them close together Dabai unleashed a tidal wave of fire at the machines. The titans were pushed back at first but soon started marching through the onslaught of heat flames until one of them was standing in front of him. Go. He was punched hard in the gut by a metal fist, followed by another fist to his face when he was distracted that knocked him off his feet. He tried to get up but the tall menacing robots surrounded him and starting raining blows down on his body. He tried the same strategy to get some distance, but the machines would always chase him down, push through his fire and beat him down. The repetition of failure was starting piss Dabai off. As the titans kicked the crap out of him the fire wielder was starting to think that maybe he was weak after all just like his father said. Observation Room HM That didn't last long, Izuku commented not sounding all that surprised over the outcome. Give him a moment, Stain kept watching. Training Room okay, I've had enough of this shit, Dabai hated feeling weak. When he glanced up at the titan all he saw was Endeavor looking down on him. H-I-H-H-H. With a mighty shout Dabai stood up unleashing an inferno all around him. The robots were momentarily pushed back, but renewed their assault, only to find their target missing. A whistle caught the first one's attention, its head doing a complete 180. Dabai leaped at the machine, hands covered in blue fire. He grabbed the robot's head and pressed his thumbs into the red glowing eyes. He didn't stop until he saw sparks burst from the holes, telling him that the titan was blinded now. From what Izuku told him some time ago the quirk detecting scanner was behind the eyes of each robot. So with that now also out of commission it was completely in the dark. It could still hear him, but that wouldn't help it over the sound of roaring flames. One tried to punch him in the face but he took the hit. Smirking with blood dripping down his face Dabai created another wall of fire between himself and the mechanical soldiers. With the power of his quirk he sent the fire that surrounded him in every direction creating a storm of flames. R-I-A-A-G-H-H-H Dabai roared his lungs out as he blasted the fireproof robots with everything he had. The titans were pushed back, trying their best to fight through the flames. It looked like a group of three men were trying their hardest to walk through a raging hurricane. The fire user screamed louder as he pushed his quirk past its limits, turning up the heat and intensity even further. Much to the shock of Izuku who watched from the safety of the observation room the fire-resistant armor of the red titans was starting to melt. 
observation room I think we've seen enough now. Izuku's right hand reached over to the red button on the control panel that said extinguish. That would douse the training room with water. Before he could push it his wrist was quickly grabbed and stopped by the hero killer. Not so fast, Stain said as he continued to watch the screen with a smirk. Who are we to stop him now that his heart is fully in it? Izuku looked at him, but then shrugged and let the inferno continue. What's going on? Izuku turned around at the sudden voice to see Shoto walking through the doors of the observation room. Dabai wanted to find his limit and go beyond it, he answered. You might want to come see this boy, Stain said without turning around. This is what it looks like when you give it your all. Todoroki glared at the hero killer, but grew curious to see what Dabai was capable of. The guy was always giving him weird looks during meetings and training sessions. Honestly it was starting to annoy him and Shoto made a mental note to confront him about it in the future. The three of them continued to watch as Dabai's demonic blue flames slowly melted through the armor of robots. Even the systems that released pressurized air from between the metal plating to further shield them from heat and fire along with the rapid cooling mechanisms were no match for the raging furnace that the patch-faced man now wielded and were quickly overloaded. With nothing to protect them from the his quirk the titans were fried down to their circuitry, even to their very core causing all three of them to explode, leaving nothing but burn piles of scrap. Dabai eventually calmed down, letting his fire slowly subside. He stood there in the middle of the training room, now nothing more than a giant oven, breathing heavily. His shirt and coat was turned to ash leaving his torso exposed. Izuku and Stain glanced at each other with the younger of the two mouthing the word wow. Even Shoto was floored by how powerful Dabai's own flame quirk was. It made him wonder if the fire side of his own quirk could have been that powerful had he not neglected it for so long. Wait for it. Stain remarked as they observed Dabai suddenly become still, the collapse into unconsciousness. And there it is. I think I'll take back some of the things I said about this punk now. The hero killer was happy to see his trainee finally cut loose. This organization didn't need half-hearted fools slowing them down. Yeah I would if I were you. Izuku just laughed and opened a portal to retrieve the dark cremator, all the while finally deciding on the perfect code name for him. All Might let out a weary sigh as he sat in his chair quietly, skinny and shriveled. He looked down the hall to his left spotting a pair of suited security guards. Then he looked to his right and spotted another pair at the other end. After going through numerous security checkpoints he was finally allowed in the Prime Minister's office. Unfortunately even his position as the number one hero wasn't enough to get him an audience with Minister Akira Toriyama immediately like he wanted. He had to wait a few weeks for a scheduled appointment, but even then the minister was a bit reluctant to meet with him, especially considering that there was no telling where Midoriya's eyes and ears were these days. Prime Minister Toriyama will see you now. The voice of one of the aides spoke as he appeared in the hall. Tashinori stood up and fixed his tie quickly before falling the young woman. As he glanced up he noticed the many sensors in the ceiling that detected the usage of quirks. When they reached the office two bodyguards quietly nodded at the hero and opened the double doors. Hello Yagi Tashinori. Prime Minister Toriyama greeted him, better known as All Might. The doors closed and locked behind the hero as he walked up to the desk and gave a respectful bow to the middle-aged dark-haired man. Minister Toriyama, Tashinori greeted back. Please, I should be the one bowing to you. Toriyama stood up and gestured towards the seat. I'm sorry you had to wait so long to get here, but as you can imagine I'm a very busy man. Now when you requested a meeting with me weeks ago you didn't specify what exactly you wanted to speak to me about. I wanted to keep that vague lest the wrong person find out. But I think you know what I'm here to discuss. The blonde skinny man gave him an accusing gaze. The minister sighed as he reached into a drawer of his desk and pulled out a bottle of alcohol. I was afraid it was that. Pouring himself a glass before offering the hero one. Brandy. No thank you. My health doesn't allow it. Tashinori politely refused the drink. Now about this problem. What's there to talk about? The minister took a deep sip of his drink. Midoriya knows what he's doing and the villains are running scared now that we have their best on our side. I assure you the only side that boy is on is his own. The gaunt man argued. Toriyama's lips folded inward like he wanted to argue back but couldn't. He reached into another drawer of his desk and pulled out a small chrome device the size and shape of a pen with a red blinking light at the top. Clearly there's much you want to say and there's much I want to know. He pushed a button on the side of his device and the flashing stopped and started glowing green. This is a nifty little gadget that only myself and other high-ranking government officials are allowed to have. As long as it's on all transceiver signals in and out of this room are jammed. The minister explained. If this place were bugged without my knowledge rest assured all that third party will get is static. Now Yagi understood what was said here will stay between the two of them. Izuku would never know what went on here if he was spying on them. Tell me everything, because I need to know how this all began if I'm going to help you. Thus Yagi Tashinori told him everything. All for one, one for all, the path of succession with the power, his master Nana Shimura, how he became the number one hero and finally the first time he met Izuku Midoriya. 
The blonde older man didn't spare any details in the story. The minister sat there and listened patiently, taking a few sips of his drink here and there. When he was finished Tashinori leaned back in his chair to let that all sink in. Hum the minister made a bridge out of his hands as he contemplated all this. I did know a bit about all for one already. All the previous prime ministers did as well. That man has been our country's dirty little secret for over a hundred years. They never let the other countries know that there was a villain that had a quirk that let him steal quirks. The secret was kind of out thanks to Midoriya though. As for the boy, he sighed before taking another sip. Look I'm not going to point the finger of shame at you. You're probably getting enough of that from your colleagues that know your secret. Tashinori frowned at how accurate that was. How could you have known? How could you have possibly known that what you said to Midoriya was the last straw in a life of misery and oppression? Still I should have said something else. I should have lied and said he could be a quirkless hero. Tashinori looked angry at himself. Would you have allowed a quirkless child into their hero program? Toriyama asked. No, would any other school? Tashinori paused for a moment then answered truthfully. No exactly. Had you lied to him Midoriya would have done his best to get in. But he wouldn't have made it in due to his quirkless status. The prime minister went on to explain in detail this alternate what-if scenario. However he would have blamed himself and gone on the rest of his miserable life always seeing himself as inferior. And working a dead-end job until he committed suicide before age 30. No one would have cared. He'd just be a footnote in the obituaries if it was slow news day and society would keep going. That was hauntingly detailed. The gaunt man was taken aback by how far that went. That's because I've seen that story before, many times. The minister took a big gulp of his alcohol. It's the story of the average quirkless life. I didn't know it was that bad. Toshinori looked regretful that he never did anything to stop this. There's a reason the quirkless percentage of the population is decreasing every year. It's partially due to them offing themselves due to the ridicule and isolation they feel. That was harsh but true. And nobody cares. Why should they care when heroes are around to care for them? But heroes don't actually care do they? He chuckled ruefully. Do you see the problem now Tashinori? That's what Izuku Midoriya is trying to fix. I understand I really do. I think some of these changes are needed, but he's going about it the wrong way. Tashinori argued. All this aggressive control, humiliating anyone who doesn't agree with him, taking the quirks of heroes. Just be glad he's only taking the quirks of heroes that he finds unworthy and not just any that he fancies like All for One did. The Prime Minister supplied. We really got lucky with All for One though. He was content to rule from the shadows. The few that did know of him feared him and those that only heard of that man wondered if he even existed at all. There has to be a way to stop Midoriya. The hero quickly changed the subject to get to the root as to why he was here. The minister sighed again and finished the rest of his glass off. There is no stopping him. That boy is too smart and too powerful to be stopped at this point. It was harsh but it was true. What could All Might with his rapidly draining power do? I don't believe that. You're the prime minister. There has to be something you can do. Tashinori wondered, isn't there anything you know that can be used against him? There might be one way. Toriyama refilled his glass as he contemplated the situation. You would have to restore your image while simultaneously diminish Midoriya's. Seeing the questioning look he elaborated further. Midoriya's made himself out to be a lot more powerful than he actually is. Sure he's got that all-powerful gauntlet, but you take that away and he goes back to being a quirkless teenager. The quirkless minority will always be on his side no matter what he does, he is their idol after all. However if you could get the rest of the population to see that he's not as big as he made himself out to be then they might stop supporting him. He paused to let his words sink in. You of all people know how important an image needs to be maintained to hold together a society. But how would I restore the people's faith in heroes and myself? The hero asked. You're probably not going to like this, but you're going to have to challenge Izuku Midoriya to a public battle. The Prime Minister of Japan stared down at his now empty glass. You need to face him as All Might the symbol of peace in a final stand to stop his era of darkness from taking hold once and for all. The words sounded out of comic book, but were so lackluster as if the man didn't even believe what he was saying would work. You'll have to give it your all this time. He's just a kid. A poor sad and angry kid who doesn't fully understand or realize what he's doing. Going all out on Midoriya was still something he was a bit reluctant to do. You still don't seem to understand what Izuku Midoriya is. Toriyama pinched the bridge of his nose in frustration. He's unlike your average villain. In fact he's something entirely new that we've never seen before. The man went on. His intelligence is fueled by his raw untempered determination and ambition. He thinks of ideas no one else has ever thought. Because in today's society there's no need to think of such things anymore. He thinks so many moves ahead, plans within plans within more plans. He's not afraid to flaunt his power to the world. He's also studied how our society functions in every facet. That's how he was able to pull all this off in the first place. Okay I get it he's a genius. Tashinori summed up. But even geniuses can't predict everything. 
You're right. That's why the best chance at beating him is to completely blindside him with a bold move he'll never expect. Reaching into his drawer again the Prime Minister pulled out a thin file. This hasn't been publicly announced yet but in three weeks Midoriya will be giving a speech along with a special presentation that has to do with the next step of his hero reformation plan. He handed it to the hero. What is he presenting? The skinny blonde man took the file and flipped through it. You're going to love this, the Prime Minister said with heavy sarcasm. Apparently it's some new titan robot that he's calling a possible candidate for a new symbol of peace. Other than that I don't know anything about what he's cooking up in that island base of his. He's holding it at the Coruscant Stadium. That's a big place. How many people will be attending? Tashinori was surprised at where Midoriya was holding this event. It was usually reserved for sporting events bigger than the US Sports Festival and for hosting the Hero Awards where professionals were given accolades for great accomplishments and deeds. Well the event is going to be free to attend and with how popular Midoriya is lately they'll probably fill every seat. He chuckled at how smart Midoriya was at publicity moves like this. Also it will be televised live. You'll have to infiltrate the event as a spectator then unveil yourself when you challenge him in front of everyone. What happens when I defeat him? He didn't say if he said when, assuring himself that he could still beat the teen if he went all out. Remove the gauntlet from his arm and bring him outside the stadium. I'll have authorities on standby ready to take him to a detainment facility to await trial. Toriyama supplied. I'll then have heroes and police sent to shut down his base of operations. You make it sound so easy, Tashinori added. It's a lot more difficult than I'm making it out to be. The minister frowned as he thought of the potential headache this whole operation would be. Plus there's also the public backlash that will need to be dealt with which is why I'm relying on you to affirm the people that the symbol of peace is still strong and ready to uphold justice. Can you do that? Of course. He would also begin preparing Mirio to be his successor. If he couldn't get one for all back from Midoriya's gauntlet then he could at least train the older boy to take his place as the new symbol of peace. Mirio was already strong and incredibly heroic. When he graduated and started making a name for himself then Tashinori planned to retire and leave the future in his capable hands. Then good luck to you. The Prime Minister breathed a sigh of relief as he turned off the signal jammer and called for his security to escort All Might safely out of the building. Forgive me All Might Toriyama thought as he gazed at his empty glass with regret. Elsewhere All Right just remained still. Izuku smiled as Yuraka did as he told. They were currently in the testing room that Izuku had built for using the new gadgets and support gear that Mei and he created. The metal floor panel opened up behind her as a robotic arm extended from it with a device held in its claw. It pressed the device which resembled a metal backpack against Achako's back where a series of straps snaked their way around her torso. Is it tight enough? Izuku approached and made sure the straps were fitted properly. Why yeah? She blushed at the feeling of his hands on her body. The brown-haired girl tried her best to think of something else to distract her from this action. Don't worry I'll catch you if something goes wrong. Izuku assured her as he took a step back completely oblivious to her flushed face. Now go ahead and use your quirk on yourself. Yuraka nodded, pushing aside her momentary embarrassment to float herself off the ground. As she got a few yards up into the air the device strapped to her back transformed and unfurled into a set of metallic wings. Each was roughly the size of her own body and made of numerous diamond-shaped feathers constructed from a light but durable metal alloy. This support gear that Izuku developed kept her balanced in the air and would even grant her mobility. In other words these mechanical wings would give her the ability to fly. So far so good. Achako gave him two thumbs up which almost caused her to lose her balance. Careful, this will take some getting used to. Izuku cautioned. Tilt your body left and right to rotate yourself. She followed his instructions slowly making 180s in the air. Lean forward a bit to fly forward and lean back to do the opposite. Achako smiled as she carefully moved around the testing room. They spent the next few hours practicing maneuvering through the air, taking breaks here and there so she didn't make herself sick with her quirk. Luckily all the combat and quirk training had increased her stamina greatly. Now there are thrusters that will give you some speed. Izuku began to explain as they started the next round of practice. Do you want to try them out or perhaps wait another day until you're more comfortable with these wings? No time like the present. She gave him the go ahead. Okay, get ready and has a kick. He pulled a remote and pressed a button on it. Almost immediately Neon gets burst from between the metallic feathers propelling her across the testing room. Well, he quickly grabbed a hold of her with the reality stone's power and stopped Achako from nearly crashing face first into the wall. On second thought, she chuckled nervously. Why don't we hold off on that for a while? Yeah that seems appropriate. Izuku agreed and gently placed her on the ground, switching the wings off as the girl deactivated her quirk. Removing the wings he stepped back letting her stretch her sore muscle. Don't worry the field version will be lighter in weight, compact and much more comfortable to wear. He promised while handing her a bottle of water that he produced from a small portal. There's something I've been meaning to ask you. The brown-haired teen gratefully took the water. 
Yes he replied as he put some notes into the small tablet device he carried on his person. I don't want to sound impatient, but we've been training almost daily. When do you think we'll be ready to go out into the world? She was referring to herself, Todoroki and Ida. When could they be heroes? That's what she wanted to know. Soon, he vowed. Things are progressing ahead of schedule, much faster than I planned. Izuku looked up at the ceiling. Everything is almost in place. There's just one last piece on the board I need to take out of the game before the new world can start to take root. All Might Ochako frowned sadly. She didn't hate the man, but she didn't like the man either for what he said to Izuku a year ago. Unfortunately he was the last person standing in the way of real progress and change as her friend explained. Izuku promised that he didn't want All Might dead, just out of his way. We all have to grow up some time. Part of growing up is letting go of our childhood heroes, he said with a hint of coldness. It's time for our society to grow up. As he finished an explosion could be heard coming from the lab next door, ruining the tension of what he just said. May, Izuku sighed as he turned towards the direction of the sound. She blew something up again. Achako chuckled at the resident mad engineer's antics and he replied with a deadpan stare that said obviously. The repair drones don't have a consciousness, emotions or mind of their own, but I think even they are starting to get sick of repairing the lab every day. He ran a hand through his messy green hair. Excuse me. He quickly left the testing room. Luckily the lab was right down the hall from where they were. Yuraka watched him go with a cheerful smile. Not everything could go smoothly it seemed. Inside the lab. Maybe he didn't hear that. May frantically tried to sweep up fallen debris and clean up the mess before you know who arrived. Hear what? You blowing the lab up again. Izuku said from behind making her jump like a startled cat. Actually no. She quickly spun around to correct his assumption. Looking around the facility he noticed that there wasn't the usual smoke and fire. But there was debris everywhere for some odd reason. Highly suspicious in his eyes. What did you do? Izuku crossed his arms like a disappointed dad. You know our new baby we've been making. May smiled as she rubbed the back of her head. I may have. Turn it him on Tosuhathakudo. She said that last part quickly, but he heard her loud and clear. You activated Nemesis. He chastised her. I told you not to switch it on or start testing it without my supervision. I know, but I just wanted to see it in action just for a moment. She pleaded. He didn't blow anything up. I just had him punch the wall. Which wall? He wondered aloud. That one. May grinned and pointed at the wall behind him. Izuku turned around to stare at the colossal gaping hole in the concrete. He turned back around to look at her then back to the wall again. Okay dot 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 that is impressive. He pointed to the hole. I didn't think it could do that. I made a few modifications to the armor plating and juiced up the hydraulics and engine that gives him super strength. She explained proudly. I want to see it. Forgetting his earlier frustration with her. Izuku eagerly wanted to see what she'd done to his super titan. She too was eager to show it off and grabbed his wrist. Dragging over to something large and covered in a black sheet. All about the reveal. May exclaimed as she whipped the sheet right off. Though, Izuku was surprised to see there were more than just a few modifications to the armor plating. Yeah, I took the impact absorbing panels that you use to practice your power stone abilities and applied it to his armor. She explained pointing to the robot's body. I just thought you were going to apply it to vital areas. I didn't think you would apply it to the whole body. He started muttering about all the ways this could be used to improve Nemesis's combat abilities. Well we want him to last, don't we? They seemed proud of her latest accomplishment. The ultimate baby, she liked to call it. Not forever though, just until a new human symbol of peace can arise. Izuku sighed. As much as he valued these robots they still couldn't replace his dream of an ideal human hero. A cold soulless machine could never be that. Though he couldn't wait now to see the look on the people's faces during the big presentation in a few weeks.